ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky was in the room for all this. He's outside the courthouse now. Aaron, a lot to get to here. First off, though, what was it like when Trump showed up for this trial? We've seen him in courtrooms before. Uh, court appearances are now fully woven into his political strategy. So when he left Trump Tower, there was a wave. When he got back, there was the fist bump. We saw him uh, stern-faced, knowing exactly where the cameras were when the, when the photographers were allowed in for a minute at the start before the judge took the bench. But otherwise, the, the customary bombast that you see in the hallway really subsides. He's a defendant at the defense table, and he was engaged with his lawyers. Uh, he occasionally had his eyes closed as if in thought. Sometimes he would tug on the sleeve of his attorney, Todd Blanche, to get his attention if he heard something maybe he wanted his defense attorney to respond to. And at one point, the defense attorney seemed to tap Trump on the, on the arm as if to say, okay, I, I got it. Uh, so he is following along when potential jurors were answering from a seven-page questionnaire, Trump held the questionnaire in one hand and flipped through the pages with the other as the, the potential jurors went through the responses. Well, and even before the jurors themselves heard from him, even before the jurors were even being selected and, and argued over, they had some pretrial hearings that actually people were not necessarily expecting. And this was probably some of the newsiest stuff of the day. I mean, who came out ahead in terms of some of these rulings? It cut both ways, Brad. On one hand, the prosecutors are going to be allowed to call Karen McDougal, the former Playboy model, who has said that the National Enquirer paid her hush money in order to keep quiet about her alleged sexual encounter with Donald Trump that he denies. But the judge also said prosecutors are limited in what they can do with the Access Hollywood tape, the one on which Trump has heard boasting about grabbing women the judge said prosecutors can quote from it, but they cannot play the tape from the jury. He said that having the jury hear that tape and Trump's own voice would be extremely prejudicial. And one of the things we've been talking about so much with this criminal trial is how non-negotiable it is that you be there, right? How, how much that will eat into the former president's campaign time. I mean, did we get a better sense of, of exactly how intensive this is going to be? Anytime the jury is there, the former president needs to be in court as well. The judge made that clear. So if there's something outside the jury's presence, some kind of hearing, perhaps Trump can skip that. But by and large, the judge fully expects that Donald Trump is going to be in court. And that conflicted with a request from his attorneys. And this seemed bound to happen, uh, given how the defense has complained that the trial is getting in the way of the campaign trail uh, over the next several weeks. Trump wanted to attend the U.S. Supreme Court arguments when he is going to argue next week about presidential immunity. And the judge said it is a big deal to argue before the U.S. Supreme Court. But he said being a criminal defendant on trial in New York is also a big deal. And he expects Trump to be here. Well, and so then in the afternoon, kind of the real stars of the show showed up, which is the potential jurors, right? This huge jury pool that they're now going to try to sift through. I mean, wh what did we learn about the cross-section of people and sort of, I guess, what prosecutors and defense are going after here? Because you're not going to find people who just haven't heard of this defendant. Yeah, the issue isn't, Brad, whether you've heard of Donald Trump. Who hasn't? He is the you know, one of the most famous people on the planet. The, the issue is whether you can be fair and impartial. And there was one woman, uh, she's uh, in her 30s. She lives in Harlem. She works at retail. And she answered yes to a question on the questionnaire that asked whether she had strong views uh, about the former president that could interfere with her ability to be fair and impartial. And the judge excused her right away. But there was one guy, a bookseller from the Upper West Side, who said that he believes uh, everyone, uh, a sitting president, a former president, a janitor, is entitled uh, to be in court and no one is above the law. And so he was allowed to stay on the jury pool. And what an interesting cross-section of people, Brad, who showed up with their jury summons to court. The oncology nurse, the bookseller from the Upper West Side, a woman who works at Bloomingdale's, someone who works as an attorney who said his wife is pregnant with the couple's first child. And none of them said that they put Donald Trump at the center of their lives. Nobody had read his books. Nobody said they attended one of his rallies. Nobody said they attended a rally anti-Trump either. These are people, ordinary folks who have jobs, who have lives, and who potentially could be asked to sit in judgment of their former president. Yeah, very different 
than than sort of the crowds that gather outside these courthouses. And and yet this cross section you're referring to probably a better indication of how most Americans have been dealing with this throughout the years. All right, Aaron Katursky from outside court. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brett. Next up on Start Here, when you launch 300 explosives, you don't get to be the one to call a truce the next day. What Israel and Iran are planning after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The clock fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. You have not told us the complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. You're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series, Monday on ABC. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. They're the most mysterious creatures on Earth. They're masterminds. Shapeshifters. They're just so incredibly alien. And yet, more like us than we ever could have imagined. What more do they have to tell us? It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. This morning, the world continues to wonder if Iran's massive air assault on Israel this weekend will be seen as payback or escalation. Because if it's the former, if Israel treats this as retribution for a strike against Iranian military officials earlier this month, well, that can be that. Everyone can move on, especially since virtually all of Iran's missiles were intercepted. But if that's not how Israel sees it, if they decide this is a step way over the line from the Iranians, well, then you'd expect a military response and the fallout that comes with it. Let's check in with ABC's chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raditz. Martha, you've been working your sources since the moment this was beginning on Saturday. I guess as we look back at just the attack itself, what details stick out to you about it and, and the response from the Israelis and the Americans? I, I think what is remarkable about this is not only the fact that they managed to disable or shoot down all of those drones, almost all of those drones and, and missiles, but the coordination it took. I think, you know, you had the head of CENTCOM going to Israel just before these strikes started. And I'm sure what he was doing is trying to coordinate with the allies who helped out, trying to coordinate with Israel. I mean, just imagine what the sky looked like that night. 
you saw some of those drones, you saw some of those missiles, you saw the interception, but what you really never saw was the fighter jets, dozens of fighter jets, U.S. and Israeli fighter jets. Everybody had to coordinate. We had U.S. ships at sea in the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, all the while sharing data with one another so they don't shoot each other down, mm. but tracking these missiles all along the way, sharing this radar data, sharing everything. But up in the skies that night, it was pretty amazing what they were able to coordinate and in the end, very successfully get rid of those missiles and drones. So with that success in mind, I guess the big question is, is this over from Israel's point of view? Absolutely not. Mm. And a senior U.S. official I, I spoke to said, look, the world may be celebrating the fact that we shot down these drones and missiles, but this is not over. It is not. And the U.S., according to the senior U.S. official, is, is quite certain Israel will respond in some way. Iran, the number one global sponsor of terror, has exposed its true face as the de destabilizer of the region and the world. And now, right now, is when the world must stop ignoring Iran's crimes and take action. And this is something they've, they've prepped for for a very, very long time. Right. Israel knows exactly what they would do in an attack on Iran. The question is, how big an attack? I think the U.S. is, is comfortable with the fact that it would be, uh, or maybe not comfortable, but, but they believe that what the targets would be were, would no doubt be military facilities. They don't believe that Israel would go further than that. But even that is very, very worrisome to the U.S., yeah, what, what does that mean for the Biden administration? How is the White House handling this relationship, I guess, right now? The, the White House, as you know, and they've been public about this, that President Biden has has talked and, and hopes that the Israel understands they've already had a victory in a sense, that there, there was no grave damage from Iran. While the United States does not seek escalation, we will continue to take all necessary action to defend Israel and U.S. personnel. But for the Israelis... You know, Iran hit their soil. It wasn't hitting any place else or something. I mean, and it would be the first time Israel hit Iranian soil. But President Biden has been clear with Prime Minister Netanyahu trying to say, look, please don't overdo this. Please, please be calm about this. You've already got a win on your hands here. Uh, but they just don't know. And the real concern, the real concern is how Iran will then respond. If the U.S. initiate military operation against Iran, its citizen or its security and interest, Iran will use its inherent right to respond proportionately. And that is why the U.S. will not involve itself in any sort of offensive action with the Israelis. Defense, they're okay. Offense, forget it. That's interesting. Okay, that's a helpful delineation. And then even if Iran, uh, I Iran says, like, we're going to stand down if you'll stand down, as you said, very likely that Israel's like, no, this is not over. But even if Iran did stand down, that doesn't even mean it's, it has all these proxies around the region. It doesn't mean they would stop firing at Israel, right? So does that mean you're going to continue having these sorts of, like, provocations, at least, whether Iran claims them or not? I think you you will, no matter what, because that isn't about Iran and Israel. That is about specifically the war in Gaza. Mm. So those proxies will more than likely continue to fire missiles and drones. As you said, not over, especially when you consider the war in Gaza. All right, Martha Raddatz in Washington. Thank you so much. You bet, Brad. About you, but I'm continuously getting texts from unknown numbers asking stuff like, hi, are you interested in a job? Or maybe even, are we still meeting for dinner tonight? This is not someone I've actually met. It is someone trying to initiate a conversation, often with some kind of scam in mind. And texts and calls like this can be really annoying, but recently in Ohio, we saw how high the stakes can be when a scammer is able to make inroads with victims. So the male on the phone was trying to get money from you, and she was knocking on the door at the same time. Yeah. This went beyond money. It ended up with a woman being killed. ABC's Alex Perez has been following this. Alex, what happened here? Yeah, Brad, this is just one of those really unbelievable stories where this is scam led to a fatality and led to a situation that I just don't think a lot of people would have predicted. So both 
people involved here, police say, were victims of the same scam artists. Now, according to police, 81-year-old William Brock had been receiving a number of phone calls over several days, uh, allegedly saying that a relative was incarcerated and the caller was demanding $12,000 to bail this alleged incarcerated relative out of jail. Mm. Um, On the morning of the shooting, March 25th, police say the scam artist called Brock and told him that a driver was coming by his South Charleston, Ohio home to pick up the package with the money. Shortly thereafter arrives Uber driver Lolita Hall who police say had no idea what was going on. Uh, She simply picked up a fare for this Uber ride to pick up a package. All of this was actually captured on Lolita Hall's dashboard camera. Stop. Stop. Or I'll call 911. She was confronted by Brock, who was armed with a handgun. Nope, you're not leaving. Not knowing what exactly was going on, she tried to escape and get to safety. Police say he took her cell phone, and as she tried to get in her car, he shot her three times, and she later died. Wait, and so, uh, this is so bizarre, because I'm imagining an 81-year-old man getting a call about bail or something like that, and he might think that the person who's driving the car is in on it. I mean, if if both people are considered victims of a scam artist how how do how are law enforcement treating the shooter i guess well in this case the shooter has been charged with murder 911 what is the location of your emergency officials say he he kind of took this into his own hands well, i shot her in the leg the first time and i shot her in the shoulder okay so you shot her in the leg and the shoulder yeah he actually confronted her and shot her three times before he called police why did you do that because I was threatened that she was going to come and kill me. She threatened to kill you? No, it's the guy on the phone that's been trying to get um, money out of me. Authorities say, after reviewing that dash cam video, uh, this driver was not posing a threat to uh, Mr. Brock, and, and that's why he's been charged with murder. Right, because it's almost more clear when you see this video from the dash cam. The guy is basically holding this woman at gunpoint. She's terrified. She's crying out for help. Uh, He's white. She's black for whatever that's worth. And then he shoots her non-fatally multiple times. She's immobile, and he shoots her again. So clearly it looks above and beyond. He's pleaded not guilty. Do we know anything about the person who even placed the call in the first place, by the way? Is that person even around? So when when officers responded to that shooting and they were at William Brock's home, the phone was ringing off the hook, they said, and an officer answered that phone, and it was actually, they believe, the scam artist who was calling to inquire about the money that uh, he had been expecting. And uh, that officer tried to arrange a meeting with the uh, alleged scam artist, and the scam artist told the officer, sure, I'll meet you there at this time. But of course, that scam artist never showed up. And then one other interesting detail here, Brad, authorities have been trying to trace this phone number that had been calling uh, Mr. Brock over and over over the course of several weeks, and that phone number uh, was traced to Canada, but Mm. unfortunately, officials believe it's a burner phone, so it's not really leading them to any suspects at this time. Well, and Alex, I I guess I just keep coming back to if you have these calls happening, regardless of who the people on the other end of the lines are, the caller, the scammer is amping the stakes up so high, right? We've heard of other scammers using AI generated voices that sound like the voice of your kids, right? So you get the person so scared and vulnerable. What do authorities say people should do about it? Yeah, Brad, it's really unbelievable the number of Uh, calls and text messages that people are receiving these days. AI scams that actually mimic people's voices. All of a sudden I hear her say, Mommy's bad men have me. Help me, help me, help me. A lot of times these scam artists will try to pull on emotional strings with people, tell you it's a relative or a family member or someone that you care about. And unfortunately, uh, it works. In many cases, as we've seen, people fall victim to this. 
authorities are just reminding people over and over that uh, if it sounds suspicious, it probably is. And also reminding people that, you know, the court system, uh, police officers and other officials will not call you and demand money. If someone is calling you and demanding that you hand over, deliver money, something is wrong and you should probably call police right away. Really disturbing story here. Uber, by the way, says they're cooperating with law enforcement on all this. Uh, Alex Perez, thanks so much. Thanks, Brad. Okay, one more quick break. When we come back, I was trying to figure out why I haven't been sleeping all night. Then it dawned on me. One last thing is next. They're masterminds. Shapeshifters. They're just so incredibly alien. And yet, more like us than we ever could have imagined. What more do they have to tell us? It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. You guys don't know what happened that day. The day that my son died. The clock fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. You have not told us the complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. Just, you're not a good liar. Do you say it just ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 True Crime Limited Series, Monday on ABC. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. It's time to buy the right stuff. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Reporting from Iowa on the 2024 campaign trail, I'm Mary Alice Parks. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live. And one last thing. I'm no scientist, but I'm pretty confident in saying there is a direct link between how much I sleep and how pleasant I am to be around. Well, if everyone's like that, bad news for us all, because surveys now show Americans sleeping less than ever. Yesterday, Gallup put out a new poll showing that only about a quarter of Americans are getting the recommended eight hours of sleep per night. The majority say they get six or seven hours. 20% say they get five hours or less. The nice thing about Gallup is they've been asking this question for decades, so we can track it over time. And we are getting less sleep than Americans did in 1990 or 2000, let alone compared to 1942, when even during a war, more than half the country was getting its eight hours of shut-eye. What's extra interesting about these numbers is who is affected most. Women are significantly less likely to say they feel like they're getting enough sleep compared to men. Young people people are less likely to get a good night's sleep than older folks. And in the same poll, these are the exact groups who say they were experiencing more stress than just a few years ago. We're talking about women, particularly younger women. 
And this isn't a recent thing, either. The stress numbers have been rising steadily since 2003. Part of this could be the lopsided expectations of young moms versus young dads. Some of it could be due to the digital revolution over the last two decades. Like, when is a young professional truly away from work? Or, for that matter, social pressures. The one thing we know is, study after study shows people who get a good night's sleep are much likelier to say they are happy in their lives. So, get some Z's, please. I kid you not, my wife was talking in her sleep the other night, and the words coming out of her mouth were, I can't sleep. Like, that, that, that seems indicative of the problem here. We're even thinking about how we can't sleep when we're asleep. And by the way, this is what podcasts are good for you guys. You don't need to wake up just for us. You can sleep in. We'll still be here if ready for a download when you're ready. More on all these stories at abcnews.com or the ABC News app. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a pair, any. How important made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my L. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families. On the ground in Ukraine. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. I'm Kana Whitworth at the Apex Summit in San Francisco. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good morning, I'm Stephanie Ramos. Today on ABC News Live, first Trump on trial. The former president will return back to a Manhattan courthouse any minute now after more than half the first round of jurors were dismissed. We have reaction from in and outside of the courtroom on the first day of the trial and what it is going to take to find a fair jury. Israel is vowing it will strike back after Iran's unprecedented missile and drone barrage as we learn new details about what the IDF is calling Operation Iron Shield. And a severe weather threat is on the move where tornado watches are under effect right now. Plus, the women taking the WNBA by storm. Caitlin Clark, Camila Cardoso, and Angel Reese are trending this morning. A look at where the amazing players are headed and why Indiana fans were sent into a frenzy. Jury selection is resuming this morning in the historic criminal trial of former President Trump. Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. The former president was in the courtroom all day yesterday as nearly 100 potential jurors filed in. Most of them indicated they could not be impartial and were dismissed. Trump calls the case a scam and a political witch hunt, saying, quote, 
out we're not going to be given a fair trial. ABC News senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky has the latest from the courthouse in downtown Manhattan. Donald Trump returns to the courtroom where lawyers are winnowing the pool of New Yorkers to find 12 jurors and six alternates to hear the case charging the former president with falsifying business records to conceal stories about his sex life from voters before the 2016 election. Trump using a platform no other criminal defendant has, a microphone in the hallway. Nothing like this has ever happened before. It's never been anything like it. Once seated in court, Trump was stern-faced. He craned his neck to eye prospective jurors and flashed a tight-lipped smile, one woman giggling in recognition of who was seated at the defense table. The judge asking if they knew potential witnesses, a who's who of the Trump family, campaign, and administration. Melania Trump, Ivanka Trump, Rudy Giuliani, Hope Hicks, Michael Cohen. The judge then saying, raise your hand if you believe you cannot be fair and impartial. More than half of the first batch of 96 potential jurors raised their hand and were immediately dismissed. In the hallway, one heard saying, I just couldn't do it. A cross-section of New Yorkers, an oncology nurse, a bookseller, a salesman originally from Ireland, answered questions one by one. A woman who works in retail sent home after saying she had strong opinions about Trump that would interfere with her ability to be a fair and impartial juror. Politics was always going to run headlong into this trial, and on the very first day, Trump found out how restrictive that can be. He asked permission to skip next Thursday so he can attend U.S. Supreme Court arguments over his presidential immunity claim. The judge said no. Arguing before the Supreme Court is a big deal, the judge said, but having a trial in New York County Supreme Court with a jury of 12 and perhaps six alternates, that is also a big deal. He needs to be present. Trump also asking to skip court the day his son Barron graduates from high school. The judge said, depends on how we are doing on time. It looks like the judge isn't going to allow me to escape this scam. It's a scam trial. ABC News senior investigative correspondent Aaron Kontursky joins me now, along with ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for more. Guys, we are back again. Day two. Aaron, I want to start with you. Hundreds of prospective jurors showed up yesterday, but not a single juror has been seated. We know they were asked many, many questions, but here we are, no jurors. What stands out to you from that process? I really think it's interesting how most of the prospective jurors signaled they do not put Donald Trump at the center of their lives. Uh, there, there was the bookseller from the Upper West Side, the young lawyer whose wife is pregnant uh, with their first child, uh, the woman who just got a job at Bloomingdale's. None of them have read his books. They didn't read Michael Cohen's books either. They haven't been to a Trump rally. They haven't been to an anti-Trump rally. These are just ordinary folks going about their lives who will be asked to sit in judgment of the former president uh, as that jury selection continues now. Certainly going to be a difficult process. Brian, the judge rejected a claim from Trump's team that the jury questionnaire would allow anti-Trump jurors to be selected. What's the exact argument there? I'm not sure if it's much of a legal argument so much of one of an opinion. Uh, the basis is, I don't know. Uh, both attorneys, prosecutors and defense attorneys, have the opportunity to kind of really sculpt this 42-question questionnaire. And you see things like, um, what type of social media do you participate in? What rallies have you gone to? Uh, what is your political affiliation? Things of that nature. Um, not going as far as, do you support Trump? Do you support Joe Biden? Did you? Who did you vote for? But I think that both sides have the ability to suss out into individuals who are going to be biased for or against the former president. So I don't think that's really a concern uh, that either side should have here. Certainly trying to find a, a jury that is fair, could be fair and impartial. Aaron, the judge also decided what evidence could and could not be admitted. What's the latest on that? A lot of these rulings might have favored the, the prosecution, but not all of them. He ruled, for example, Karen McDougal uh, would be allowed to, to testify for the prosecution. She has claimed that she took hush money from, from Donald Trump through the National Enquirer to catch and kill her story of an alleged affair with Trump, which he denies. Uh, and, and the Access Hollywood tape in which Trump has overheard talking about grabbing women the prosecution can quote from the tape, but the judge said playing it for the jury so they could hear Trump in his own words would be extremely prejudicial. And, and Brian, you were here with me in studio yesterday when prosecutors asked the judge to hold Trump in contempt for allegedly violating a limited gag order. We saw the former president there speaking before cameras before going into that courtroom. Um, but that uh, 
contempt in, in, in court requests or contempt uh, for, for that limited gag order request, that was put in place when Trump made public comments about uh, or requested after uh, Trump made public comments about potential witnesses, prospective jurors, and just about everyone else involved in this trial. So what are the next steps and, and what's at stake? Well, the prosecution asked for what I believe to be the maximum fine associated because they're talking about contempt of court as an A misdemeanor, where you violate a court order, you go against what basically the judge told you not to do. And so the max fine, there's $1,000 for each violation. And that's what the prosecution is asking for in three set instances. And so what's at stake is, is his pocketbook. Uh, we've always talked about, at least for the last couple of months, how much Donald Trump owns in terms of the E. Jean Carroll case uh, and other defamation laws lawsuits. A few thousand dollars, I don't think are going to hurt him all that much. Uh, however, persistently violating a gag order could amount to a lot of money. And a judge could start thinking, you know what? If your pocketbook isn't going to stop you from speaking, maybe a, a short-term detention uh, in the kind of courthouse jail room, so to speak, because there are detention rooms uh, just beyond the, the courtroom or even in the basement or, or close by. I don't think Donald Trump's going to get sent to Rikers uh, for contempt of court. That rarely happens even to the average citizen. Uh, but what's at stake is escalating punishments if the judge does feel uh, that Donald Trump has violated the order of the court. Right, those mounting fines. And Aaron, the judge denied a request from defense attorney Todd Blanche to excuse Trump from the proceedings in New York next Thursday when his presidential immunity case goes before the U.S. Supreme Court. Trump is complaining he won't be able to go to his son Barron's graduation or campaign. How significant is that, that the judge isn't budging? This kind of conflict, I think, Stephanie, was bound to happen. The, the politics that, that Trump wants to adhere to with the, the rather drab courthouse realities that he is now having to confront as a criminal defendant. Judge Mershon said that it is a big deal to argue before the U.S. Supreme Court, as Trump and his lawyers will do next Thursday over presidential immunity. But the judge said being a criminal defendant on trial in New York is also a big deal. So he said Trump needs to be present in court. He's tethered to his seat. He can't really speak. His lawyers do all the talking. Uh, and he is addressed rather generically as the defendant. Only his lawyers call him president. So he is far now from the, the adulation of a campaign rally crowd and the, the rather glitzy surroundings of his golf courses. Aaron Kudersky and Brian Buckmeyer, thank you both so much. We will be following this story all day long and bring you the latest right here on ABC News Live. The Israeli War Cabinet is meeting today for a third day in a row. Members are still considering what Israel's response will be to Iran's unprecedented attack as the IDF vows to retaliate. This comes as the Biden administration and other world leaders urge Israel to show restraint. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman has the latest from Israel. The Middle East on edge with Iran vowing a massive response to the slightest action from Israel as Israel vows to retaliate for that rain of missiles. Iran will face the consequences for its actions. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu convening his war cabinet for the third consecutive day to discuss a response to that unprecedented barrage of more than 300 missiles and drones early Sunday. We saw a response multi-layered, multinational against that would-be ring of fire that Iran intended on enduring and putting on Israel. We stopped that. The coordinated response from a U.S.-led coalition, including Britain and France, thwarting the attack, the IDF saying 99% of those incoming threats intercepted. An Israeli official telling ABC News Iran actually increased the number of ballistic missiles it would fire once it learned of the scope of the U.S.-led coalition against it. They knew that many were going to be defeated. But the aim was to get as many of them through Israel's defenses as possible. And for the 12 minutes it took for those missiles to arc from Iran to Israel, American and Israeli officials unsure if their missile net would hold. It did. A senior Israeli Air Force official telling ABC News multiple Middle Eastern countries provided Israel with an early warning. And Israel's Arrow aerial defense system taking down ballistic missiles seen streaming over Jerusalem. The IDF saying this new video shows Israeli troops pulling one of those bus-sized ballistic missiles out of the Dead Sea. 
President Biden saying the U.S. is committed to the safety of troops in the region and to Israel's security, but the administration making it clear that the U.S. will not participate in any Israeli counterstrike. Iran says its attack avenged Israel's strike earlier this month that killed two top generals at a consulate complex in Syria. This is one of the 130 ballistic missiles that Iran launched against Israel. And you can see that this 40 long section, this is just the fuel tank. The engine would have been on the other side, the warhead over there. And Israeli officials tell me that if one of these had actually hit a population center, it could have taken out a building, killing dozens of people. And that might have set off a regional war. Now, I'm told that the most likely Israeli retribution will be a cyber attack or uh, the killing of an Iranian official somewhere in the world. I'm told that a key consideration for Israel is preserving this uh, defensive coalition built by the U.S. to defend Israel. That was Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman for us in Israel. Thank you. And the attack by Iran has Congress scrambling to pass aid for Israel and possibly for Ukraine. Now House Speaker Mike Johnson says he'll break up the votes and bring four separate measures to the floor that include aid for Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan. Senior Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott is on Capitol Hill with the latest. Well, it is shaping up to be a big week here on Capitol Hill. So let's start with House Speaker Mike Johnson's new plan on how to address funding for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. For months, the Speaker of the House has avoided saying how he plans to address these issues, but now facing growing pressure, he has revealed his plan for the first time. It is a complicated one. We're going to walk you through this. So the Speaker made it clear that the Senate's foreign aid package, which was passed with Democrats and Republicans in the Senate, will not be getting a vote over over in the House and wrapped together aid for Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan all into one. Instead, Speaker Johnson plans to break up that package into four separate measures, one bill on each issue with a final bill that's really shaping up to be a Republican conservative policy wish list. Johnson knows that he has a razor thin majority. He's trying to satisfy all different wings of his party so that he can keep the speaker's gavel. Sources tell me that Johnson did speak with President Biden by phone before unveiling this plan behind closed doors to Republicans. It's unclear if Democrats are going to go along with any of this, but either way, Johnson Johnson says there will be votes on those bills this week. One thing that we also have our eye on is when the House sends over those articles of impeachment for Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. You may remember it was just weeks ago when the House decided to impeach Secretary Mayorkas over his handling of the border. He's the first cabinet secretary in 150 years to be impeached. Democrats pointing out there is no evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors, which is why they are expected to move to quickly dismiss these charges. Stephanie. We will be watching that closely. Thank you so much, Rachel. The U.S. Supreme Court is allowing Idaho's ban on gender-affirming care for minors to be enforced. Devin Dwyer is outside the court with more. Hey there, Devin. Stephanie, the court did not weigh in on the merits of the law, but the conservative majority said it can now be enforced while a lawsuit goes forward. Idaho's law would punish doctors with up to 10 years in prison if they provide puberty blockers or hormone therapy to transgender kids under the age of 18. It has been challenged by two families seeking that care. The court did say they can continue to receive the care as this goes forward, but Idaho now joins 20 other states in severely restricting gender affirming treatments that over the guidance of major American medical associations, the court's three liberal justices said they would have kept the law temporarily on hold with the expectation that some point in the future they will hear this case. Stephanie. Thank you so much, Devin. Devin Dwyer for us at the Supreme Court. Millions of Americans are bracing for another round of severe weather. In the last 24 hours, more than 90 reports of severe storms came in from South Dakota to Virginia. ABC News Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking it all for us. Ginger. Let's talk about the severe storms because there are about 100 reports in the last 24 hours. Plenty of lightning there, Allentown, Pennsylvania. Really nice slow down, but look at that. Up to golf ball size hail was reported in Virginia. So it's all about the plains now. It's been a busy day already. Already started the morning in many places with tornado watches in Nebraska and Kansas. But this afternoon, it's all about eastern Iowa, western Illinois, northeastern Missouri. So that's where the tornado threat is. And it doesn't stop there. It's going to keep marching east. And so it kind of twists around this low. And that's where Ann Arbor or Detroit, down through Cleveland, back to Evansville, Indiana, Cincinnati's included, and even Fort Wayne. We'll get into it tomorrow. So the severe threat erupts in the same area that's had the most tornadoes across the nation already this year. 
Stephanie. Thanks so much, Ginger. Coming up, an 81-year-old charged with murder after shooting an Uber driver. Why authorities believe both of them were victims of the same scam. Also ahead, rust armorer Hannah Gutierrez is given the maximum in the fatal onset shooting. What it could mean for Alec Baldwin's trial. Whenever news breaks, we are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. An elderly man in Ohio is under arrest for fatally shooting an Uber driver. Authorities believe they were both victims of a scam. Alex Perez has more. Authorities warning the public after a phone scam turned fatal. This dramatic dash cam video capturing the deadly confrontation between a female Uber driver and an Ohio homeowner last month after authorities say they were both unknowingly targeted by scammers. Getting a report of a female that has been shot. She's laying in the driveway. 81-year-old William Brock charged with the murder of 61-year-old Uber driver Lolita Hall. Police say it all started when Brock received multiple calls from scammers who told him a relative had been arrested and demanded $12,000 for bail, telling him a driver would arrive at his home to pick up a package with the money. The guy on the phone was trying to get money out of me. He was telling me he was going to... Yo, man, the family. Authorities believe the same scammers directed Hall through the Uber app to pick up a package at Brock's home. They say this video shows her walking up to his door with no apparent knowledge of the circumstances when Brock confronts her at gunpoint. I was threatened that she was going to come and kill me. You can hear Hall oh, frantically God. trying to explain why she's there. Sir. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I know what you're after. Police say Brock took her cell phone, and when she tried to get in her car to get to safety, investigators say Brock shot her three times. Then he called 911. I shot her in the leg first time, and I shot her in the shoulder. Hall later dying from her wounds. Officers are searching Brock's home after the shooting, saying they answered a call from a person they believed to be the scammer who agreed to a meeting but never showed up. Investigators saying they traced that number to Canada, but it's believed to be a burner phone number. Uber banning that account, cooperating with authorities, and in a statement saying, this is a horrific tragedy and our hearts continue to be with Lolita's loved ones. According to the FTC, in 2023, there were more than 33,000 reports of family and friend imposter scams like this and $89 million lost. 
And Stephanie Brock is out on bond and officials say he could face additional charges. Authorities want to remind everyone that law enforcement will never ever call and ask for money. Stephanie? Such a horrible story. Alex Perez for us. Thank you so much. Coming up, fighting childhood cancer. What researchers in Florida are calling a possible new important breakthrough. But first, the women taking the WNBA by storm. Caitlin Clark, Camila Cardoso, and Angel Reese are trending this morning. A look at where they're headed and why Indiana fans were sent into a frenzy. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love? Pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting in Atlanta, Georgia, outside the Fulton County Courthouse, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Caitlin Clark was officially drafted by the Indiana Fever as the number one pick in the WNBA. This comes on the heels of a game changing March Madness and had everyone buzzing about the WNBA draft. ABC's Lara Spencer has all the big moments from last night. With the first pick in the 2024 WNBA draft, the Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. Excitement hitting a fever pitch as basketball superstar Caitlin Clark officially launches her WNBA career. I've dreamed of this moment since I was in second grade, and it's taken a lot of hard work, a lot of ups and downs, but uh, more than anything, just trying to soak it in. The NCAA leading scorer and overall number one draft pick chosen by the Indiana Fever basking in the moment with her family. I told my mom before this is like, you know, I earned it and that's why I'm so proud of it. Thousands of fans from her new team erupting in celebration. Her new teammates ready with Clark's jersey in hand. Clark, one of several superstars taking their talents to the WNBA this year. Cameron Brink, Stanford University. After an electric season, number two overall pick Cameron Brink heading to the Los Angeles Sparks. Her godparents are the parents of NBA superstar Steph Curry. The two have known each other since they were kids. So I actually FaceTimed Steph like five minutes before the, the show started. So he just said to, to just have fun with it. I think he can just share so much great advice. And Chi-Town doubling up on star power. Camilla Cardosa. Angel Reese, LSU. 
third pick, Camila Cardozo, and seventh pick, Angel Reese, former SEC rivals, now teammates for the Chicago Sky. I had a goal to be here tonight and give my family a better life. So I'm just so thankful that I was able to be here. <laughs> I'm just so excited. I get to play with Camilla. And for the first time in more than 25 years, two Hawkeyes drafted in the same year. Clark's Iowa teammate Kate Martin, a surprise pick in the second round, heading to the Las Vegas Aces. I was here to support Caitlin. All I wanted was an opportunity, and I got it, so I'm really excited. Our thanks to Lara Spencer for wrapping all of that up for us. And congratulations to all the women selected last night. That is exciting. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The crown in crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. The Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Good morning, I'm Stephanie Ramos. Former President Trump is speaking at court before jury selection resumes in his hush money trial this morning. Let's listen in. Mr. Trump, are you glad you have a jury? Mr. Trump, do you think this, this trial would cost you the uh, White House? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. This is a trial that should have never been brought. It's a trial that is being looked upon, looked at all over the world, they're calling. They're, they're looking at it and analyzing it. Every legal pundit, every legal scholar said this trial is a disgrace. We have a Trump-hating judge. We have a judge who shouldn't be on this case. He's totally conflicted. But this is a trial that should never happen. It should have been thrown out a long time ago. If you look at uh, Jonathan Turley, Andy McCarthy, all great legal scholars, 
There's not one that we've been able to find that said this should be a trial. I called a, I was, I was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense, some accountant, I didn't know, marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was. And you get indicted over that? I should be right now in Pennsylvania, in Florida, in many other states, North Carolina, Georgia, campaigning. This is all coming from the Biden White House because the guy can't put two sentences together. He can't campaign. They're using this in order to try and win an election. And it's not working that way. It's working the opposite way. So check that out. Legal expense. It's called legal expense. That's what you're supposed to call it. You get indicted on that. Nobody's ever seen it. Nobody has ever seen anything like it. So thank you very much for coming. I'm now going to sit down for many hours. I am now going to sit down. The voters understand it. All you have to do is look at the polls. This is a sham trial, and the judge should recuse himself. Thank you very much. Former President Trump there speaking to reporters at the courthouse here in Lower Manhattan saying this case should have never been brought. Every legal scholar called it a disgrace, calling out the judge and also speaking about polls. Chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl joins me now. And John, it's kind of like deja vu. We saw the president yesterday do kind of the same, speaking to reporters, speaking about this. We'll probably see this every day of this trial. But what do you what do you make of this? Uh, he he this turned into context. He turned it up a little bit. He turned it up a little bit from yesterday. Yes. Uh, yes. And and by the way, can we do just a, a quick a quick fact check? He said every legal scholar. Every legal pundit says this trial is a disgrace that should never have been brought. And then he named two individuals, both uh, conservative pro-Trump legal analysts who regularly appear on Fox News. So it's not true uh, that every legal, I mean, you know, th 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 this is going to be standard. He's going to say stuff like this over and over again. But what I saw there was, uh, was Trump, who looked defeated and... Um, almost exhausted yesterday when he came out of, uh, of the courtroom, uh, clearly irritated and clearly angry. Here, it was more leading in with the anger. He is lashing out. This is just the beginning of day two. And what I'm wondering, Stephanie, is what is Donald Trump going to be looking like and saying and acting like as he goes through week two, week three, week four, week five of this trial? Uh, absolutely. It's going to take quite some time. and, and, and we will likely see him every single day with breaks on Wednesdays, right? They're not going to have court on Wednesdays. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, four days a week. Uh, the Trump team may try to challenge Friday, um, uh, uh, particularly if there's an issue with uh, Orthodox Jews who want to have Friday. So w w we'll see. But right now, the schedule is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, four days a week until this trial is over. I want to bring in ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer on this. Uh, uh, what do you make of this? Brian, you were here with me in studio yesterday when we saw the former president there arrive at the courthouse and also speak to cameras and, and reporters. And as John mentioned, he kind of dialed it up a little bit today. So what should we expect to see in court today? I know that we're still going through that jury selection process, but will we get any closer today? Well, first, I'm, I'm a little confused because I don't know if I'm a legal pundit or not. I guess Donald Trump doesn't count me as one because I haven't said the words that he said. Um, but I think we're going to continue with the same process. What, what I will point out is uh, Judge Mershon has kind of made the process a little bit more unique than what we typically see in a Manhattan courthouse or in, in most of, of the state. And that's that people are allowed to kind of almost self-select. So he's giving them the opportunity to say, do you think you cannot be on this jury? And if they raise their hand, they're out. That process does exist for most criminal cases. But what typically happens is the judge may ask uh, the juror to walk up to the bench, have both parties approach as well, and the defendant has the opportunity to also approach as well. But because the defendant here is the former president and there's so much security and there's and a lot of pe moving pieces, the judge has said, we're going to skip that part, and if people self-select, we'll just let them step out. If we get to a point where everyone is just self-selecting and kind of moving out, I think the judge may go back to what we typically see in a court and say, all right, come up, let's have the conversation. And nine times out of ten, I've experienced that a a conversation with a judge, a juror will say, you know what, I have these feelings, 
but I think I can put them aside and still be fair and balanced. And that might be a different uh, approach that the judge takes either today or going forward if we can't find a juror. And John, here we are, the second day, zero jurors. Yeah. What are you watching out for today as we go through the selection process? I'm looking beyond the mechanics of jury selection. It's, it's the process of Donald Trump being in a courtroom uh, for the better part of an entire day with small breaks, uh, a courtroom where he cannot leave. He is compelled to be there. A courtroom where he is not in charge. It's, the, it's one of the only places we ever see Donald Trump where he is not the one running the show. He has to sit there for the most part silently. And how the cumulative effect of this uh, affects both his psyche, his behavior. Uh, there is a limited gag order in place. He's abided by that. He stepped a little closer to the line just now, you know, uh, lashing out at a Trump-hating judge. He can do that. But when he starts going after potential witnesses, when he starts going after courtroom staff, um, which he did regularly in his civil fraud trial, I, I, I think this is going to have an impact um, on the campaign that is not really predictable. I mean, the legal troubles have helped him so far, in a way, uh, by rallying his supporters, I'm the victim, I'm the victim. Uh, but for the first time, we're now seeing lengthy proceedings that he must be at and he cannot leave. Mm -hmm. and, and on that same note, you know this, Trump has complained about not having that time to be on the campaign trail yeah. because he's stuck in court. Uh, but at the same time, haven't these, these court appearances kind of worked as uh, mm -hmm. campaign rightly where That's the tone we're getting every time that we see him kind of approach the cameras. So how could this impact the election? I mean, we, we, we've seen a blurring of the courtroom and, and, and the campaign trail now for, for months. Um, and he has used appearances in courtrooms to come out and to drive his campaign message. And in fact, you know, the Donald Trump of 2024, and, this, and you remember, he, not, he launched his campaign, um, you know, over a year ago, almost a year and a half ago, has spent very little time actually on the campaign trail. I mean, there are there are months where he is spending, even without being compelled to, where he has been spent, he has spent more time in court. So I, I think you're going to continue to see that. But we should also, when we hear him complain that he can't get out on the campaign trail, be aware that he's actually not spending a lot of time, even when he was able to, uh, out on the campaign trail. The courtroom is for Donald Trump, the campaign trail. Right, and that time not on the trail isn't affecting him. He's, his supporters are still there, yep. you know, backing him up. And as you said, this is this is his time, and, and we will likely see him kind of approach cameras as we run through this selection process this week and possibly into next week. Mm -hmm. John, thank you so much. Brian Buckmeyer, thanks to you as well. We, we, we will be following this story all day long and bringing the latest right here on ABC News Live. Meanwhile, in other news, Rust Armor Hannah Gutierrez has been sentenced to 18 months in prison for the fatal onset shooting of Helena Hutchins. This comes after Gutierrez begged the judge not to send her to prison. ABC's Mola Lenghi is in New Mexico with more. The armor tasked with keeping weapons safe on the set of Rust, waking up behind bars for the fatal shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. The state has approached this prosecution um, from a standpoint of compassion for Ms. Gutierrez, for her age, for her lack of experience. My compassion came to an end. The judge handing down the maximum prison sentence to Hannah Gutierrez, 18 months, along with an emphatic admonishment. You alone turned a safe weapon into a lethal weapon. Ahead of learning her fate, Gutierrez addressing the Santa Fe courtroom for the very first time. My heart goes out to the film industry for the devastating pain that this tragedy caused. Begging for a chance at redemption. The jury has found me in part at fault for this god-awful tragedy. But that doesn't make me a monster. That makes me human. I'm the armor. Gutierrez's defense team tried to paint her as the scapegoat for producers, including Alec Baldwin, who was holding the revolver when it went off, fatally striking Hutchins and injuring director Joel Souza. Something that you guys had, had mentioned throughout the course of this trial is that she has been a scapegoat in this. Do you she feel was a scapegoat. The, the, um, you look at her role and what the other people's role was. You look at the producers. Several people talk about producers today and what they did and how the rushed environment they created, the safety problems. And then you look at throwing all of it on one person. Gutierrez's attorney speaking exclusively with ABC News. Mr. Baldwin might face a uh, sentence like 
Miss Gutierrez did today, the full 18 months. So yeah, you'd have to be very nervous. You got very good attorneys, and I know they're working hard on it, but I think he's got to be nervous at this point. Well, Hannah Gutierrez's attorney telling me they intend to appeal. In the meantime, all eyes are on Alec Baldwin's upcoming criminal trial. That is scheduled for July. He has pleaded not guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Stephanie. Thank you very much, Mola. Let's bring in ABC News legal contributor and managing partner at the Cochrane firm, Shauna Lloyd, for more on this. Uh, good to have you, Shauna. Uh, in, in Mola's exclusive with, defense, with a defense attorney, he says Gutierrez was a scapegoat in this and said the environment played a role. Will that have an impact on future trials? It absolutely can because what we are talking about are systematic failures. So anyone that is responsible for those can be held accountable for that systematic failure. She obviously as the armorer had the primary duty, but there are others in the chain of command that had some failings here on this set. And Alec Baldwin, he will be on trial for involuntary manslaughter in July. What are you watching out for with that, with that trial? What we're really looking for with that trial, Stephanie, is to see how the defense adjusts to the information that they have at hand. They've seen this trial play out. They understand what the jury took issue with. So they're going to use that to their advantage so that way they can craft his defense. They're going to lean very heavily on the fact that he was not in charge of putting the bullets in the gun, that Hannah Gutierrez was, and they're going to lean into that for his defense. Okay, and, and so his trial is in July. Uh, what happens next? Is that the next, the next event in all of this, or is there uh, some, something else that comes up before then? Well, we're definitely going to see an appeal. We won't see it play out before uh, Alec Baldwin's trial, but there'll definitely be an appeal from Hannah Gutierrez's defense team. They're already signaling that that's to be expected. So we're going to see her appeal play out. The next thing will be Alec Baldwin's trial, which we will see his defense and the state come after him for that involuntary manslaughter. And we will see the verdict on that likely before we get any information on Hannah's appeal. All right, Shauna, thank you so much. Shauna Lloyd for us there. Appreciate your time. Coming up, fighting childhood cancer, what researchers in Florida are calling a possible new important breakthrough. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me.
Welcome back. Cancer researchers at Florida International University say they have developed a potentially groundbreaking treatment that shows promise for hard to treat cancers. 83% of children who'd had a relapse of cancer reportedly showed improvement, and that includes Logan Jenner, who has been battling cancer since he was just three years old. ABC's Victor Okendo has this story. How would you describe your son, Logan? I would describe Logan as a miracle. At just three years old, Logan Jenner was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia, an aggressive cancer of the blood and bone marrow. Logan went through four rounds of chemotherapy, followed by a bone marrow transplant before going into remission. For the first year, he was doing really well. And then unfortunately, in February of the next year, we found out that he had relapsed. According to the American Cancer Society, cancer is the second leading cause of death in children under 15. Were you afraid that cancer was going to take his life this time around? Yes, I was. It really shook my faith a lot. No. Logan's oncologist told the Jenners about a clinical trial at Florida International University. We are the first to guide individualized treatments in children that have hard to treat cancers. Functional drug testing in simple terms is testing of hundreds of FDA approved drugs directly on the patient's own living cancer cells in the lab and identifying which drugs work and which don't for each individual patient. So you're finding exactly which drugs work on which specific patient. Exactly. And we are showing that we can identify treatments or which combinations of drugs work and which don't and give results back to the doctors within a week. Turning around results to doctors quickly is very important and critical when we're dealing with children with cancers that have very progressive diseases or cancers that get worse day by day. Let me just put my gloves on. Dr. Razam and her team of researchers look at cancer cells for a number of patients to guide treatment as a part of the trial. Logan was simply known as patient 13. So what did you discover worked in patient number 13's cancer sample? One important one that we found was that two drug combinations were as effective as three drugs. And so his doctor could eliminate one of these drugs from his treatment. The other important result from the testing was we identified which drug that is targeted to his mutation. And the third interesting observation that was important information for his treatment was that his cancer cells in the lab doubled with steroids. Logan's oncologist, Dr. Fader, applied Dr. Razam's analysis of which FDA-approved drug regimen would best target Logan's cancer cells to create a personalized treatment for him, and he went into remission. How much faster did this treatment work? Instead of four cycles, he needed two, which is good, especially considering it was a relapse case. I think it was about 35 days he goes into remission. And it's not only the fact that he went into remission, right, which is a miracle on its own. It saved him so much time from being in the hospital. It's, it saved him, you know, just having to take all these other medications that he didn't need. How did Dr. Razam's work help Logan's fight against cancer? Dr. Razam's fight made him thrive when there was no hope, really, when almost all hope is lost. While this study was just on a small sample of patients and this type of treatment is not yet widely available, Dr. Azam is continuing her research in the hopes to help others. I hope and I believe that using this approach that the day will come where we can transform cancer into a chronic treatable disease, just like diabetes. Two years later, Logan is now eight years old and healthy. I tell her this all the time I share Logan with her, you know, I really do. He's my son and I brought him into this world that she saved him. Her and Dr. Fader saved him. I kick cancer's butt. How adorable. So happy to see Logan doing much better. That is incredible progress. Our thanks to FIU, the researchers there, and Victor Okendo as well. Now to an ABC News investigation into the Los Angeles County Probation Department. It's supposed to protect and rehabilitate vulnerable youth, but is having some trouble of itself. A months-long reporting uh, 
from ABC News' live anchor, Lindsay Davis, looks at more than 2,500 claims of abuse at the hands of probation officers, in some cases including sexual abuse, inside their very own facilities. Dominique Anderson is one plaintiff among thousands who alleges in a lawsuit that L.A. County probation officers abused her. You're not old enough to consent. And that's the tough thing about being a victim. You never see it that this person is abusing their authority. You don't see it as them preying on you as being a child. You see it as this is a man of power. This is a man of affluence. This is an educated man. He's, a, he's not a probation officer. He's a supervisor. Dominique says after she reported being sexually abused by one of her probation officers, she was then approached by a female staff member asking her not to blow the whistle. She said he has a daughter, he has a career, he has a lot to lose. What did you lose? I think I lost my innocence, my self-esteem. There's a, a, a saying that, that loosely translated in English is, who will guard the guards? And I'm wondering if you feel that anybody was. No. And it's hard. It's hard when it's this pervasive, because everybody's dirty. Some of the accused probation officers have retired and are still being paid their pensions. Their attorneys and L.A. County deny all of those allegations. You can watch the full report tonight on ABC News Live Prime, beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern, right here on ABC News Live. Coming up, the women taking the WNBA by storm. Caitlin Clark, Camila Cardoso, and Angel Reese, they are trending this morning. A look at where they're headed and why Indiana fans were sent into a frenzy. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love? Pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Caitlin Clark was officially drafted by the Indiana Fever as the number one pick in the WNBA. This comes on the heels of a game-changing March Madness that had everyone buzzing about the WNBA draft. ABC's Lara Spencer has all the big moments from last night. With the first pick in the 2024 WNBA draft, the Indiana Fever select 
Caitlin Clark, <laughs> University of Iowa. Excitement hitting a fever pitch as basketball superstar Caitlin Clark officially launches her WNBA career. I've dreamed of this moment since I was in second grade, and it's taken a lot of hard work, a lot of ups and downs, but uh, more than anything, just trying to soak it in. The NCAA leading scorer and overall number one draft pick chosen by the Indiana Fever, basking in the moment with her family. I told my mom before this, is like, you know, I earned it, and that's why I'm so proud of it. Thousands of fans from her new team erupting in celebration. Her new teammates ready with Clark's jersey in hand. Clark, one of several superstars taking their talents to the WNBA this year. Cameron Brink, Stanford University. After an electric season, number two overall pick Cameron Brink heading to the Los Angeles Sparks. Her godparents are the parents of NBA superstar Steph Curry. The two have known each other since they were kids. So I actually FaceTimed Steph like five minutes before the, the show started. So he just said to, to just have fun with it. I think he can just share so much great advice. And Chi Town doubling up on star power. Camilla Cardosa. Angel Reese, LSU. Third pick, Camila Cardozo, and seventh pick, Angel Reese, former SEC rivals, now teammates for the Chicago Sky. I had a goal to be here tonight and give my family a better life. So I'm just so thankful that I was able to be here. <laughs> I'm just so excited. I get to play with Camilla. And for the first time in more than 25 years, two Hawkeyes drafted in the same year. Clark's Iowa teammate Kate Martin, a surprise pick in the second round, heading to the Las Vegas Aces. I was here to support Caitlin. All I wanted was an opportunity, and I got it, so I'm really excited. All right, thanks to Lara Spencer for that wrap-up, and congratulations to all the women that were selected last night. Thank you for streaming with us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown 
in crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families. On the ground in Ukraine. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. I'm Gio Benitez covering the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge here in Maryland. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Thanks for joining us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Let's get right to our top story. Jury selection is resuming this morning in the historic criminal trial of former President Trump. Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. Trump is now in the courtroom as the proceedings are resuming. Earlier, he spoke to reporters about the trial, saying the case should have never been brought. It's a trial that is being looked upon, looked at all over the world, they're calling. They're, they're looking at it and analyzing it. Every legal pundit, every legal scholar said this trial is a disgrace. ABC News senior reporter Catherine Falders joins me now, along with ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for more. Brian, I want to start with you. Trump says this case should have never been brought. We just heard him. Uh, he says this because falsifying documents is usually a misdemeanor. What do you make of that argument? So his argument, as we've heard from a lot of Trump supporters, is that this is an invented charge, uh, partly because we haven't really seen this application before. But but a lot of what Donald Trump has done, we haven't seen before. This is the way it works. To make it an E-class felony, bumping it up from a misdemeanor to a felony, you need to have the falsification of documents to conceal another crime. And what Donald Trump, I think, is alluding to is that the FEC said that, they're, that they did not go forward in terms of any federal election crimes. But there was a six-person panel. It was divided amongst uh, Republicans and Democrats, and it was a two-to-two -two vote with one recusing and one not showing up to vote. But their 70-some-odd page report in December of 2020 said that there was reason to believe that there was a violation of the election code, but through their discretion, they chose not to go forward. That's very different than saying that there isn't an election violation, and that's what Alvin Bragg kind of is, is arguing here. It seems that he picked up the torch continued the investigation, believes that there's election violations underlying this case, and that the falsifying of the documents creates this e-felony charge. And so right now, it's just up to the prosecutor to try to prove that. Right. Uh, and Catherine, what stands out to you as jury selection continues? Here we are, second day, zero jurors. Well, of course, I think the first thing is how many jurors have said they can't be fair or impartial. Now, I guess Donald Trump's team would say that they're not totally surprised by that. They tried to change uh, the venue of this case, for example. Um, but we'll just have to see as the day goes on, do the Trump lawyers try and uh, make some other motion to change the venue? I've been hearing some murmurs about that. I'm not really quite sure how logistically uh, that will work. I think uh, the judge won't allow that, but you could potentially see some Hail Marys, if you will, from the Trump uh, legal team as the day goes on. And, and I think the big question is, uh, when will we get our first juror? That's obviously what I'm uh, looking for today. How many more jurors do they go through? We heard the judge yesterday say that there were 500 prospective jurors waiting to come in and be questioned. So we'll see uh, how many they get through today. Exactly. How many jurors, how many more days uh, will it take to get there? Brian, this is a historic trial. It's the first time in history that a former president has been tried on criminal charges. Put that into perspective for us. What should we be watching out for today specifically? We should be watching out for how the judicial system attempts to treat an on average person average. There are a lot of things that have to be different because it's a former president that have to be different because he's the presumptive nominee for the Republican Party. But we want to ensure that our laws are applied equally to all. I think that this case in all cases that involved any individual, president or otherwise, is a test to make sure that we are all equal under the law. And I think that's the, the, the main important thing here. But going forward, I think what's really important and what's really kind of shocked me actually in Donald 
Donald Trump's last appearance, uh, kind of at the makeshift podium, speaking out, he said, this was a legal expense, that this is what you're supposed to do. It almost sounded like someone might have given him the wrong impression as to what a legal expense can cover. And I'm really interested to see, one, whether the prosecution tries to use what he just said there against him as some form of admission of guilt, and two, how the defense is going to try to say, no, it, it is a legal expense, and this is why, and if it amounts to an actual defense. And, and Catherine, uh, we were speaking about this yesterday. Uh, several of Trump's loyal aides uh, may be taking the stand. We also are expecting some of Trump's own family uh, to be called as witnesses in the trial, as well as his inner circle. So what can we expect from that? Right. The judge yesterday listed a number of potential witnesses, including uh, members of Trump, Trump's family, his children. Uh, look, we've also reported that some of his most loyal aides, as you've mentioned, uh, could be called by prosecutors to testify here. Now, those are loyal aides that we've reported in the White House and in the Trump Organization, specifically at the Trump Organization, his longtime uh, assistant, Ronna Graff. She was there for really everything. While she might not have been involved in big decision making, uh, she definitely was sitting on the sidelines and observing what was going on uh, in meetings, controlling the paper, if you will. So she does have a great deal of knowledge into uh, what potentially transpired here. So obviously, this isn't going to happen anytime soon. We're still in the jury selection phase. Let's see how long that ultimately lasts here. But at least that is what we could expect down the line uh, from prosecutors when they start calling witnesses as they present their case. Exactly. And let's see how the day plays out. Catherine Falders and Brian Buckmeyer, thank you both so much. We will be following this story all day long and bring you the latest right here on ABC News Live. The Israeli War Cabinet is meeting today for a third day in a row. Members are still considering what Israel's response will be to Iran's unprecedented attack as the IDF vows to retaliate. This comes as the Biden administration and other world leaders urge Israel to show restraint. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman has the latest from Israel. The Middle East on edge with Iran vowing a massive response to the slightest action from Israel as Israel vows to retaliate for that rain of missiles. Iran will face the consequences for its actions. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu convening his war cabinet for the third consecutive day to discuss a response to that unprecedented barrage of more than 300 missiles and drones early Sunday. We saw a response multi-layered, multinational against that would-be ring of fire that Iran intended on enduring and putting on Israel. We stopped that the coordinated response from a U.S.-led coalition, including Britain and France, fording the attack. The IDF saying 99% of those incoming threats intercepted. An Israeli official telling ABC News Iran actually increased the number of ballistic missiles it would fire once it learned of the scope of the U.S.-led coalition against it. They knew that many were going to be defeated, but the aim was to get as many of them through Israel's defenses as possible. And for the 12 minutes it took for those missiles to arc from Iran to Israel, American and Israeli officials unsure if their missile net would hold. It did. A senior Israeli Air Force official telling ABC News multiple Middle Eastern countries provided Israel with an early warning. And Israel's Arrow aerial defense system taking down ballistic missiles seen streaming over Jerusalem. The IDF saying this new video shows Israeli troops pulling one of those bus-sized ballistic missiles out of the Dead Sea. President Biden saying the U.S. is committed to the safety of troops in the region and to Israel's security, but the administration making it clear that the U.S. will not participate in any Israeli counterstrike. Iran says its attack avenged Israel's strike earlier this month that killed two top generals at a consulate complex in Syria. And this is one of the 130 ballistic missiles that Iran launched against Israel. And you can see that this 40 long section, this is just the fuel tank. The engine would have been on the other side, the warhead over there. And Israeli officials tell me that if one of these had actually hit a population center, it could have taken out a building, killing dozens of people. And that might have set off a regional war. Now, I'm told that the most likely Israeli retribution will be a cyber attack or uh, the killing of an Iranian official somewhere in the world. I'm told that a key consideration for Israel is preserving this uh, defensive coalition built by the U.S. to defend Israel. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman there in Israel for us. Let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang uh, to discuss this. Selena, Israeli defense forces are now vowing, of course, to retaliate as Israel's war cabinet considers its response. How is the White House responding?
Yeah, Stephanie, look, the White House is bracing for some kind of response, and they're making clear that Israel's decision is their own. But I am told that the president is urging restraint. We know that the president and Netanyahu had a phone call after that Iranian attack, and a senior administration official described their conversation to me like this, that the president said, look, I understand that Israel feels the need to respond in some way to show strength and to establish that deterrence, but the president, I'm told, told Netanyahu that you've already come out of this exchange looking strong. By taking out nearly all of those missiles and drones, Israel already, quote, looks untouchable is how the official described the exchange so, to me. But look, the White House also making clear that the U.S., they're willing to help defend Israel, but they're not going to participate in any kind of offensive. The White House on the record meaning, remaining very tight-lipped about whether or not they expect Israel to give them any sort of heads up before they make the retaliatory move. But they are making clear that they're in close contact with their Israeli counterparts. We'll see if their position shifts at all. Uh, Selena, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen uh, says the U.S. will not hesitate to issue new sanctions on Iran following its attack on Israel. What kind of impact could these new sanctions have on Iran, and could it realistically make a difference? Yeah, well, Stephanie, that actually comes just right after the G7 leaders meeting with President Biden, where they discussed working together in a coordinated way on economic sanctions. And clearly, the administration is trying to show they are willing to use economic power to disrupt Iran. And it also sends a message to Israel that there are other ways to hit back and retaliate at Iran that are not using military force and military action. But look, experts say that the options for sanctioning Iran are limited because there are already so many sanctions on Iran, but some options include imposing additional sanctions on some officials or businesses or going after Iran's oil revenues, but that runs the risk of raising gas prices, which, Stephanie, as you know, is not what the administration wants right now. So that's why some experts are saying that any sanctions that are put on Iran may be mostly symbolic. Senior White House correspondent Selena Wang for us at the White House. Thank you so much. And that attack by Iran has Congress scrambling to pass aid for Israel and possibly for Ukraine. Now House Speaker Mike Johnson says he'll break up the votes and bring four separate measures to the floor that include aid for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. Meanwhile, the House moved to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas over his handling of the southern border. ABC's Jay O'Brien is on Capitol Hill with the latest Jay, good to have you. House Speaker Mike Johnson unveiled his plan, and it's it's pretty complicated, it seems. So break this down for us. What are these four measures that he's planning to bring to the floor? Yeah, and it's an ambitious plan, Stephanie, as you note. Four separate pieces of legislation that sources now tell us Johnson just moments ago in another meeting with House Republicans pitched as one cohesive fact, uh, a package. And there's a problem with that. I'll get to that in a second. But it's four separate issues, aid for Ukraine, aid for Israel, aid for Taiwan, and then a fourth that is a grab bag piece of legislation of conservative priorities, which includes a ban on TikTok as well as seizing Russian assets. Potentially aid for Gaza could be in there as well as maybe a loan for Ukraine as Trump has floated before. So that fourth package is what makes this so complicated because if Johnson gets his wish and puts this all together, maybe four separate votes, but one package that the Senate has to take up as one item, that fourth thing, those conservative priorities might make this a tough vote for Senate Democrats to stomach and potentially doom passage of this in the Senate. If it even gets out of the House, and that's an open question, too, because we've seen already this morning some Republicans, the hardliners, start to revolt against this proposal from Johnson. And Johnson, of course, facing a razor-thin majority in the House right now. Jay, the impeachment proceedings against DHS Security uh, Alejandro Mayorkas, uh, the Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, uh, those are heading to the next stage in the Senate today. So what can we expect to happen? Well, the, the articles of impeachment will be walked over to the Senate this afternoon. You'll see that on camera. It's similar to the Trump impeachments. It is a formal procession of those articles. Then that kicks off the ball finally in the Senate's court to begin this trial. We've heard from Senate Democrats who say they want to make quick work of this and Democrats control that chamber. So uh, the thought process is that they can either dismiss these articles pretty quickly once they eventually reach the Senate floor or they can try to have a trial but do it in an expedited way that's either a quick trial on the Senate floor or referred to a committee. But Democrats are again signaling they're going to make very quick work of these impeachment articles, Stephanie.
Jay, thanks for breaking it down for us. Appreciate you. Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thanks. Coming up, a severe weather threat is on the move. Where tornado watches are under effect right now. That's coming up. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back. Millions of Americans are bracing for another round of severe weather. In the last 24 hours, more than 90 reports of severe storms came in from South Dakota to Virginia. ABC's meteorologist Samara Theodore is tracking it all for us. Hey there, Samara. Good morning, Steph. That's right. So severe weather season is well underway. We're getting thrown into the action this morning. So we've already seen at least one tornado reported on the border of Kansas and Nebraska. Here we go. Uh, well, we did have a tornado watch in effect for this region. It looks like it was just dropped. Nonetheless, we still have very strong storms sweeping through Kansas City into Omaha and Des Moines. Here's what happens next. I'm fast forwarding through time. This is 9 p.m. tonight. You can see where the greatest tornado threat is going to be, or really where the line of storms is sweeping all the way down into uh, Illinois there. And here it is. Highest tornado threat through this afternoon and evening will be in Des Moines, northern Missouri, just outside of Peoria in western Illinois. So keep that in mind if you have any plans. And we could see a few tornadoes from Little Rock to Springfield and St. Louis. It's just that the highest threat is going to be in that orange zone there where we have that enhanced risk. So after that, this line of storms then sweeps farther east. This is tomorrow at 8 p.m. This is where we have the greatest threat for uh, active weather, maybe even a few tornadoes in parts of the Great Lakes, stretching from Detroit all the way down to Cincinnati and Evansville. Stephanie? All right, getting ready for that rain headed our way. Thank you so much, Samara. Coming up, pet octopus turns octomom. How one family's pet octopus turns their lives upside down. That's coming up. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. I got it. GMA3.
what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. To me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Reporting from Harvard University, I'm Selena Wang. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. More and more women are embracing the joys of aging as they enter their 50s and beyond. ABC News lifestyle contributor Lori Bergamotto spoke to some pretty amazing women who are doing just that. This segment is sponsored by QVC and features women teaming up to celebrate the wisdom, unity, and power that comes with aging while dispelling stereotypes. Take a look. Three different women coming together for one mission. We think that we can't do anything after 50. That's a lie. American icon and R&B legend, Patti LaBelle. Oh! Actress, Jenny Garth. I've made my choice and I choose me. And QVC host, Rachel Bosing. You get first look at items. All spokeswomen for our sponsor, QVC, whose new campaign aims to help women embrace a unique time in their lives. QVC's Age of Possibility is about a community of women who are 50 plus, who are living their lives unapologetically and authentically and are clearly dispelling outdated stereotypes. A woman who's 50 plus is not sitting at home by herself, feeling like it's all downhill from here. She's beautiful and powerful. To help amplify their message, QVC assembled a collective of women who are stepping into their power. What is the quintessential 50? It's a group of 50 women who are frankly reflecting what 50 plus looks like in a magical and magnificent way. We're willing to hold your hand as you march into this new phase of your life. With an 80th birthday just around the corner, Ms. Patti LaBelle is not afraid to take big risks. You really leaned into trying so many new things, launching the dessert line, dancing with the stars. For a lot of people, after 50 days slow down, you sped up. I never stopped working and never stopped cooking and never stopped singing. There's no limit to what I think I can do. 52-year-old Jenny Garth says this campaign brings women together to make meaningful connections. You get a little sassier when you're 50. You want to be heard, you want to have a voice. A lot of QVC's audience is over 50, so it's important to speak right to them, and it's important to inspire them and motivate them. What would you say to the woman who is about to turn 50 and maybe she's a little bit nervous about it. We're about to spill the tea on everything. So we don't feel here that you have to be part of the club to understand what's going on in the club. We're gonna actually give you that soft runway. There's one thing they all want you to know. Don't underestimate them. Your fears. Take that message and believe it. Society has really put women over 50 into a certain category, sort of that we are done. We're not done. 50 is the new 30 to me. Thanks to our sponsor, QVC, and thank you to the amazing women for empowering us to embrace a unique time in our lives. Stephanie? Thanks so much, Lori. Great to see. Now to the story that's really getting some legs on social media. It is about a dad, a son, and their pet octopus. Becky Worley has those details. 
Nine-year-old Cal Clifford of Edmond, Oklahoma, has a fascination with all things octopus. I've just loved them since I was two because they're the closest things to aliens. This obsession got legs when Dad Cameron bought a tank and promised they could actually get one. We're going to build an octopus tank? Thank you so much. <laughs> And the arrival of a mail-order California two-spot octopus in a plastic bag was Cal's dream come true. They named him Terrence. But then Terrence outgrew his tank. And then the Cliffords learned keeping an octopus tank was really hard. The electrical issue was a little bit scary, and that was kind of a, a wake-up call. The reverse osmosis filter, although properly installed, had a leak. And so finding out that our kitchen island and floors needed to be ripped out. That was a little bit inconvenient. And then Terrence the octopus became an octo mom. We kind of estimated there were about between 40 and 70 eggs, but every one that hatched that I saw, I was able to catch and contain. And, I, and it was exactly 50. Terrence was renamed Terry and the family assumed the eggs were unfertilized, but nope, one by one, they hatched. Each baby got a name. Seance was like this like hippie octopus. And then Swim Shady, he, he's just like tentacles in the air. My wife named that one JC. So I think Bill Nye the octopi is the most recent. <laughs> Hi, buddy. When the babies started hatching faster than I could kind of catch them, I had to move a lot of them into the bathroom in these small containers because they would eat each other if they were put in the same container. The makeshift incubators took over bathrooms and countertops that the Cliffords dubbed Clamsterdam. Realizing this was untenable for the long term, a local reptile buff stepped in to help house the babies temporarily. The moral of the story? No, don't. <laughs> Scientists don't recommend it. But would they have done anything different? Nothing, really. I think he nailed it. What we do for our kids, right? The Clifford's TikToks about this situation are hilarious. As one commenter said, I came for the octopus saga, but I stayed for the dad jokes. Uh, the family says they're trying to get these little critters adopted by educational institutions and aquariums, that they've turned down offers to sell them to individuals. And as for that plural issue on octopus, I reached out to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and they say the preferred term is octopuses. There you go. Stephanie? <laughs> Thanks so much, Becky. I love that story. What a great story. And that family, they're really great with names. Seance has to be my favorite. All right, thank you so much for streaming with us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operation center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Jury selection has resumed in the historic criminal trial of former President Trump. Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. The district attorney's office has now formally filed a request to hold Trump in contempt over a series of recent social media posts, including what he said about witnesses, Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels. ABC News investigative reporter Reporter, reporter Olivia Rubin uh, will join us here shortly along with ABC News senior reporter Catherine Folders and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer. We want to start with Catherine. Prosecutors say, Catherine, that Trump's violations of this limited gag order were knowing and willful, calling it a deliberate strategy to impede the trial. How significant is this formal request to hold Trump in contempt? Well, it's significant, and of course, we saw this formal request coming uh, yesterday when prosecutors said that they intended uh, to do this, and of course, there will be a hearing that the judge scheduled in order to consider this, but this specifically focuses on this contempt request, focuses on three social media posts uh, that Trump posted on his social media website, True Social. Prosecutors want a $1,000 fine for each one. I think what's significant here is this doesn't have to do with his words, it has to do with his posts on social media, but... There is a camera right there in the hallway. So the question is, does he potentially violate the gag order again? He resisted going to that camera, at least throughout the day while the proceedings were ongoing. Yesterday, he resisted. Uh, does that continue? We know that his lawyers are wary of him speaking. They are wary uh, that he will violate the gag order. They don't want that to happen, especially as it relates to prospective jurors. But as you know, there are competing factors talking to Trump. Some people want him to talk more. So the question is, is this uh, the only only potential violation. How does this play out uh, through the trial while this gag order is in place? We'll just have to see. Absolutely. That is a good question. How will this all play out? And we saw the former president there uh, talking to cameras and reporters, mentioning the judge, but no one else specifically. We'll see how that plays out. Brian, Trump is defending the way the payments at the center of this trial were made, saying he was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense. He was adamant about that when just a uh, few moments ago when, when he uh, spoke to reporters. What do you make of that? It seems like he was given some form of legal advice or some information that you can basically mark anything down as a legal expense. Uh, I've never seen paying off a sex worker to not spread a story as a category of legal expense, but that's not the world in which I exist in. Uh, I think the issue is going to be is whether or not he proverbially um, dotted those I's and crossed those T's and how he described them in his filings as well as the reimbursement. He may have been giving a certain amount of information and maybe someone else took that information and went tenfold in the, in the other direction. I think ultimately it's going to be what he knowingly did and what the people around him did. But that comment that he made this morning, I do not think it helps his defense. And let's check in with Olivia Rubin, who is outside of the court uh, there in Lower Manhattan. Olivia, it is the second day of this trial. The jury selection process continues. What is the latest there? 
Well, they are continuing the process they did yesterday, which is just ticking through the jurors one by one by one and having each of them stand up in that room with former President Donald Trump and answer the questionnaire. And what we saw yesterday was a ton of jurors just sort of taking themselves out of the game, saying, hey, I can't do this. But I think what's so interesting, Stephanie, is um, something we just heard from one of the jurors. A lot of people are probably thinking, including former President Donald Trump, that because we're in New York, a lot of these residents probably probably have a Democrat bias because we're in a heavily Democratic state and probably do not like former President Donald Trump. But we just heard from one juror who is a man who works in the accounting world. He's originally from Texas and lives here now who actually spoke about having a potential Republican bias. I want to read you this quote from him. He said that in the accounting world, a lot of people tend to intellectually slant Republicans so I could have some unconscious bias. He said his background from Texas could also uh, feed into that that, saying he wasn't sure, and the judge pressed him on that, saying we need an unequivocal answer if you are able to decide this fair and impartially, and he said it's probably going to be tough for me to be impartial, and he was removed based on the consent from both parties. So it gives you sort of a window into how there could be bias on all sides of the aisle here, and that is what Donald Trump's team are grappling with, what the DA's team are grappling with, because that is not a juror that the DA's team would have wanted to wind up on that jury there. So every single juror very significant and we're seeing sort of issues on all spectrums of the uh, political ideology. Certainly a difficult process. Catherine, we know that Trump is complaining that this trial will keep him from campaigning like he should be out on the campaign trail, but these court appearances are kind of now intertwined into his campaign strategy. How could that affect the election cycle, if at all? Well, look, we know that he will still be out on the road during the weekends, but he's certainly bringing his campaign uh, to the courtroom. As you said, they're becoming uh, one in the same. This trial certainly uh, taking center stage in the 2024 presidential election. Uh, that will continue. And this really isn't new. Of course, he's saying that it's taking him off of the campaign trail and he won't be able to campaign. That is true. He does have to be there in court every single day during this trial, but he has in the past chosen to show up when he doesn't have to. He understands and he believes that being in the courtroom is politically advantageous uh, to his campaign prospects. So he will continue to say that. Obviously, he needs to be there. But at the end of the day, I think he is turning the campaign and his legal troubles into essentially the same thing. Yeah. And, and Brian, what are you watching for as jury selection resumes? Uh, and, and, and what are the next steps once the jury is finally seated, whether it is this week or next week? What I'm looking for is what the judge is going to do in terms of changing his posture for allowing people to kind of self-select and say, I can't uh, be a juror. How much pressure he's going to start putting on those jurors to say, are you sure? Are you really sure you can't sit here? Because that was happened in all criminal trials across uh, at least the, the, the five boroughs that I've seen, where a judge would say, OK, I get it. You, you can't be uh, impartial here. At least you believe that. But are you sure? What if I read you the rules? What, would you follow my instructions? And oftentimes, you see people really wanting um, to, to look positively in front of a judge and say, you know what, judge, I thought this at first, but after a few words with you, I believe I can be impartial. I want to see how heavily the judge will start to lean in that direction, because ultimately, we are going to need a jury at some point in time. And after a jury is selected, we'll move right into opening statements, where the defense will give their opportunity to, to speak about what they believe this case is about, and so will the prosecution. And and we kind of know what the prosecution is arguing here from their filings. I really want to know what the defense here is for Donald Trump as to why these legal expenses, as he told us earlier, were not illegal. Hmm. So much to look out for. Olivia Rubin, Catherine Folgers, and Brian Buckmeyer, thank you all so much for joining us. We will be following the story all day long and bring you the latest right here on ABC News Live. In other news, rust armorer Hannah Gutierrez has been sentenced to 18 months in prison for the fatal onset shooting of Helena Hutchins. This comes after Gutierrez begged the judge not to send her to prison. ABC's Mola Lenghi is in Santa Fe, New Mexico with more. The armorer tasked with keeping weapons safe on the set of Rust, waking up behind bars for the fatal shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. The state has approached this prosecution um, from a standpoint of compassion for Ms. Gutierrez, for her age, for her lack of experience. My compassion came to an end. 
The judge handing down the maximum prison sentence to Hannah Gutierrez, 18 months, along with an emphatic admonishment. You alone turned a safe weapon into a lethal weapon. Ahead of learning her fate, Gutierrez addressing the Santa Fe courtroom for the very first time. My heart goes out to the film industry for the devastating pain that this tragedy caused. And Begging for a chance at redemption. Open. The jury has found me in part at fault for this god-awful tragedy, but that doesn't make me a monster. That makes me human. I'm the armor. Gutierrez's defense team tried to paint her as the scapegoat for producers, including Alec Baldwin, who was holding the revolver when it went off, fatally striking Hutchins and injuring director Joel Souza. Something that you guys had, had mentioned throughout the course of this trial is that she has been a scapegoat in this. Do you she feel was a scapegoat. The, um, you look at her role and what the other people's role was. You look at the producers. Several people talk about producers today and what they did and how the rushed environment they created, the safety problems. And then you look at throwing all of it on one person. Gutierrez's attorney speaking exclusively with ABC News. Mr. Baldwin might face a uh, sentence like Ms. Gutierrez did today, the full 18 months. So, yeah, you'd have to be very nervous. He's got very good attorneys, and I know they're working hard on it, but I think he's got to be nervous at this point. Well, Hannah Gutierrez's attorney telling me they intend to appeal. In the meantime, all eyes are on Alec Baldwin's upcoming criminal trial. That is scheduled for July. He has pleaded not guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Stephanie. Thank you very much, Mola. Let's bring in ABC News legal contributor and managing partner at the Cochrane firm, Shauna Lloyd, for more on this. Uh, good to have you, Shauna. Uh, in in Mola's exclusive with defense with a defense attorney, he says Gutierrez was a scapegoat in this and said the environment played a role. Will that have an impact on future trials? It absolutely can because what we are talking about are systematic failures. So anyone that is responsible for those can be held accountable for that systematic failure. She obviously as the armorer had the primary duty, but there are others in the chain of command that had some failings here on this set. And Alec Baldwin, he will be on trial for involuntary manslaughter in July. What are you watching out for with that, with that trial? What we're really looking for with that trial, Stephanie, is to see how the defense adjusts to the information that they have at hand. They've seen this trial play out. They understand what the jury took issue with. So they're going to use that to their advantage so that way they can craft his defense. They're going to lean very heavily on the fact that he was not in charge of putting the bullets in the gun, that Hannah Gutierrez was, and they're going to lean into that for his defense. Okay, and, and so his trial is in July. Uh, what happens next? Is that the next, the next event in all of this, or is there uh, some, something else that comes up before then? Well, we're definitely going to see an appeal. We won't see it play out before uh, Alec Baldwin's trial, but there'll definitely be an appeal from Hannah Gutierrez's defense team. They're already signaling that that's to be expected. So we're going to see her appeal play out. The next thing will be Alec Baldwin's trial, which we will see his defense and the state come after him for that involuntary manslaughter. And we will see the verdict on that likely before we get any information on Hannah's appeal. All right, Shauna, thank you so much. Shauna Lloyd for us there. Appreciate your time. Coming up, fighting childhood cancer, what researchers in Florida are calling a possible new important breakthrough. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? Appreciate <laughs> you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 
25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back. Cancer researchers at Florida International University say they have developed a potentially groundbreaking treatment that shows promise for hard to treat cancers. 83% of children who'd had a relapse of cancer reportedly showed improvement. And that includes Logan Jenner, who has been battling cancer since he was just three years old. ABC's Victor Okendo has this story. How would you describe your son, Logan? I would describe Logan as a miracle. This is home. At just three years old, Logan Jenner was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia, an aggressive cancer of the blood and bone marrow. Logan went through four rounds of chemotherapy, followed by a bone marrow transplant before going into remission. Yeah. For the first year, he was doing really well. And then unfortunately, in February of the next year, we found out that he had relapsed. According to the American Cancer Society, Cancer is the second leading cause of death in children under 15. Were you afraid that cancer was going to take his life this time around? Yes, I was. It really shook my faith a lot. No! Logan's oncologist told the Jenners about a clinical trial at Florida International University. We are the first to guide individualized treatments in children that have hard-to-treat cancers. Functional drug testing in simple terms is testing of hundreds of FDA-approved drugs directly on the patient's own living cancer cells in the lab and identifying which drugs work and which don't for each individual patient. So you're finding exactly which drugs work on which specific patient? Exactly. And we are showing that we can identify treatments or which combinations of drugs work and which don't and give results back to the doctors within a week. Turning around results to doctors quickly is very important and critical when we're dealing with children with cancers that have very progressive diseases or cancers that get worse day by day. Let me just put my gloves on. Dr. Razam and her team of researchers look at cancer cells for a number of patients to guide treatment as a part of the trial. Logan was simply known as patient 13. So what did you discover worked in patient number 13's cancer sample? One important one that we found was that two drug combinations were as effective as three drugs. And so his doctor could eliminate one of these drugs from his treatment. The other important result from the testing was we identified which drug that is targeted to his mutation. And the third interesting observation that was important information for his treatment was that his cancer cells in the lab doubled with steroids. Logan's oncologist, Dr. Fader, applied Dr. Razam's analysis of which FDA-approved drug regimen would best target Logan's cancer cells to create a personalized treatment for him, and he went into remission. How much faster did this treatment work? Instead of four cycles, he needed two, which is good, especially considering it was a relapse case. I think it was about 35 days he goes into remission. And it's not only the fact that he went into remission, right, which is a miracle all on its own. It saved him so much time from being in the hospital. It's, it saved him, you know, just having to take all these other medications that he didn't need. How did Dr. Razam's work help Logan's fight against cancer? Dr. Razam's fight made him thrive when there was no hope, really, when Almost all hope was lost. While this study was just on a small sample of patients and this type of treatment is not yet widely available, 
Dr. Azam is continuing her research in the hopes to help others. I hope and I believe that using this approach that the day will come where we can transform cancer into a chronic treatable disease, just like diabetes. Two years later, Logan is now eight years old and healthy. I tell her this all the time I share Logan with her. You know, I really do. He's my son and I brought him into this world that she saved him. Her and Dr. Fader saved him. I kick cancer's butt. <laughs> How adorable. So happy to see Logan doing much better. That is incredible progress. Our thanks to FIU, the researchers there, and Victor Okendo as well. Now to an ABC News investigation into the Los Angeles County Probation Department. It's supposed to protect and rehabilitate vulnerable youth, but is having some trouble of itself. A months-long reporting uh, from ABC News' live anchor, Lindsay Davis, looks at more than 2,500 claims of abuse at the hands of probation officers, in some cases including sexual abuse, inside their very own facilities. Dominique Anderson is one plaintiff among thousands who alleges in a lawsuit that L.A. County probation officers abused her. You're not old enough to consent. And that's the tough thing about being a victim. You never see it that this person is abusing their authority. You don't see it as them preying on you as being a child. You see it as this is a man of power. This is a man of affluence. This is an educated man. He's, a, he's not a probation officer. He's a supervisor. Dominique says after she reported being sexually abused by one of her probation officers, she was then approached by a female staff member asking her not to blow the whistle. She said, he has a daughter, he has a career, he has a lot to lose. What did you lose? I think I lost my innocence, my self-esteem. There's a, a, a saying that, that loosely translated in English is, who will guard the guards? And I'm wondering if you feel that anybody was. No. And it's hard. It's hard when it's this pervasive, because everybody's dirty. Some of the accused probation officers have retired and are still being paid their pensions. Their attorneys and L.A. County deny all of those allegations. You can watch the full report tonight on ABC News Live Prime, beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern, right here on ABC News Live. Coming up, the women taking the WNBA by storm. Caitlin Clark, Camila Cardoso, and Angel Reese, they are trending this morning. A look at where they're headed and why Indiana fans were sent into a frenzy. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies, play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. They purchased that gun for him and bragged about it. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Caitlin Clark was officially drafted by the Indiana Fever as the number one pick in the WNBA. This comes on the heels of a game-changing March Madness that had everyone buzzing about the WNBA draft. ABC's Lara Spencer has all the big moments from last night. With the first pick in the 2024 WNBA draft, the Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. Excitement hitting a fever pitch as basketball superstar Caitlin Clark officially launches her WNBA career. I've dreamed of this moment since I was in second grade, and it's taken a lot of hard work, a lot of ups and downs, but uh, more than anything, just trying to soak it in. The NCAA leading scorer and overall number one draft pick chosen by the Indiana Fever basking in the moment with her family. I told my mom before this, is like, you know, I earned it, and that's why I'm so proud of it. Thousands of fans from her new team erupting in celebration. Her new teammates ready with Clark's jersey in hand. Clark, one of several superstars taking their talents to the WNBA this year. Cameron Brink, Stanford University. After an electric season, number two overall pick Cameron Brink heading to the Los Angeles Sparks. Her godparents are the parents of NBA superstar Steph Curry. The two have known each other since they were kids. So I actually FaceTimed Steph like five minutes before the, the show started. So he just said to, to just have fun with it. I think he can just share so much great advice. And Chi-Town doubling up on star power. Camilla Cardosa. Angel Reese, LSU. Third pick, Camila Cardozo, and seventh pick, Angel Reese, former SEC rivals, now teammates for the Chicago Sky. I had a goal to be here tonight and give my family a better life. So I'm just so thankful that I was able to be here. <laughs> I'm just so excited. I get to play with Camila. And for the first time in more than 25 years, two Hawkeyes drafted in the same year. Clark's Iowa teammate Kate Martin, a surprise pick in the second round, heading to the Las Vegas Aces. I was here to support Caitlin. All I wanted was an opportunity, and I got it, so I'm really excited. Our thanks to Lara Spencer for that wrap-up, and congratulations to all the women that were selected last night. Thank you for streaming with us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you. David, good to meet you. 
Ismail. David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. You every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Reporting from the auto workers picket lines in Michigan, I'm Faith Abube. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Thanks for joining us on ABC News Live. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Jury selection has resumed in the historic criminal trial of former President Trump. Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. The district attorney's office has now formally filed a request to hold Trump in contempt over a series of recent social media posts, including what he said about witnesses, Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels. ABC News investigative reporter Olivia Rubin joins me now from right outside the court, along with ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer. For more, Olivia, I want to start with you. We saw Trump this morning speaking to cameras and, and in talking about this process. This is the second day of the jury selection process. What's the latest from the court? Well, what we heard from Donald Trump this morning, uh, Stephanie, was actually a little bit more substantive than just the usual, it's a sham, it's a witch hunt, there shouldn't be trial, I should be out on the campaign trail. And what Donald Trump actually did was get into the substance of his payments to Michael Cohen. And what he said this morning was that they were properly logged. He's saying they were legal payments, and it was correct when my accountants logged it as such. And remember, the crux of the DA's case here is that Donald Trump payments were not for legal expenses for Michael Cohen. They were hush money payments to Stormy Daniels to silence her affair claims. And that is why he says that Donald Trump falsified his business records, that the uh, illegal expense column was a lie. So now you have Donald Trump on the record on camera defending that payment. So it's significant and we will see if they stick to that as the case moves forward. But as you said, first, it is about seating a jury. And we are now almost at the lunch break of day two and still not a single juror has been seated. There have been dismissals for bias. There have been dismissals for scheduling issues. Another two people were just dismissed from the jury for potential scheduling issues. So on and on they go. Still getting through the first wave of 96 jurors who came through the courtroom yesterday, still questioning the ones who remain one by one, Stephanie. Surely expected to take uh, uh, quite a bit of time. Brian, let's talk about the gag order. Prosecutors say Trump's violations of this limited gag order were knowing and willful, calling it a deliberate strategy to impede the trial. Of course, they're referring to those social media posts. How serious is that accusation and, and what are the next steps? In terms of seriousness, Stephanie, it's as serious as a potential of one year in jail and up to a fine of $1,000. Now, would anyone putting aside a former president actually get a year in prison uh, for this type of charge? Probably not. And I would say like with 99% assurity, no one's going to go to prison for that, especially Donald Trump. But the threat is there, and that's how serious it is. Uh, the judge will likely entertain an argument for a fine. But I think what more likely than not could happen is this will be a serious and rude awakening for Donald Trump to understand that this is the beginning of the trial and that these types of comments, whether it be on social media, Media, in the court or in the courthouse um, halls, as you see him speak, uh, will be taken seriously. And I could see uh, Judge Mershon giving him a bit of a, a pass now, saying, you know what, you're warned. I'm putting you on notice. This is serious. But future incidences will be met with a fine. The question for me is, if a warning doesn't work, if a fine doesn't work, what could the possible next steps be if former President Donald Trump continues to make these uh, violations of the limited gag order?
And uh, Olivia, I want to go back to you. What's it like in court? What is the kind of the just the ambiance there? We know that yesterday there were a couple of groups outside of the court, those that were uh, supporters of the former president, those who were against. What is the scene like there at the courthouse? It's night and day from yesterday to today, Stephanie. There's essentially no one around supporters, protesters. How it works is the courtroom is right behind me. You can see it. And there's a park where protesters or supporters or demonstrators gather in support or against Donald Trump. And there's no one in the park today. I wouldn't say there were a lot of people yesterday, but certainly more than we've seen in recent months as sort of the newness of Donald Trump's court appearance died down every single time. We saw fewer and fewer and fewer supporters. But they were back again yesterday. Today, a very different scene. It is a little sleepier, a little, um, you know, more uh, low key outside of the courthouse, which I will say mimics the way that it is inside. Jury selection is a very slow and laborious process going through these jurors one by one by one. And it you can sort of feel the heaviness of the legal system as it is being done. It is not, you know, sparks flying amongst lawyers. It's not heated testimony. It is slow, it is quiet, and it is a sleepy process. And you can sort of feel that from a lot of people inside of the courtroom. Likely to ramp up in the weeks ahead. Olivia Rubin and Brian Buckmeyer, thank you both so much. We will be following this story all day long and bring you the very latest right here on ABC News Live. In other news, the Israeli War Cabinet is meeting today for a third day in a row. Members are still considering what Israel's response will be to Iran's unprecedented attack as the IDF vows to retaliate. This comes as the Biden administration and other world leaders urge Israel to show restraint. Foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge joins me now from Tel Aviv, Israel. For more on this, Tom, thank you so much. Uh, Tom, Israeli Defense Forces are vowing to retaliate, but Israel's war cabinet is still considering its response. What more do you know about what's been discussed so far? Yeah, we still have no clear indication, Stephanie, of what the Israeli government's response will be. But we've been speaking to former high-ranking Israeli military officers. and. They're saying that one of them I've just spoken to is saying that, look, option number one is for the Israeli government to do nothing in the near term. She says, look, there isn't a kind of handbook of when is the right time to respond. And the other former major general in the Israeli military, I mean, his assessment is that Israel should not directly strike Iran. Uh, he says, look, actually, what Israel should do is go after Iran's proxies, namely Hezbollah in Lebanon, and deal with that problem up on the northern border. You've got tens of thousands of Israelis up in the settlements there who have been evacuated ever since early October. And both of those former high-ranking Israeli military officers are saying to us, look, one point they really want to underline is that the attack on Sunday is not the first time Iran has attacked Israel uh, since October the 7th. Is Iran has been attacking via its proxies on, on, on a near constant basis uh, during that period and, and Israel has been striking back at Iran's proxies. What changed on Sunday of course is it's the first time that Iran went away from that kind of shadow war and hit Israeli territory directly and that is why the Israeli government is now facing this crucial decision and a dilemma if you like of what is the, the right and appropriate response to that attack. Absolutely. And Tom, the U.S. says it won't get involved in any offensive action. So is that something the Israeli military needs to consider or will consider? It is a factor, of course, if Israel is willing to strike militarily directly against Iran. But that's a big if right now. We, we just don't know which of the options Israel is willing to take, the Israeli government. I mean, look, the options on potentially on the table that these former Israeli high-ranking military officers have been talking to us about are, you know, you could, uh, one of them said to me, you can strike Iran covertly. You know, you could launch a cyber attack against Iran. Uh, there are other, that the major, other options that the Major General wouldn't even discuss with me off camera. They're highly sensitive. Other options that the Israeli government military would have. And then, of course, there's that other side to things is what Israel can do against Iran's proxies in the region. And look, you know, it, the, the message from Israeli officials is that this is an opportunity that these, these former military officials is that this is an opportunity for Israel to broaden that coalition or to work with that coalition to listen to the US and to deal with some of the other problems in the region, namely Iran's proxies. Foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burge for us in Tel Aviv. Tom, thank you very much.
Moving on to Capitol Hill now, the attack by Iran has Congress scrambling to pass aid for Israel and possibly for possibly for Ukraine. Johnson says, the House Speaker Johnson says he'll break up the votes and bring four separate measures to the floor that include aid for Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan. But is this enough to satisfy all wings of the Republican Party? ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now from Capitol Hill to break it all down for us. And Jay, let's talk about these four measures. Why are some Republicans already coming out against it? And could this threaten Johnson's future? And four separate measures, as you just said, Stephanie. The last of the four is a grab bag of conservative priorities, including a TikTok ban and seizing Russian assets. But it's that Ukraine funding, that long stalled military assistance for Ukraine, that hardline House Republicans are balking at. Marjorie Taylor Greene has said she's going to increase her efforts to oust Johnson from the Speaker's chair in what's called a motion to vacate. She picked up another ally today, Thomas Massey, who said to Johnson behind closed doors, sources tell us, that he should resign because of this proposal. So our Rachel Scott just asked him moments ago in a press conference, A, will you resign? And what is your response to those Republicans who are not happy with what you have crafted here, what you're going to try to get passed? Here's what Johnson said. Uh, I am not resigning. And it is, uh, it is, in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion. And we are simply here trying to do our jobs. Um, it is not helpful to the cause. It is not helpful to the country. It has not helped the House Republicans advance our agenda, which is in the best interest of the American people here, a secure border, uh, sound governance. Uh, and it's not helpful to the unity that we have in, in the body. Now, Marjorie Taylor Greene has said her efforts to oust Johnson are picking up support, but she hasn't filed them in any kind of a way yet that would guarantee they get a vote on the House floor, but certainly this proposed legislative package is pitting Johnson directly against the hardliners in his party. Stephanie. And Jay, sources also say Speaker Johnson did not fully lay out the details of this plan for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan to uh, Trump when he met the former president at Mar-a-Lago. So the former president did not endorse the idea. What kind of impact could this have on his speakership? Well, the sense we're getting from the former president's camp is that he's waiting to see exactly what is in this legislation before he weighs in one way or the other, because we don't know exactly what's in it because the text of the legislation hasn't been released yet. This is an idea that Johnson has floated, but it hasn't been put down exactly on paper. But certainly, if Donald Trump comes out against this, it makes it even more complicated for Mike Johnson because it means even more Republicans could defect, and he would have to try to offset those possible Republicans Republican no votes with Democratic votes and really turn to Democrats to get this over the goal line. He's already likely going to have to do that, but he would have to do that even more, which puts him in an even more precarious situation with his fellow House Republicans. Jay O'Brien for us on Capitol Hill. Thank you so much, Jay, for breaking that down for us. Appreciate your time. The Supreme Court is hearing arguments today in a major case stemming from the January 6th attack on the Capitol. The outcome could invalidate felony obstruction charges for more than 300 people connected to the attack, including former President Trump. Senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer joins me now for more on this. And Devin, uh, you've been listening into these arguments all morning long. How is each side making their case? Well, Stephanie, this case it involves a law passed in the wake of the Enron scandal more than 20 years ago to prevent the destruction of evidence and financial documents. But prosecutors in those 300 cases and in the case against President Trump, as you mentioned, use this law to potentially send some of those alleged rioters behind bars for as much as 20 years. There's a provision in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act that says it is a crime to otherwise impede or interfere with an official proceeding. The government right now, Stephanie, is arguing that that is pretty broad language that applies to these riders. They interfered with the counting of electoral votes. But uh, one of the accused, Joseph Fisher, he's the man who brought this case. He has been charged with obstruction. He says uh, really what Congress meant in this law was simply to penalize matters related to financial crimes and evidence and that it was improperly used. The justices right now, uh, Stephanie, are debating the language. This is a very textual case, and they're trying to figure out what exactly Congress meant when they wrote this, and can it be applied to these uh, January 6 cases? And, and how long could we see them dis discussing this for? When could the court issue a ruling? 
Well, the ruling is expected by the end of the term, so just uh, a couple months from now, the end of June. Those 300 cases that you talked about, uh, all on the line here, those, uh, those defendants could see reduced sentences if they've already pled guilty or been convicted. Some of the charges could be dropped in some of those cases. And one of the cases most closely watched, of course, is that of President Trump. Special counsel Jack Smith brought four charges against Donald Trump uh, for his alleged election interference, and one of them was obstruction of an official proceeding brought under this very same financial evidence law from uh, more than 20 years ago. So what the Supreme Court says about how that law can be applied uh, could potentially also impact the president and whether that charge can go forward. And while we have you, let's talk about a talk about a recent decision. Meanwhile, the court is allowing Idaho's ban on gender affirming care for minors to be enforced. How significant is that? And, and what kind of immediate impact could we see? Well, the Supreme Court yesterday morning did not weigh in on the merits of this case, Stephanie, but they did say that Idaho can begin enforcing this ban, uh, a 10-year penalty, criminal penalty for inter any doctor that provides hormone therapy uh, and, and the like to transgender kids under the age of 18. Uh, it is significant and that families seeking that care in Idaho will now be denied that care while this litigation continues. More than 20 states have laws that severely restrict this type of uh, transitioning care. Uh, but on the other hand, the fight continues, Stephanie. The Supreme Court did allow the parents in this case uh, to continue to seek care for their kids. It's a very narrow exception in Idaho uh, with the expectation that they will hear this case at some, uh, some point down the line. This is not the final word of the Supreme Court stuff. Senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer. Thank you, Devin. You bet. Coming up, tax day. It's time. But what if you missed the deadline? Alexis Christophers has a breakdown of what you should do, plus other business headlines right after the break. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back. Tesla is announcing some layoffs. And how can you reward yourself if you finished your taxes? Well, ABC business reporter Alexis Christophers has more on that and other business headlines. Alexis, so much to look out for. What are you watching today? We are watching the auto sector today, Steph, because traders are bailing on Tesla for the second straight day. That stock is now at its lowest level in more than a year after the electric vehicle maker announced it's laying off 10% of its workforce in an interim 
internal memo to employees, CEO Elon Musk said of those layoffs, there is nothing I hate more, but it must be done. Falling demand and a price war with competing EV makers is hurting Tesla's bottom line. Not even price cuts and other incentives are enough to get drivers behind the wheel. Tesla's stock is down 60% from its peak about two and a half years ago. Well, if you missed yesterday's tax filing deadline, you have got plenty of company. About 20 million Americans typically miss the tax day each year. But there are some things you can do right now to minimize any possible damage. First, find out if you owe the IRS money. You can do that by using an online calculator at places like TurboTax or H&R Block. And you can refer to last year's taxes to give you an idea of what you might owe. Then get that payment out ASAP, because each day that you don't pay, the amount you owe accrues penalties and interest that could total up to 25% of your total tax bill. So for example, if you owe $2,000, you'll pay another 500 in penalties. If you're filing your taxes late and you don't owe the government money, you actually won't be charged any penalties, but you're also delaying your tax refund. And this year, refunds are averaging about $3,000. That's up 5% from last year. It's going to take about three weeks to get that refund if you filed electronically, a little longer if you filed the old-fashioned way by mail. So don't leave that money on the table. Claim your refund as soon as possible. And as a reward for getting your taxes done, how does a little free ice cream sound? Well, you're in luck because it is free cone day at Ben & Jerry's, an annual tradition at the ice cream maker since 1993, believe it or not. You can go to any Ben & Jerry's today and get a free cone or cup, any flavor of your choice, no strings attached. And we can't say that about a lot of things, no strings <laughs> attached. <laughs> That's really good to know. I would take vanilla and just pretty boring and bland. It's, it's classic. Simple. Classic. It's classic yeah. yeah. What about you? Are you, are you, you did your taxes nice and early. Usually, you I did, I did. I'm a chocolate chip mint kind of girl. Okay. So simple. If they have something like that, that's where I'm going. Deal. Sounds We're good. We're headed there after the show. Yes, let's do it. It's a date. <laughs> Alexis, thank you so much. Sure. If you have any finance questions for Alexis, leave a message on our Instagram feed at ABC News Live, and she might answer your question right here on Thursday. All right, coming up, it was a really big night for the WNBA. We have a look at the draft and where the top players are headed. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. I you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to Good Morning america.com or scan this qr code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed why do so many people start their day here from abc news this is start here to be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories a lot of news today so let's get into it listen now to the daily news podcast honored with four edward r murrow awards and see why the new york times calls it a news podcast worth listening to start here abc news make it your daily first listen now that's a part of the story i bet you didn't see coming wherever you get your podcasts start here Reporting from Niagara Falls in the path of the total solar eclipse, I'm Rob Marciano. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Welcome back to ABC News Live. Caitlin Clark was officially drafted by the Indiana Fever as the number one pick in the WNBA. This comes on the heels of a game-changing March Madness that had everyone buzzing about the WNBA draft. Well, it happened. ABC's Lara Spencer has all the big moments from last night. With the first pick in the 2024 WNBA draft, the Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. Excitement hitting a fever pitch as basketball superstar Caitlin Clark officially launches her WNBA career. I've dreamed of this moment since I was in second grade, and it's taken a lot of hard work, a lot of ups and downs, but uh, more than anything, just trying to soak it in. The NCAA leading scorer and overall number one draft pick chosen by the Indiana Fever, basking in the moment with her family. I told my mom before this, is like, you know, I earned it, and that's why I'm so proud of it. Thousands of fans from her new team erupting in celebration. Her new teammates ready with Clark's jersey in hand. Clark, one of several superstars taking their talents to the WNBA this year. Cameron Brink, Stanford University. After an electric season, number two overall pick Cameron Brink heading to the Los Angeles Sparks. Her godparents are the parents of NBA superstar Steph Curry. The two have known each other since they were kids. So I actually FaceTimed Steph like five minutes before the, the show started. So he just said to, to just have fun with it. I think he can just share so much great advice. And Chi Town doubling up on star power. Camilla Cardosa, <laughs> University of South Carolina. Angel Reese. Third pick, Camila Cardozo, and seventh pick, Angel Reese, former SEC rivals, now teammates for the Chicago Sky. I had a go to be here tonight and give my family a better life. So I'm just so thankful that I was able to be here. <laughs> I'm just so excited. I get to play with Camila. And for the first time in more than 25 years, two Hawkeyes drafted in the same year. Clark's Iowa teammate Kate Martin, a surprise pick in the second round, heading to the Las Vegas Aces. I was here to support Caitlin. All I wanted was an opportunity, and I got it, so I'm really excited. All right, thanks to Lara Spencer for that report. ABC News contributor and USA Today columnist Christine Brennan is joining me now for more on this. Gosh, what a night. How exciting. What an exciting moment for all, moment for all those women. Uh, Caitlin Clark, we got to start with her. No question goes uh, number one last night. Uh, but for her rookie season, she's only making $76,000. I say only, but that's just in comparison to other NBA players and WNBA players. What does that say about the pay gap in women's sports. Stephanie, it says that the nation is now going to wake up to uh, the inequality in terms of pay, and it will change. Uh, the media rights deal for the WNBA is up. There will be negotiations, and Caitlin Clark will change that as well. But really, this is all about capitalism. I mean, for a generation, people have ignored the WNBA. They haven't bought tickets. They haven't watched. They haven't bought uh, the products they're seeing on the commercials. And Everything changes. I think the eyeballs on this number, $76,000. Now, again, she's making much more than that. Her endorsements are into the millions. There's also a chance of having $250,000 contract or a, a, a addition for um, marketing the WNBA. I'm sure she'll get that as well. So she's she's a, she's going to be a multimillionaire. But it's shining a light on something that we should be looking at. Title IX is, of course, applying to high schools and colleges. This is about capitalism. This is about Americans spending their money in a certain way. And that's going to change because of the eyeballs, because of the TV ratings. Caitlin Clark will be, the Caitlin Clark effect, Stephanie, will be impacting that as well. And it's about time because these women obviously have been underpaid now for several decades. It is about time and the game is certainly changing. Thank you so much for your time. ABC News contributor and USA Today columnist, Christine Brennan. Thank you. Looking forward to the season. Thank you all for streaming with us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember...
that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, the Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for joining us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Jury selection has resumed in the historic criminal trial of former President Trump. Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. The district attorney's office has now formally filed a request to hold Trump in contempt over a series of recent social media posts, including what he said about witnesses Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels. ABC News senior reporter Catherine Falders joins me now along with ABC News executive editorial producer John Santucci and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for more on this. Catherine, I want to start with you. What is the latest on this jury selection process? We know this is day two. Uh, we ended the day yesterday with no jurors selected. What's the latest right now? Well, we don't have any jurors yet, but we do know that some of them from that initial pool are moving on to a second round of screening, if you will. We know that jurors are being asked a number of questions. There was a 42-question questionnaire. Uh, those questions consist of, of course, things about them, their personal lives, but where they get their news, if they have strong opinions uh, of former President Trump, for example. Uh, we don't know how long this will last. We know that they need 12 jurors and six alternates. That's 18 people. So, of course, the big question is, we've been discussing this since yesterday is how long this will take on the one hand. Uh, this could wrap up at the earliest, maybe this week, early next, uh, but it could potentially uh, be two or three weeks here of jury selection. We just don't know. But at this point right now, uh, they don't have one juror uh, to sit on this trial yet, but some who have moved into additional rounds of screening. We will have to wait and see when that wraps up. John, Trump says this case should have never been brought. He said that this morning. We heard from him yesterday when he spoke to reporters. He spoke to reporters again. Might be a trend. What's his argument there? Well, his argument is that this is a case that has gone on for several years. And his opinion is that it could have been brought many years ago. Now, in some ways, he's not totally inaccurate in that statement, in the sense that this was a case that was first investigated by then New York District Attorney Cyrus Vance. That case ultimately did not go any where it didn't move forward. There was another case they did go forward with looking into the Trump organization and their bookkeeping methods, if you will, um, basically about fringe benefits some employees would get. So that case did go forward. But that's Trump's argument that, you know, why are you doing this now? It could have been then, et cetera. The other thing that they argue is that, look, 
This, if you want to make the statement that these were payments related to impacting an election, then that's really a federal case, not a state case. So why are we doing this in state court? Again, where prosecutors have turned this case in, into what it is, they said, look, again, this is a bookkeeping issue. You falsify documents. You claim that these were payments for X. Turns out they were actually for Y. And this is why we're all here. Mm. And Brian, I want to turn to you. John mentioned these, the falsifying of these business records. Now, doing that constitutes either a misdemeanor or a felony, depending on the circumstances of a given violation. Uh, kind of walk us through why Trump exactly is facing felony charges. Yes, yeah, Stephanie. So for it to be a misdemeanor for falsifying business records, punishable by up, up to a year in prison, as most misdemeanors are in this state, you're just falsifying business records. You're omitting, deleting, uh, whatever it may be. But when you do so to aid and conceal or to commit another crime, that's when you go from a misdemeanor to a felony. And that's at the heart of Donald Trump's argument here and many of his supporters saying that there is no underlying crime here, that you're moving a misdemeanor into a felony. Uh, based on this very creative way of saying that there might be federal election crimes that occurred. But we've already seen the FEC investigate this uh, potential election violation, and they said, we're not going to go forward. Now, saying you're not going to go forward, and especially in a report that says there's a strong reason to believe that there are violations, are very different than saying that there are no uh, federal election crimes there. But it is creative, and I kind of put that in quotation marks, and I agree with Donald Trump to some extent, in the sense that, at least as far as my practice has been almost a decade, I haven't seen uh, the application of New York state law using federal election laws to create a felony. But if you follow the language and you follow the evidence, it does seem to be allowed. This might not be decided today or even at the uh, verdict of this case. I think that this might be decided come appeal when we look at this case further down the line. And Catherine, I want to turn to you. The, the judge ruled that prosecutors cannot play the now infamous Access Hollywood tape, but can read the transcript to jurors. Uh, so uh, walk us through the other pieces of evidence that will be presented during this trial. Right, they can't play the video of that tape, can't hear uh, the audio of that infamous Access Hollywood tape, but the judge uh, did rule that prosecutors can introduce National Enquirer stories uh, into evidence, for example, that infamous uh, catch-and-kill scheme that will allow uh, testimony uh, related to former uh, Playboy model Karen McDougal. Uh, Look, we need to see how they end up using this at trial, but uh, the broader point here is to use these other instances to go uh, directly to Trump's character, to paint this picture of Trump's character. So we'll have to see how they use it, but this will uh, go hand in hand uh, with the witnesses they call those close to Trump, those in his inner circle, whether it be uh, while he was president at the White House, whether it be those close to him at the Trump Organization. And we will definitely be hearing more about that, of course, as this case progresses. And Catherine, speaking of witnesses, uh, John, yeah. what could Trump family members possibly testify? Well, Judge Mershon actually went through a laundry list of people that could testify. He mentioned the family. He mentioned White House age. He mentioned, you know, close advisors that worked with Donald Trump, both in the White House and the Trump Organization. The reality is we don't know everybody just yet. We know some, right? ABC News has reported that several former assistants and aides to the former president could take this in or expected to. Now, on the case of Donald Trump, that is the $64,000 question. Trump has repeated to ABC News news now twice, Stephanie, just the last couple weeks. Friday, he told our Rachel Scott he would love to testify. We'll have to see what happens. We will have to see what happens. <laughs> yes, John, thank we'll you very eventually. much. We will get there. We have to get through this jury selection process first. Good to see you. Good Good to too. have you here in studio once again. John Santucci, Catherine Falders, Ryan Buckmeyer, thank you all. We will be following this story all day long and, of course, bring you the latest right here on ABC News Live. In other news, the Israeli War Cabinet is meeting today for a third day in a row. Members are still considering what Israel's response will be to Iran's unprecedented attack as the IDF vows to retaliate. This comes, of course, as the Biden administration and other world leaders urge Israel to show restraint. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman has the latest from Israel. The Israeli War Cabinet is meeting today for a third day in a row. Members are still considering what Israel's response will be to Iran's unprecedented attack as the IDF vows to retaliate. This comes as the Biden administration and other world leaders urge Israel to show restraint. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman has the latest from Israel. 
The Middle East on edge with Iran vowing a massive response to the slightest action from Israel as Israel vows to retaliate for that rain of missiles. Iran will face the consequences for its actions. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu convening his war cabinet for the third consecutive day to discuss a response to that unprecedented barrage of more than 300 missiles and drones early Sunday. We saw a response multi-layered, multinational against that would-be ring of fire that Iran intended on enduring and putting on Israel. We stopped that the coordinated response from a U.S.-led coalition, including Britain and France, fording the attack, the IDF saying 99% of those incoming threats intercepted. An Israeli official telling ABC News Iran actually increased the number of ballistic missiles it would fire once it learned of the scope of the U.S.-led coalition against it. They knew that many were going to be defeated, but the aim was to get as many of them through Israel's defenses as possible. And for the 12 minutes it took for those missiles to arc from Iran to Israel, American and Israeli officials unsure if their missile net would hold. It did. A senior Israeli Air Force official telling ABC News multiple Middle Eastern countries provided Israel with an early warning. And Israel's Arrow aerial defense system taking down ballistic missiles seen streaming over Jerusalem. The IDF saying this new video shows Israeli troops pulling one of those bus-sized ballistic missiles out of the Dead Sea. President Biden saying the U.S. is committed to the safety of troops in the region and to Israel's security, but the administration making it clear that the U.S. will not participate in any Israeli counterstrike. Iran says its attack avenged Israel's strike earlier this month that killed two top generals at a consulate complex in Syria. And this is one of the 130 ballistic missiles that Iran launched against Israel. And you can see that this 40 long section, this is just the fuel tank. The engine would have been on the other side, the warhead over there. And Israeli officials tell me that if one of these had actually hit a population center, it could have taken out a building, killing dozens of people. And that might have set off a regional war. Now, I'm told that the most likely Israeli retribution will be a cyber attack or uh, the killing of an Iranian official somewhere in the world. I'm told that a key consideration for Israel is preserving this uh, defensive coalition built by the U.S. to defend Israel. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman there in Israel for us. Let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang uh, to discuss this. Selena, Israeli defense forces are now vowing, of course, to retaliate as Israel's war cabinet considers its response. How is the White House responding? Yeah, Stephanie, look, the White House is bracing for some kind of response, and they're making clear that Israel's decision is their own. But I am told that the president is urging restraint. We know that the president and Netanyahu had a phone call after that Iranian attack, and a senior administration official described their conversation to me like this, that the president said, look, I understand that Israel feels the need to respond in some way to show strength and to establish that deterrence, but the president, I'm told, told Netanyahu that you've already come out of this exchange looking strong by taking out nearly all of those missiles and drones. Israel already, quote, looks untouchable is how the official described the exchange so to me. But look, the White House also making clear that the U.S., they're willing to help defend Israel, but they're not going to participate in any kind of offensive. The White House on the record meaning, remaining very tight-lipped about whether or not they expect Israel to give them any sort of heads up before they make the retaliatory move, but they are making clear that they're in close contact with their Israeli counterparts. We'll see if their position shifts at all. Uh, Selena, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen uh, says the U.S. will not hesitate to issue new sanctions on Iran following its attack on Israel. What kind of impact could these new sanctions have on Iran, and could it realistically make a difference? Yeah, well, Stephanie, that actually comes just right after the G7 leaders meeting with President Biden, where they discussed working together in a coordinated way on economic sanctions. And clearly, the administration is trying to show they are willing to use economic power to disrupt Iran. And it also sends a message to Israel that there are other ways to hit back and retaliate at Iran that are not using military force and military action. But look, experts say that the options for sanctioning Iran are limited because they're already so many sanctions on Iran, but some options include imposing additional sanctions on some officials or businesses or going after Iran's oil revenues, but that runs the risk of raising gas prices, which, Stephanie, as you know, is not what the administration wants right now. So that's why some experts are saying that any sanctions that are put on Iran may be mostly symbolic. 
senior White House correspondent Selena Wang for us at the White House. Thank you so much. And that attack by Iran has Congress scrambling to pass aid for Israel and possibly for Ukraine. Now House Speaker Mike Johnson says he'll break up the votes and bring four separate measures to the floor that include aid for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. Meanwhile, the House moved to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas over his handling of the southern border. ABC's Jay O'Brien is on Capitol Hill with the latest. Jay, good to have you. House Speaker Mike Johnson unveiled his plan, and it's it's pretty complicated, it seems. So break this down for us. What are these four measures that he's planning to bring to the floor? Yeah, and it's an ambitious plan, Stephanie, as you note. Four separate pieces of legislation that sources now tell us Johnson just moments ago in another meeting with House Republicans pitched as one cohesive fact, uh, a package. And there's a problem with that. I'll get to that in a second. But it's four separate issues, aid for Ukraine, aid for Israel, aid for Taiwan, and then a fourth that is a grab bag piece of legislation of conservative priorities, which includes a ban on TikTok as well as seizing Russian assets. Potentially aid for Gaza could be in there as well as maybe a loan for Ukraine as Trump has floated before. So that fourth package is what makes this so complicated because if Johnson gets his wish and puts this all together, maybe four separate votes, but one package that the Senate has to take up as one item, that fourth thing, those conservative priorities might make this a tough vote for Senate Democrats to stomach and potentially doom passage of this in the Senate. If it even gets out of the House, and that's an open question, too, because we've seen already this morning some Republicans, the hardliners, start to revolt against this proposal from Johnson. And Johnson, of course, facing a razor-thin majority in the House right now. Jay, the impeachment proceedings against DHS Security uh, Alejandro Mayorkas, uh, the Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, uh, those are heading to the next stage in the Senate today. So what can we expect to happen? Well, the, the articles of impeachment will be walked over to the Senate this afternoon. You'll see that on camera. It's similar to the Trump impeachments. It is a formal procession of those articles. Then that kicks off the ball finally in the Senate's court to begin this trial. We've heard from Senate Democrats who say they want to make quick work of this and Democrats control that chamber. So uh, the thought process is that they can either dismiss these articles pretty quickly once they eventually reach the Senate floor or they can try to have a trial but do it in an expedited way that's either a quick trial on the Senate floor or referred to a committee. But Democrats are again signaling they're going to make very quick work of these impeachment articles. Stephanie. Jay, thanks for breaking it down for us. Appreciate you. Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thanks. Coming up, a severe weather threat is on the move. Where tornado watches are under effect right now. That's coming up. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. The Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Millions of Americans are bracing for another round of severe weather. In the last 24 hours, more than 90 reports of severe storms came in from South Dakota to Virginia. ABC's meteorologist Samara Theodore is tracking it all for us. Hey there, Samara. Good morning, Steph. That's right. So severe weather season is well underway. We're getting thrown into the action this morning. So we've already seen at least one tornado reported on the border of Kansas and Nebraska. Here we go. Uh, well, we did have a tornado watch in effect for this region. It looks like it was just dropped. Nonetheless, we still have very strong storms sweeping through Kansas City into Omaha and Des Moines. Here's what happens next. I'm fast forwarding through time. This is 9 p.m. tonight. You can see where the greatest tornado threat is going to be, or really where the line of storms is sweeping all the way down into uh, Illinois there. And here it is. Highest tornado threat through this afternoon and evening will be in Des Moines, northern Missouri, just outside of Peoria in western Illinois. So keep that in mind if you have any plans. And we could see a few tornadoes from Little Rock to Springfield in St. Louis. It's just that the highest threat is going to be in that orange zone there where we have that enhanced risk. So after that, this line of storms then sweeps farther east. This is tomorrow at 8 p.m. This is where we have the greatest threat for uh, active weather, maybe even a few tornadoes in parts of the Great Lakes, stretching from Detroit all the way down to Cincinnati and Evansville. Stephanie? All right, getting ready for that rain headed our way. Thank you so much, Samara. Coming up, pet octopus turns octomom. How one family's pet octopus turned their lives upside down. That's coming up. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? Appreciate <laughs> you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. All the exclusive and buzziest celebrity good stuff. Deals and steals with amazing savings and the coolest lifestyle tips from Good Morning America. I love that so much. GMA Life. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Your weekend just got a little better with GMA Life. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. More and more women are embracing the joys of aging as they enter their 50s and beyond. ABC News lifestyle contributor Lori Bergamotto spoke to some pretty amazing women who are doing just that. This segment is sponsored by QVC and features women teaming up to celebrate the wisdom, unity, and power that comes with aging while dispelling stereotypes. Take a look. Three different women coming together for one mission. We think that we can't do anything after 50. That's a lie. American icon and R&B legend, Patti LaBelle. <laughs> Actress, Jenny Garth. I've made my choice and I choose me. And QVC host, Rachel Bosing. You get first look at items. All spokeswomen for our sponsor, QVC, whose new campaign aims to help women embrace a unique time in their lives. QVC's Age of Possibility is about a community of women who are 50 plus, who are living their lives unapologetically and authentically and are clearly dispelling outdated stereotypes. A woman who's 50 plus is not sitting at home by herself, feeling like it's all downhill from here. She's beautiful and powerful. 
To help amplify their message, QVC assembled a collective of women who are stepping into their power. What is the quintessential 50? It's a group of 50 women who are frankly reflecting what 50 plus looks like in a magical and magnificent way. We're willing to hold your hand as you march into this new phase of your life. With an 80th birthday just around the corner, Ms. Patti LaBelle is not afraid to take big risks. You really leaned into trying so many new things, launching the dessert line, dancing with the stars. For a lot of people, after 50 days slow down, you've sped up. I never stopped working and never stop cooking and never stop singing. There's no limit to what I think I can do. 52-year-old Jenny Garth says this campaign brings women together to make meaningful connections. You get a little sassier when you're 50. You want to be heard, you want to have a voice. A lot of QVC's audience is over 50, so it's important to speak right to them, and it's important to inspire them and motivate them. What would you say to the woman who is about to turn 50 and maybe she's a little bit nervous about it. We're about to spill the tea on everything. So we don't feel here that you have to be part of the club to understand what's going on in the club. We're gonna actually give you that soft runway. There's one thing they all want you to know. Don't underestimate them. You're fierce. Take that message and believe it. Society has really put women over 50 into a certain category, sort of that we are done. We're not done. 50 is the new 30 to me. Thanks to our sponsor, QVC, and thank you to the amazing women for empowering us to embrace a unique time in our lives. Stephanie? Thanks so much, Lori. Great to see. Now to the story that's really getting some legs on social media. It is about a dad, a son, and their pet octopus. Becky Worley has those details. Nine-year-old Cal Clifford of Edmond, Oklahoma, has a fascination with all things octopus. I've just loved them since I was two, because they're the closest things to aliens. This obsession got legs when Dad Cameron bought a tank and promised they could actually get one. We're going to build an octopus tank? Thank you so much. <laughs> And the arrival of a mail-order California two-spot octopus in a plastic bag was Cal's dream come true. They named him Terrence. But then Terrence outgrew his tank. And then the Cliffords learned keeping an octopus tank was really hard. The electrical issue was a little bit scary, and that was kind of a, a wake-up call. The reverse osmosis filter, although properly installed, had a leak. And so finding out that our Kitchen island and floors needed to be ripped out. That was a little bit inconvenient. And then Terrence the octopus became an octo mom. We kind of estimated there were about between 40 and 70 eggs, but every one that hatched that I saw, I was able to catch and contain. And, I, and it was exactly 50. Terrence was renamed Terry, and the family assumed the eggs were unfertilized. But nope, one by one, they hatched. Each baby got a name. Seance was like this like hippie octopus. And then Swim Shady, he, he's just like tentacles in the air. My wife named that one JC. So I think Bill and I, the octopi is the most recent. <laughs> Hi, buddy. When the baby started hatching faster than I could kind of catch them, I had to move a lot of them into the bathroom in these small containers because they would eat each other if they were put in the same container. The makeshift incubators took over bathrooms and countertops that the Cliffords dubbed Clamsterdam. Realizing this was untenable for the long term, a local reptile buff stepped in to help house the babies temporarily. The moral of the story? No, don't. <sighs> Scientists don't recommend it. But would they have done anything different? Nothing, really. I think he nailed it. What we do for our kids, right? The Clifford's TikToks about this situation are hilarious. As one commenter said, I came for the octopus saga, but I stayed for the dad jokes. Uh, the family says they're trying to get these little critters adopted by educational institutions and aquariums, that they've turned down offers to sell them to individuals. And as for that plural issue on octopus, I reached out to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and they say the preferred term is octopuses. There you go. Stephanie?
<laughs> Thanks so much, Becky. I love that story. What a great story. And that family, they're really great with names. Siance has to be my favorite. All right, thank you so much for streaming with us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis. at stake so much on the line more americans turn here than any other newscast abc news world news tonight with david muir america's number one most watched newscast across all of television give it to me it's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families. On the ground in Ukraine. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Reporting from the U.S.-Mexico border in California, I'm Jacqueline Lee. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Potential jurors are being interviewed in the historic criminal trial of former President Trump. So far, no jurors have been seated, but dozens have been excused over conflicts with their schedules or their inability to judge the case fairly. Now, the process is moving into a new phase with attorneys questioning individual prospective jurors. Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney Michael Cohen. I want to bring in ABC News senior reporter Catherine Falders along with ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer for more. Brian, I want to start with you. How does this new phase in the jury selection process work exactly? Yeah, so Stephanie, think of it in terms of two phases as you put it out. The first one is to see whether or not you're qualified, to see if those basic questions a judge would ask would disqualify you or make you eliminated for cause. As we move into the second phase, that's where attorneys get to ask more pointed questions, and then they have the ability to do what's called a peremptory challenge. And now that's just a challenge of saying, I don't want this person uh, on the jury for an unstated reason. And so long as they're not creating a pattern of discrimination of potential jurors based on sex, ethnicity, or race, they can eliminate whoever they want. However, there's some gamesmanship to it because each side only has 10 peremptory challenges to select that 12 people in the jury, and then they get an additional two to create that pool that we call the alternates, and that's going to be six. So they can only use so many prams, as we call them, uh, until they run out. All right, certainly a lengthy process. We'll see how long it takes, whether they wrap it up by the end of this week or if we go into next week. Catherine, members of the Trump family may testify, and Trump has said he is willing to take the stand in his defense. What are you watching for? Do you think that would be likely? 
Uh, look, Trump has previously said that he'd be willing to testify. This goes all the way back to Robert Mueller's investigation in the first White House, which he ultimately did not testify. And so who ultimately knows what Trump will do? He said he's willing to. People close to him say that they think that that's the case. In terms of members of his family, these are members of his family that Judge Michonne listed as potential witnesses. Ivanka Trump, Jared Kushner, uh, Don Jr., Eric Trump, for example, all as potential witnesses that prosecutors could call. We just don't know who they ultimately will call, whether uh, they will forego calling some members of his family, um, whether they will stick to maybe those members of his inner circle, whether it be at the White House or at the Trump Organization. So uh, those are calculations and decisions that prosecutors uh, will make down the line, of course, as this trial progresses. Right, we'll just have to wait and see. Brian, the district attorney's office has now formally filed a request to hold Trump in contempt over a series of recent social media posts, including what he said about witnesses Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels. What are the next steps there? The next step, Stephanie, would be to have a hearing where the prosecution would put forward their evidence. Uh, I'm imagining you're going to just get a screenshot of the uh, social media post that you're describing, put them in front of the judge. The judge will already have uh, his order that he gave uh, for Donald Trump. And then both sides will make the argument as to, and we've heard some of the language already, whether Donald Trump knowingly and willfully uh, violated that court order. The defense will probably argue that this falls outside of the range uh, of that order and potentially potentially even make First Amendment arguments. And the prosecution will say the facts firmly fit what the orders were and that Trump violated it, and that the only way to get him to stop doing it in the future would be to charge him $1,000 per violation. Brian, is that something that would likely happen this week as they're going through this jury selection process, or is this something that comes after? I think it will more likely than not happen at some point in time where there may be a lull. I think right now the judge is very much focused on let's get a jury. Let's let's at least get some qualified right. jurors we can question. And so ultimately, uh, he might say, you know what, there's a lull here. Um, the, the, the end of the day ended a little short. Maybe we'll do it now. But he'll try to fit in, I think, sooner rather than later. Right. And Catherine, let's talk a little bit about the evidence, the evidence that will be presented, the evidence that won't be presented. We know that the judge ruled that prosecutors cannot play that now infamous Access Hollywood tape from years ago, but can read the transcript to jurors. Uh, so what other evidence should we expect to see to be presented in this trial? Right, so with that Access Hollywood tape, they could essentially use Trump's words, like you said, not play the video, we can't hear the audio. Um, the judge said that they would, that he would allow evidence from the National Enquirer, those stories into evidence, that he would also allow evidence related uh, to former Playboy model Karen McDougal uh, to be used as evidence at trial. Now, this all goes to what prosecutors uh, are trying to build this case about Trump's character, for example. So how they use that uh, seems pretty clear as they try and build this case around his character. Uh, we'll have to see how much uh, they use of it, but I guess if you're Trump, you could say some losses, but a win, too, that that uh, Access Hollywood tape will not be played and shown to the jury. Exactly. Catherine Falders and Brian Buckmeyer, thank you both so much. I really appreciate your time. We, of course, will be following uh, this story all day and bringing the latest right here on ABC News Live. Moving on to Capitol Hill, House Speaker Mike Johnson says he will not resign as Congress scrambles to pass aid for Israel and possibly for Ukraine. Uh, I am not resigning, and it is, uh, it is, in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion, and we are simply here trying to do our jobs. Um, it is not helpful to the cause, it is not helpful to the country, it has not helped the House Republicans advance our agenda, which is in the best interest of the American people here, a secure border, uh, sound governance, uh, and it's not helpful to the unity that we have in, in the body. This comes as Johnson says he will break up the votes and bring four separate measures to the floor that include aid for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. But some Republicans are already coming out against it. ABC's Jay O'Brien is joining me now from Capitol Hill for more on this. Thanks for coming back, Jay. Really appreciate it. So what is inside these measures and could it threaten Johnson's future as speaker? Well, this is an effort to try to get that aid for Israel that so many Democrats and Republicans wanted uh, for really months now, but really gained steam, particularly after that attack by Iran. Um, and so Israel aid is a component of these four pieces of legislation. But one of the other of the four components is aid for Ukraine, which has been long stalled. And Johnson has said he believes is important, despite the fact that he hasn't brought an aid on Ukraine bill to the floor for months. And it's that aid for Ukraine 
It's causing the hardliners in Johnson's party to balk. Marjorie Taylor Greene is saying that she's going to ramp up her efforts using a motion to vacate, which you already heard Johnson refer to there, to try to oust him from the speakership. Thomas Massey has already now said that he's going to join Marjorie Taylor Greene in those efforts. And Greene has said she believes her ranks of Republicans opposing Johnson are growing, although other lawmakers haven't publicly said that they're going to support her one way or the other. A lot of Republicans have come out and said what she's doing in their view is unproductive. But certainly Johnson is now being pitted against the hardliners in his own party because of this package that he's now going to put on the floor this week. Stephanie. And Jay, we've also learned Speaker Johnson spoke with President Biden before laying out this plan. Any indication that Democrats may get on board with this? These are proposals that Democrats have supported, funding for Israel, Ukraine, um, and the th third is funding for Taiwan, and then there's a fourth bill that's got some conservative priorities in it. We don't know exactly what the text of that bill is going to look like, so it's unclear to take the temperature of what Democrats will think about that. But on the whole, this is something Democrats have largely supported. And while the White House has said that they wanted this legislation, sources tell us, to be in the form of a bill that the Senate passed, which is all of this stuff ramped, wrapped into one without that grab bag of conservative priorities, Johnson's not going to do that. So he's going to need Democrats to pass this. It's very likely if this does get to the floor that Democrats will vote for. And certainly because of these Republican defections that we're seeing, Johnson really needs the help of Democrats. So he's got to walk this fine line of keeping Republicans happy, but also making sure this legislation is appealing to Democrats in the House. That's setting aside the Senate where this legislation might face a rocky path itself. And you said it, Jay, He's he has to please both Democrats and Republicans, but do you think this will get some more Republicans on board with him and, and kind of get him on his side? Do you think this will help him? Well, look, we like, uh, we, we've seen Republicans who say they like. Um, what he's done in terms of the ambitious nature of this package, the four bills, and putting this Ukraine aid on the floor, something that some Republicans have thought Johnson might not ever do. And we've also heard from Republicans who may not like this package. Jim Jordan is a good example of this, who said they don't agree maybe with some of the policy provisions in this four bill package, but they do not believe now is the time to oust another Speaker of the House. Remember when Kevin McCarthy was ousted, the House went 22 days without a Speaker. The the business of the House was paralyzed. So the only Republicans we've seen come out and say they believe it's time for Johnson to go are Marjorie Taylor Greene, Thomas Massey. Again, they claim they've got a little bit more support waiting in the wings who have not gone public yet, but we haven't seen that materialize, Stephanie. And Jay, also uh, sources say Speaker Johnson did not fully lay out all of the details for this plan uh, and for the plan for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan to Trump when he met with the former president in Mar-a-Lago. So uh, the former president did not endorse the idea. What kind of impact could this have on his speakership? Well, that's the open question is what does Donald Trump think about this legislation? Because certainly, given the power that Trump has over House Republicans, hardliners and moderates alike, if he were to come out against this legislation, it could really pose a significant threat to this package that Johnson wants to get over the goal line. Think about when Trump came uh, out against the reauthorization of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, last week. That doomed the legislation for a time until there were some changes made that would appeal to Trump and Trump finally then uh, ne didn't necessarily get on board with it, but backed down in terms of his criticism. So Donald Trump has a lot of power over House Republicans. And if he really wants to take down this legislative package, he can. But the sense we're getting from the former president's allies who are speaking to my colleague up here, Rachel Scott and John Santucci and Catherine Falders as well, is that the former president wants to wait and see the text of this legislation, exactly what is put down on paper before he weighs in one way or the other. But certainly Donald Trump is another factor Mike Johnson is going to have to grapple with if he wants to get this passed. Absolutely. We will see what happens. Jay, thank you so much for your time and for breaking all of that down for us. Really appreciate it. Let's go back now to the New York City courthouse, where the historic criminal trial of former President Trump is entering a new phase of jury selection. So far, no jurors have been seated, but dozens have been excused over conflicts with their schedules or their inability to judge the case fairly. Want to bring in investigative reporter Olivia Rubin, who is outside the court with a prospective juror who was just excused from the case. Hi there, Olivia. Mm -hmm. 
Hey, Stephanie, I'm standing here with Kara McGee, who is, as you said, a prospective juror who was just excused. She had some scheduling conflicts with her job working in cybersecurity, but she went into the room with former President Donald Trump. She stood up. She answered the 42 question questionnaire. and We're hearing a little bit about what it is like in that room. So, Kara, I want to ask you right off the top, what was it like that very first moment you walked inside of the courtroom and saw former President Donald Trump? Tell us about that. Sure. Uh, so I wasn't positive that this was the case I was on until I went in the courtroom and saw him. Uh, and my first thought was, oh, wow, this is interesting, because um, I learned that this was the case. Um, yeah. It's it's interesting because uh, it's two conf very conflicting feelings at the same time, um, where on the one hand, it's this enormous feeling of you're part of history. Um, and on the other hand, it's this huge public figure who you've mm -hmm. seen in the media for yeah. so long, and you see him in person, and he's just some guy. Yeah. So. Did you want to get on the case? I did. I thought it would be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can you tell us about when you answered the questionnaire? It's just you. It's all on you. You know, have you read his books? Did you watch his shows? Did you follow him on social media? Were you looking at him? Was he looking at you? How did you feel being right there with him? Um, so when I personally was answering the questionnaire, um, I was looking down, <laughs> trying to make sure I was yeah. seeing the questions correctly. Uh, I did look at him right before I looked down to start reading it. Um, and from watching him watch the other jurors, he seemed he seemed to be paying pretty close attention to them. Um, the legal teams definitely were very invested in what mm -hmm. everyone was saying mm -hmm. as well. And what are your sort of personal feelings on Donald Trump? Do you like him? Do you dislike him? And would you have been able to set that aside if you had been picked? So uh, personally, I do not like him at all. Um, I don't approve of what of a lot of what he has done as president and a lot of what he has said um, for many reasons. But I think that the right to a fair trial um, in this country is incredibly important, mm -hmm. um, especially in this day and age when, you know, none of us trust each other. Um, it's such a fraught climate all the time. Um, and I think that in order to do my civic duty, I, yes, I would be able to put aside my personal feelings about him and who he is as a person and what he has done and said and judge the facts of this specific case mm -hmm. and what can be proved mm -hmm. and what can. And were you able to get a sense about the other jurors? You know, 96 were brought in yesterday. The judge said there's over 200 waiting. The sentiment from those jurors, were they, uh, you know, pro-Donald Trump? Were they against Donald Trump? Were they completely neutral? What is the sense of the jury pool in there right now? So I think you, you can't be an American and come into this without a prior opinion. Um, it's just not possible, but there, there seem to be kind of two schools of thought. One where people were very honest that they wouldn't be able to put their prior opinions aside and raise their hand and said, I don't think I would be able to be impartial and were excused. Right. Um, and one where people definitely were coming from the background of it, um, either that they, they did or didn't like him. Um, there were some people who definitely seemed more conservative leaning, um, more pro-Trump. Um, so both sides. Both sides, yeah. But, but from both sides, a willingness to either say, I would be too influenced, I can't do this, or I am willing to put this aside and focus on the yeah. facts. And I would just say my last question for you, Kara. You know, you were just in there, a potential juror deciding a very historic case. Donald Trump has said that he doesn't think that he can get a fair jury in New York. What would you say to him in response to that statement, having maybe been a juror? I was surprised at how fair it actually did seem. I, I was worried that there would be people who would try to lie their way onto the jury um, to get one or the other outcome. Um, and I think there's there's risk of that from anyone. I mean, I could, I could see the motivation for it. Um, but it really seemed like everyone there was taking it very seriously and, and was kind of reminded of their, our responsibility to uphold the sanctity of a free trial, um, or a fair trial, uh, not not for Donald Trump himself, but for this institution going forward. Great. Kara, thank you so much. Stephanie, heard it there, wanted to get on, but wasn't ultimately chosen. And I think the takeaway really does not like Donald Trump, but believes in the idea that every single person deserves a fair trial. Stephanie.
Thank you, Olivia. And thank you uh, to Kara McGee for sharing your perspective uh, with us. Kara McGee there, a prospective juror who uh, was dismissed today, but sharing the sentiments that uh, many other jurors may also feel. They could have been a part of history. This is a historic trial. But again, thank you, Olivia and Kara. We, of course, will be following this historic trial all day right here on ABC News Live. But we'll be right back. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The crown in crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William? Welcome back. Tesla is announcing some layoffs. And how can you reward yourself if you finished your taxes? Well, ABC business reporter Alexis Christophers has more on that and other business headlines. Alexis, so much to look out for. What are you watching today? We are watching the auto sector today, Steph, because traders are bailing on Tesla for the second straight day. That stock is now at its lowest level in more than a year after the electric vehicle maker announced it's laying off 10% of its workforce in an interest memo to employees CEO Elon Musk said of those layoffs there is nothing I hate more but it must be done falling demand and a price war with competing EV makers is hurting Tesla's bottom line not even price cuts and other incentives are enough to get drivers behind the wheel Tesla stock is down 60% from its peak about two and a half years ago well if you missed yesterday's tax filing deadline you have got plenty of company about 20 million Americans typically miss the tax day each year but there are some things you can do right now to minimize any possible damage first find out if you owe the IRS money you can do that by using an online calculator at places like TurboTax or H&R Block and you can refer to last year's taxes to give you an idea of what you might owe then get that payment out ASAP because each day that you don't pay the amount you owe accrues penalties and interest that could total up to 25% of your total tax bill so for example if you owe two thousand dollars you'll pay another 500 in penalties if you're filing your taxes late and you don't owe the government money you actually won't be charged any penalties but you're also delaying your tax refund and this year refunds are averaging about three thousand dollars that's up five percent from last year it's going to take about three weeks to get that refund if you filed electronically a little longer if you filed the old-fashioned way by mail so don't leave that money on the table claim your refund as soon as possible and as a reward for getting your taxes done, how does a little free ice cream sound? Well, you're in luck because it is free cone day at Ben & Jerry's, an annual tradition at the ice cream
ice cream maker since 1993, believe it or not. You can go to any Ben & Jerry's today and get a free cone or cup, any flavor of your choice, no strings attached. And we can't say that about a lot of things, no strings attached. <laughs> That's really good to know. I would take vanilla and just pretty boring and bland. It's, it's classic. Simple. It's classic. classic yeah. yeah. What about you? Are you, are you, you do your taxes I'm, nice I'm and early. You I did, reward. I did. I'm a chocolate chip mint kind of girl. Okay. So simple, if they have something like that, that's where I'm going. Deal, sounds We're good. We're headed there after the show. Yes, let's do it, it's a date. <laughs> Alexis, thank you so much. Sure. If you have any finance questions for Alexis, leave a message on our Instagram feed at ABC News Live and she might answer your question right here on Thursday. All right, coming up, it was a really big night for the WNBA. We have a look at the draft and where the top players are headed. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting from Mazatlan, Mexico, covering the total solar eclipse, I'm Matt Rivers. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Caitlin Clark was officially drafted by the Indiana Fever as the number one pick in the WNBA. This comes on the heels of a game-changing March Madness that had everyone buzzing about the WNBA draft. Well, what happened? ABC's Lara Spencer has all the big moments from last night. With the first pick in the 2024 WNBA draft, the Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. Excitement hitting a fever pitch as basketball superstar Caitlin Clark officially launches her WNBA career. I've dreamed of this moment since I was in second grade, and it's taken a lot of hard work, a lot of ups and downs, but uh, more than anything, just trying to soak it in. The NCAA leading scorer and overall number one draft pick chosen by the Indiana Fever basking in the moment with her family. I told my mom before this, is like, you know, I earned it, and that's why I'm so proud of it. Thousands of fans from her new team erupting in celebration. Her new teammates ready with Clark's jersey in hand. Clark, one of several superstars taking their talents to the WNBA this year. Cameron Brink, Stanford University. After an electric season, number two overall pick Cameron Brink heading to the Los Angeles Sparks. Her godparents are the parents of NBA superstar Steph Curry. The two have known each other since they were kids. So I actually FaceTimed Steph like five minutes before the, the show started. So he just said to, to just have fun with it. I think he can just share so much great advice. And Chi-Town doubling up on star power. 
Camilla Cardosa. Angel Reese, LSU. Third pick, Camila Cardozo, and seventh pick, Angel Reese, former SEC rivals, now teammates for the Chicago Sky. I had a goal to be here tonight and give my family a better life. So I'm just so thankful that I was able to be here. <laughs> I'm just so excited. I get to play with Camilla. And for the first time in more than 25 years, two Hawkeyes drafted in the same year. Clark's Iowa teammate Kate Martin, a surprise pick in the second round, heading to the Las Vegas Aces. I was here to support Caitlin. All I wanted was an opportunity, and I got it, so I'm really excited. All right, thanks to Lara Spencer for that report. ABC News contributor and USA Today columnist Christine Brennan is joining me now for more on this. Gosh, what a night. How exciting. What an exciting moment for all, moment for all those women. Uh, Caitlin Clark, we got to start with her. No question goes uh, number one last night. Uh, but for her rookie season, she's only making $76,000. I say only, but that's just in comparison to other NBA players and WNBA players. What does that say about the pay gap in women's sports. Stephanie, it says that the nation is now going to wake up to uh, the inequality in terms of pay, and it will change. Uh, the media rights deal for the WNBA is up. There will be negotiations, and Caitlin Clark will change that as well. But really, this is all about capitalism. I mean, for a generation, people have ignored the WNBA. They haven't bought tickets. They haven't watched. They haven't bought uh, the products they're seeing on the commercials. And Everything changes. I think the eyeballs on this number, $76,000. Now, again, she's making much more than that. Her endorsements are into the millions. There's also a chance of having $250,000 contract or addition for um, marketing the WNBA. I'm sure she'll get that as well. So she's she's a, she's going to be a multimillionaire. But it's shining a light on something that we should be looking at. Title IX is, of course, applying to high schools and colleges. This is about capitalism. This is about Americans spending their money in a certain way. And that's going to change because of the eyeballs, because of the TV ratings. Caitlin Clark will be, the Caitlin Clark effect, Stephanie, will be impacting that as well. And it's about time because these women obviously have been underpaid now for several decades. It is about time and the game is certainly changing. Thank you so much for your time. ABC News contributor and USA Today columnist, Christine Brennan. Thank you. Looking forward to the season. Thank you all for streaming with us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis. To be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live.
for joining us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Potential jurors are being interviewed in the historic criminal trial of former President Trump. So far, no jurors have been seated, but dozens have been excused over conflicts with their schedules or their inability to judge the case fairly. Now the process is moving into a new phase with attorneys questioning individual prospective jurors. Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney Michael Cohen. ABC News senior reporter Catherine Folders joins me now along with ABC News executive editorial producer John Santucci and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer joining me for more. Thank you so much. John back in here again. Yeah. So what is the what is the latest from the court? We're entering this new phase in yeah. the jury selection process. So what's uh, the latest? Well we don't have a jury. That's pretty much That's where we where are. That's where we are. Moment. Day two yeah. zero jurors. Okay. But, you know I think it's interesting we you know a couple moments ago Olivia Rubin as we were just talking about off air, had a great interview with one of those prospective jurors. And really, I think what's fascinating about this process, you know, it's a real shame that there are no cameras in court for a hundred different reasons, but even to just go through that voir dire process, right? I was talking to someone earlier um, of that movie with Gene Hackman, Runaway Jury, right? And how jury consultants, you know, go through the pieces of like what makes a potential juror. And one of the things they talk about is, you know, given the person that's at the defense table and given the facts, can you be fair and impartial? And we've seen so quickly in just day two that many people have taken themselves out simply on that question alone. It's really quite striking. The other thing, again, just where we're all becoming educated in the civil process, right, is just people have other lot parts of their lives, right? This is going to be a very long trial. Look, we haven't even gotten to trial yet, and it's already long. But say, signing up for this for two months, if not more, is a huge time commitment. I think we're up to, what, three weddings and a few other things people have said I can't be there for? So it really is just interesting how this process is playing out in New York. And I do think the takeaway so far, we're going to have a very long time to get to this jury. Our colleague, uh, Josh Hoyos, made a great point to me earlier. It took 27 business days to seat the O.J. Simpson jury. We're on day one and a half. We've Lots got a go. long way to go, yeah, I think. Do. Yeah, and, and even if these jurors or potential jurors may be excited to be a part of history, as we heard from uh, that young lady that Olivia interviewed, That's right. Like you said, they have other lives. Time totally. doesn't allow. They have to get to their other things, and it's just not possible. That's right. Uh, Brian, I want to get your reaction to what this prospective juror, who was ultimately dismissed, said to ABC's Olivia Rubin uh, just a few moments ago. Olivia asking her about the mindset of the other potential jurors in the room. Take a listen. So I think you, you can't be an American and come into this without a prior opinion. Um, it's just not possible. But there, there seem to be kind of two schools of thought. One where people were very honest that they wouldn't be able to put their prior opinions aside and raise their hand and said, I don't think I would be able to be impartial and were excused. But from both sides, a willingness to either say, I would be too influenced, I can't do this, or I am willing to put this aside and focus on the facts. Brian, it seems as though a lot of the, these potential jurors are, are being honest. And, and sharing their actual opinion uh, with with the folks there at the courthouse. What what is your reaction to to what that young woman just said? Yeah, uh, my reaction is that's a New Yorker for you. I, I picked about six or seven juries myself in Brooklyn, New York, in state criminal court. I have sat and watched colleagues do numerous uh, voir dires themselves. And there are a lot of people, to, to John's point, who just have a life to live. They've got things to do. And there are a lot of people that we're seeing here kind of rise to the top and say, like, guys, I can't do this. I I'm sorry. Like, I know myself. I know my biases. And any good attorney and any good judge will welcome that. You don't want a juror to not kind of self-evaluate and think, is this a good or bad place for me to be in terms of affording this individual a fair trial and giving the prosecutor uh, a, a fair shake at trying to prove this case? And so for me, this is why I prefer jury trials over, over bench trials. Uh, I, I trust 12 people in the box often more times than the one sitting at the bench. Interesting, no matter how long it takes. And, and John brings up an interesting point that it took uh, during the O.J. Simpson trial 27 business days to get a jury together. Here we are on day two. Brian, what do you think? Do you think we're going to see something similar where this is going to take uh, weeks before the trial can even get started because they're still looking for, for jurors? 
I mean, this is interesting. It was just yesterday I was sitting next to John Santucci and I said, I think it's going to be three weeks. And he looked at me, he's like, oh, that seems strange. And now John seems to be on the more than two no. week train, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but yeah, I think this is going to take a long time. Uh, the jurors are, are just self-selecting themselves now. And then we haven't even gotten to the process of peremptory challenges and four cause challenges. And you know that, uh, for example, John, Donald Trump's team is going to get that one juror that they really like. And the prosecution is going to say, no, they need to be eliminated for cause. We have no peremptory challenges. And the legal arguments between getting that one juror that you think is going to hold out your case for you, we haven't even gotten to that stages yet. And I think there's going to be far more arguments for contempt of court as this process continues. Uh, so I think, yeah, we're thinking about the three-week mark and, and, and maybe beyond that. This is just the beginning. John, Trump's team has argued they can't get a fair trial in New York City. What do you make of what you've heard about this jury pool and, and what's the latest on Trump's team yeah. and, and their their efforts to delay, delay, delay? I thought you were going to say, is Brian accurate in his statement? Yeah, Brian, you were right. I was wrong. You're happy it's on camera now. Anyway, but moving on. Documented. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you're happy. Okay. So, no, but I think what Trump's team has argued continuously, as we all know, is that you can't get a fair trial in Manhattan. And what they point to is that in the last election, about 10% of Manhattan residents voted for Donald Trump. That ain't a lot. A lot more went for the Democrat, and even before that in 2016, voted for Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump in that race. Look, they wanted to move this trial. They tried. That was one of the tactics that they pulled out, right? They wanted to go to Staten Island. They wanted to go to some other part of New York State. It just wasn't going to happen. And as Judge Mershon said yesterday, he is a defendant in New York County, which is how Manhattan is referred to within the New York State court system. This is it. This is the jury pool. This is what you're getting. And I think that from all the reporting we've heard that thousands, not, not a couple hundreds, thousands of New Yorkers receive this jury questionnaire. I do think at the end of this, what's going to be fascinating, how many Manhattan residents did we have to go through to get to 12 jurors and six alternates? That's going to be one heck of a big number. Mm -hmm, it certainly is. And this this questionnaire, just for, for those that may not be familiar, this questionnaire is filled out there at the court, yep. right, in the courtroom. Yep. And we heard from Kara McGee, that young woman who filled hers out and, and looked briefly at the former president before doing so. Yeah. So this all takes place there at the court. I uh, want to bring in Catherine Falders, our senior reporter. Uh, Catherine, Trump has explained that this trial will keep him from campaigning like he should be, like how he would want to campaign. But these court appearances are now kind of intertwined in his campaign strategy. How could that affect the election cycle, if at all? Well, he's certainly bringing the campaign to the courthouse. And he's right. He can't be campaigning when uh, this is in session, when the judge is sitting. So he can go out on the weekends, potentially Wednesday, when uh, the trial won't be uh, in session. So that doesn't leave him many days. But at the same time, he's blended the two together. This is nothing new uh, for Donald Trump. We know he's been in courthouses multiple times. A lot of times, he hasn't had to be there. He chooses to go uh, to these court appearances. So he certainly believes that him being on trial is politically advocated advantageous to him. Yes, he can't go out uh, during the week. Uh, he can't campaign. At the same time, he realizes that at least he believes and his advisors believe that he essentially is using this and using that camera in the hallway and using his press conferences after as a campaign stump speech, if you will. Uh, it will be interesting to see what type of effect that has, given that he does have to be there six to eight weeks. That's different than just random court appearances here and there. Uh, so again, we'll have to see how it ultimately affects affects the campaign and the events, but it's not like he didn't expect this, and it's also not like this isn't something that he believes that he can benefit politically off of. Yeah, we will definitely have to wait and see. Catherine Falders, John Santucci, and Brian Buckmeyer, thank you all for joining us. We, of course, will be following this story all day right here on ABC News Live. This story all day and bringing the latest right here on ABC News Live. Moving on to Capitol Hill, House Speaker Mike Johnson says he will not resign as Congress scrambles to pass aid for Israel and possibly for Ukraine. Uh, I am not resigning, and it is, uh, it is, in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion. And we are simply here trying to do our jobs. Um, it is not helpful to the cause. It is not helpful to the country. It has not helped. The House Republicans advance our agenda, which is in the best interest of the American people. 
This comes as Johnson says he will break up the boats and bring four separate measures to the floor that include aid for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. But some Republicans are already coming out against it. ABC's Jay O'Brien is joining me now from Capitol Hill for more on this. Thanks for coming back, Jay. Really appreciate it. So what is inside these measures and could it threaten Johnson's future as speaker? Well, this is an effort to try to get that aid for Israel that so many Democrats and Republicans wanted uh, for really months now, but really gained steam, particularly after that attack by Iran. Um, and so Israel aid is a component of these four pieces of legislation. But one of the other of the four components is aid for Ukraine, which has been long stalled. And Johnson has said he believes is important, despite the fact that he hasn't brought an aid on Ukraine bill to the floor for months. And it's that aid for Ukraine it's causing the hardliners in Johnson's party to balk. Marjorie Taylor Greene is saying that she's going to ramp up her efforts using a motion to vacate, which you already heard Johnson refer to there, to try to oust him from the speakership. Thomas Massey has already now said that he's going to join Marjorie Taylor Greene in those efforts. And Greene has said she believes her ranks of Republicans opposing Johnson are growing, although other lawmakers haven't publicly said that they're going to support her one way or the other. A lot of Republicans have come out and said what she's doing in their view is unproductive. But certainly Johnson is now being pitted against the hardliners in his own party because of this package that he's now going to put on the floor this week. Stephanie. And Jay, we've also learned Speaker Johnson spoke with President Biden before laying out this plan. Any indication that Democrats may get on board with this? These are proposals that Democrats have supported, funding for Israel, Ukraine, um, and the th third is funding for Taiwan, and then there's a fourth bill that's got some conservative priorities in it. We don't know exactly what the text of that bill is going to look like, so it's unclear to take the temperature of what Democrats will think about that. But on the whole, this is something Democrats have largely supported. And while the White House has said that they wanted this legislation, sources tell us, to be in the form of a bill that the Senate passed, which is all of this stuff ramped, wrapped into one without that grab bag of conservative priorities, Johnson's not going to do that. So he's going to need Democrats to pass this. It's very likely if this does get to the floor that Democrats will vote for. And certainly because of these Republican defections that we're seeing, Johnson really needs the help of Democrats. So he's got to walk this fine line of keeping Republicans happy, but also making sure this legislation is appealing to Democrats in the House. That's setting aside the Senate where this legislation might face a rocky path itself. And you said it, Jay, He's, he has to please both Democrats and Republicans, but do you think this will get some more Republicans on board with him and, and kind of get him on his side? Do you think this will help him? Well, look, we like, uh, we, we've seen Republicans who say they like. Um, what he's done in terms of the ambitious nature of this package, the four bills, and putting this Ukraine aid on the floor, something that some Republicans have thought Johnson might not ever do. And we've also heard from Republicans who may not like this package. Jim Jordan is a good example of this, who said they don't agree maybe with some of the policy provisions in this four-bill package, but they do not believe now is the time to oust another Speaker of the House. Remember when Kevin McCarthy was ousted, the House went 22 days without a Speaker. The business of the House was paralyzed. So the only Republicans we've seen come out and say they believe it's time for Johnson to go are Marjorie Taylor Greene, Thomas Massey. Again, they claim they've got a little bit more support waiting in the wings who have not gone public yet, but we haven't seen that materialize, Stephanie. And Jay, also uh, sources say Speaker Johnson did not fully lay out all of the details for this plan uh, and for the plan for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan to Trump when he met with the former president in Mar-a-Lago. So uh, the former president did not endorse the idea. What kind of impact could this have on his speakership? Well, that's the open question, is what does Donald Trump think about this legislation? Because certainly, given the power that Trump has over House Republicans, hardliners and moderates alike, if he were to come out against this legislation, it could really pose a significant threat to this package that Johnson wants to get over the goal line. Think about when Trump came uh, out against the reauthorization of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, last week. That doomed the legislation for a time until there were some changes made that would appeal to Trump and Trump finally then uh, ne didn't necessarily get on board with it, but backed 
down in terms of his criticism. So Donald Trump has a lot of power over House Republicans. And if he really wants to take down this legislative package, he can. But the sense we're getting from the former president's allies who are speaking to my colleague up here, Rachel Scott and John Santucci and Catherine Falders as well, is that the former president wants to wait and see the text of this legislation, exactly what is put down on paper before he weighs in one way or the other. But certainly, Donald Trump is another factor Mike Johnson is going to have to grapple with if he wants to get this passed. Absolutely. We will see what happens. Jay, thank you so much for your time and for breaking all of that down for us. Really appreciate it. Coming up, a severe weather threat is on the move. Where tornado watches are under effect right now. That's coming up. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. This is Sir Combat Operations Center. We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Welcome back. Millions of Americans are bracing for another round of severe weather. In the last 24 hours, more than 90 reports of severe storms came in from South Dakota to Virginia. ABC's meteorologist Samara Theodore is tracking it all for us. Hey there, Samara. Good morning, Steph. That's right. So severe weather season is well underway. We're getting thrown into the action this morning. So we've already seen at least one tornado reported on the border of Kansas and Nebraska. Here we go. Uh, well, we did have a tornado watch in effect for this region. It looks like it was just dropped. Nonetheless, we still have very strong storms sweeping through Kansas City into Omaha and Des Moines. Here's what happens next. I'm fast forwarding through time. This is 9 p.m. tonight. You can see where the greatest tornado threat is going to be, or really where the line of storms is sweeping all the way down into uh, Illinois there. And here it is. Highest tornado threat through this afternoon and evening will be in Des Moines, northern Missouri, just outside of Peoria in western Illinois. So keep that in mind if you have any plans. And we could see a few tornadoes from Little Rock to Springfield in St. Louis. It's just that the highest threat is going to be in that orange zone there where we have that enhanced risk. So after that, this line of storms then sweeps farther east. This is tomorrow at 8 p.m. This is where we have the greatest threat for uh, active weather, maybe even a few tornadoes in parts of the Great Lakes, stretching from Detroit all the way down to Cincinnati and Evansville. Stephanie? All right, getting ready for that rain headed our way. Thank you so much, Samara. Coming up, pet octopus turns octomom. How one family's pet octopus turned their lives upside down. That's coming up. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all? That's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good morning, America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here and we got gotcha. you. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. More and more women are embracing the joys of aging as they enter their 50s and beyond. ABC News lifestyle contributor Lori Bergamotto spoke to some pretty amazing women who are doing just that. This segment is sponsored by QVC and features women teaming up to celebrate the wisdom, unity, and power that comes with aging while dispelling stereotypes. Take a look. Three different women coming together for one mission. We think that we can't do anything after 50. That's a lie. American icon and R&B legend, Patti LaBelle. Oh! Actress, Jenny Garth. I've made my choice and I choose me. And QVC host, Rachel Bosing. You get first look at items. All spokeswomen for our sponsor, QVC, whose new campaign aims to help women embrace a unique time in their lives. QVC's Age of Possibility is about a community of women who are 50 plus, who are living their lives unapologetically and authentically and are clearly dispelling outdated stereotypes. A woman who's 50 plus is not sitting at home by herself, feeling like it's all downhill from here. She's beautiful and powerful. To help amplify their message, QVC assembled a collective of women who are stepping into their power. What is the quintessential 50? It's a group of 50 women who are frankly reflecting what 50 plus looks like in a magical and magnificent way. We're willing to hold your hand as you march into this new phase of your life. With an 80th birthday just around the corner, Ms. Patti LaBelle's not afraid to take big risks. You really leaned into trying so many new things, launching the dessert line, dancing with the stars. For a lot of people, after 50 days slow down, you've sped up. I never stopped working and never stopped cooking and never stopped singing. There's no limit to what I think I can do. 52-year-old Jenny Garth says this campaign brings women together to make meaningful connections. You get a little sassier when you're 50. You want to be heard, you want to have a voice. A lot of QVC's audience is over 50, so it's important to speak right to them, and it's important to inspire them and motivate them. What would you say to the woman who is about to turn 50 and maybe she's a little bit nervous about it. We're about to spill the tea on everything. So we don't feel here that you have to be part of the club to understand what's going on in the club. We're gonna actually give you that soft runway. There's one thing they all want you to know. Don't underestimate them. You're fierce. Take that message and believe it. Society has really put women over 50 into a certain category, sort of that we are done. We're not done. 50 is the new 30 to me. Thanks to our sponsor, QVC, and thank you to the amazing women for empowering us to embrace a unique time in our lives. Stephanie? Thanks so much, Lori. Great to see. Now to the story that's really getting some legs on social media. It is about a dad, a son, and their pet octopus. Becky Worley has those details. Nine-year-old Cal Clifford of Edmond, Oklahoma, has a fascination with all things octopus. I've just loved them since I was two, because they're the closest things to aliens. This obsession got legs when Dad Cameron bought a tank and promised they could actually get one. We're going to build an octopus tank? Thank you so much. <laughs> And the arrival of a mail-order California two-spot octopus in a plastic bag was Cal's dream come true. They named him Terrence. But then Terrence outgrew his tank. And then the Cliffords learned keeping an octopus tank was really hard. 
the electrical issue was a little bit scary and that was kind of a, a wake-up call. The reverse osmosis filter, although properly installed, had a leak. And so finding out that our kitchen island and floors needed to be ripped out, that was a little bit inconvenient. And then Terrence the octopus became an octo mom. We kind of estimated there were about between 40 and 70 eggs, but every one that hatched that I saw, I was able to catch and contain uh, and it was exactly 50. Terrence was renamed Terry, and the family assumed the eggs were unfertilized. But nope. One by one, they hatched. Each baby got a name. Seance was like this, like, hippie octopus. And then Swim Shady, he, he's just like tentacles in the air. My wife named that one JC. So I think Bill and I, the octopi, is the most recent. <laughs> Hi, buddy. When the baby started hatching, faster than I could kind of catch them. I had to move a lot of them into the bathroom in these small containers because they would eat each other if they were put in the same container. The makeshift incubators took over bathrooms and countertops that the Cliffords dubbed Clamsterdam. Realizing this was untenable for the long term, a local reptile buff stepped in to help house the babies temporarily. The moral of the story? No, don't. <laughs> Scientists don't recommend it. But would they have done anything different? Nothing, really. I think he nailed it. What we do for our kids, right? The Clifford's TikToks about this situation are hilarious. As one commenter said, I came for the octopus saga, but I stayed for the dad jokes. Uh, the family says they're trying to get these little critters adopted by educational institutions and aquariums, that they've turned down offers to sell them to individuals. And as for that plural issue on octopus, I reached out to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and they say the preferred term is octopuses. There you go. Stephanie? <laughs> Thanks so much, Becky. I love that story. What a great story. And that family, they're really great with names. Seance has to be my favorite. All right, thank you so much for streaming with us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Reporting from Del Rio, Texas, in the path of the total eclipse, I'm Mireya Villarreal. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this is our combat operations center. We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a care, is it? How important it made the USA. Great work. 
Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's Mael. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because... You know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Today on ABC News Live, targeting witnesses before they even testify. We are only in day two of jury selection, and Donald Trump is already calling Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels sleazebags, violating the judge's limited gag order, and now forcing the Manhattan DA's office to file a formal request to hold Trump in contempt. This hush money case already making history, as this is the first time a former president has stood trial on criminal charges and and the proceedings are already proving challenging. Not one juror seated after an entire first day of filtering through the pool of New Yorkers. At least 50 of them excused after raising their hand, claiming that they just couldn't be fair or impartial. This case, years in the making, and all stemming from those allegations that Trump made hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels just prior to the 2016 election in an effort to conceal an alleged affair. This is the first of four criminal cases involving Donald Trump to go to trial as he continues to make his bid to return to the White House. We have team coverage leading us off right now. Our investigative correspondent, Libya Rubin, is outside the courthouse. She joins me along with Adam Kaufman, former executive assistant, district attorney, Attorney at the Manhattan DA's office, executive editorial producer John Santucci, and our legal contributor and trial attorney Brian Buckmeyer. Olivia, let's start with you. What's more exciting to talk about, the fact that we don't have a jury or Trump apparently maybe falling asleep in court yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll let you be the judge of that one, Kira. But I think what is exciting is that so far this afternoon or this morning or, you know, whatever we're calling it at this point, jury selection has now managed to move sort of into the next phase. So as you know, jurors have been answering the questionnaire. Jurors are leaving, saying they can't be impartial, saying they have scheduling, uh, you know, conflicts. But now we have gotten to the point where prosecutors and Donald Trump's team are actually questioning the individual jurors. So it signals that it is finally moving into sort of that next Next phase, as you said, still not a juror seated on the panel, but they are finally now getting down to sort of the nitty gritty of being able to tease out what these people might have in their minds, should they or should they not serve. And the answers they are giving, Kira, are fascinating. And I want to give you some of them from our, uh, you know, wonderful team that's been inside this morning. One juror said he finds the former president to be fascinating and mysterious. He said he walks into a room and sets people off one way or another. I find that really interesting. So we are starting to hear from these jurors what they actually think about the former president. And we heard from both Todd Blanche, Donald Trump's attorney, and Joshua Steinglass, a DA, address the jurors. And what Todd Blanche said was to please give Donald Trump a fair shake. So really fascinating questioning taking shape, Kira. All right, I want to talk more about that with Brian in a second. But Adam, you worked in the Manhattan DA's office. What do you make of so many potential jurors saying that they just couldn't be impartial? I, I'm frankly not surprised, Kira. Um, you know, this is a case that in so many aspects of our life, we see how polarizing Donald Trump has been. And I think if a juror is honest, and we always hope that jurors are honest when we're conducting jury selection, there's going to be people who just honestly say, I can't be fair, one way or the other. Um, and so it's not surprising to me, first, that they were excused for that reason. And second, we're talking about a six-week trial. And so for many people, that's an economic hardship, and they just can't do it. So not surprising that so many people were excused right off the bat. Now we'll get into the challenges for cause, the peremptory challenges, which is uh, each party gets so many challenges without cause, without a reason. They just don't like a certain juror and they excuse them. But those charges are very limited. And so now that we have a selection of jurors to go through, um, things should start to move a little bit more quickly uh, and be a little more interesting for those watching. 
So then, Brian, let me take it to you then, just talking about the validity uh, of the circus act that we saw, you know, in many ways yesterday with everybody yelling, oh, I just can't do it, and, and calling out Trump and, and screaming obscenities at him, at him. Could all this jeopardize the validity of the trial? I think it's a fair enough question, but I think most legal scholars or most attorneys would tell you the validity of a trial is not based on the jurors that are eliminated, but based on the jurors that make it uh, to the actual jury and the alternates. Now, so long as we get those 12 and 6 individuals who aren't laughing and scoffing or saying they can't be there, uh, Trump gets what everyone deserves, and that's to be judged by a fair and impartial jury of his peers. So whoever leaves, I'm not too concerned about them. I'm more concerned about who stays. Good point. And John, no surprise, Trump raising money once again over the possibility that this could or that he could go to jail. Mm -hmm. But w would you agree that this is maybe the least surprising thing so far? I appreciate you giving me the easiest question, Kira. Of course, it's the least surprising <laughs> thing. I mean, listen, this is what Donald Trump has done so long for the last year, right? I mean, we were all together this time last year when the first indictment of four, this actually being the case, the Manhattan DA's case happened. And within a second, Donald Trump issued something on Truth Social followed by a fundraising email. That has been the rinse repeat method of the Trump campaign for the last year. And you better believe it's going to continue. I mean, there was uh, some email that came out yesterday yesterday that I just stormed out of the courtroom and, and now you need to fundraise for me. I don't think that's exactly how that worked. Court ended for the day, but nevertheless, we know that is definitely the playbook for Team Trump, Kira, and it's only going to continue for however long this trial goes. Let's see if we get a jury at some point this month. Well, let's talk more about that with Olivia and what we know about the pool of jurors that the court has already combed through. Uh, you even had a chance to speak with one of them outside of court. I just spoke a few minutes ago with Kara McGee, who is a young 29-year-old woman living in the East Village, who was one of the ones who went on in, went into the courtroom, stood up, and answered the 42-question questionnaire in front of Donald Trump. And she was ultimately excused because of the scheduling with her work. But what she said and the insight she gave about what it's like to be in that room was fascinating. Take a listen. Uh, personally, I do not like him at all. Um, I don't approve of, what, of a lot of what he has done as president and a lot of what he has said. In order to do my civic duty, I yes, I would be able to put aside my personal feelings about him and who he is as a person and what he has done and said and judge the facts of this specific case mm -hmm. and what can be proved mm -hmm. and what can. So it's fascinating, Kira, because it speaks exactly to something we have heard from Donald Trump, which is that he cannot get a fair jury in New York City. And if you listen to Kara, who was one of the individuals who was in the room, who was with other jurors, she said that she was surprised by how honest everyone was and how many of them were willing to put aside their own personal beliefs. You heard from her, she does not like Donald Trump, but she was able, if she was chosen, to put those aside and judge the trial fairly. And she said in her words, she believes that many of the other jurors would be able to as well. Olivia, John, Brian, Adam, uh, thank you all so much. We'll continue to talk throughout the day. And it's not just Donald Trump's criminal trial that's making history, but we are also following a historic impeachment on Capitol Hill. Following a nearly year-long investigation, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas faces a trial of his own after the House narrowly voted to impeach him in February over his handling of the southern border. Impeach managers will now walk those articles of impeachment over to the Senate chamber. Our Jay O'Brien is on the Hill following the story for us. So Jay, House Republicans say they have all the goods to prove the grounds justifying this historic act by Congress. What do we know? Well, the Republican argument that they made in impeaching Mayorkas, Kira, was that he violated the law, they claim, by not instituting hardline border security policies, and among them, not instituting mass detention of migrants who cross the border. Now, the argument that Democrats and DHS made is that Republicans were weaponizing a policy disagreement rather than an actual high crime or misdemeanor. What DHS said is that under that standard, every single Homeland Security Secretary in 
modern American history should be impeached. That's the argument that DHS made. So they're saying that this is political. Republicans are, vi are arguing a violation of law here. All of that is going to come to a head in just about an hour's time from now where those impeachment articles are walked from the Republican-controlled House to the Democratic-controlled Senate. That chamber expected, obviously, to make quick work of that impeachment proceeding and that trial that's going to happen in there. So when House members, uh, or managers rather, walk over the articles to the Senate later today, what can we expect to see? Well, it's a ceremonial proceeding. It, think back to the Trump impeachments, although the set of facts here are different. Uh, the policies and the procedures in which this is carried out are very similar. You'll see the House impeachment managers. Among them, by the way, is Marjorie Taylor Greene. Go out of the House floor, walk those articles of impeachment over to the Senate, and that then puts the ball in the Senate's court in terms of procedure. We've already heard from Chuck Schumer, who has said, again, he's going to want to make quick work of these impeachment articles. It's unclear if he's going to move to quickly try to dismiss the charges in a sense or try to have this trial in a quicker setting, perhaps refer it over to a committee. But we've also heard from Republicans, Mitch McConnell among them, who say they are going to strongly oppose and try to throw sand in the gears of the process if Chuck Schumer does try to quickly dismiss these charges and not try to have some kind of trial on the Senate floor. And so once the Senate receives the articles, let's talk about what's next for Mayorkas. I mean, what does he do during all of this besides sit back and maybe bite his nails? He sits back and watches, but we do know that the Department of Homeland Security is actively messaging against this impeachment. They really ramped up their communications when the House was taking up these impeachment articles, but it was a fait accompli in the House that there was going to be a vote to impeach Mayorkas. So though Republicans failed to do that, remember, because they got three defections at one point who voted against impeaching Mayorkas, and they didn't have the numbers to overcome that. So they had to do it again, and then those articles finally passed in the House. So there was a time in which that vote was contentious even in the Republican controlled House. In the Democratic controlled Senate, it is a bygone conclusion that Democrats who control that chamber and Chuck Schumer chief among them are going to try to do away with these articles quickly. They view them as a political stunt and Republicans are going to try to make some kind of a public case while this all plays out. As for Mayorkas, he largely does sit back and watch this play out while the Department of Homeland Security consistently tries to make the point that they view this as a purely political move. All right, should be an interesting day. Jay O'Brien, glad we have you up on the Hill. Thanks, Jay. Israel's war cabinet is still meeting and still mulling over how it's going to respond to Iran's weekend attack. The Israeli Minister of Defense promising retaliation, but not saying when and how. Iran saying any retaliation will be met with a severe, widespread, and painful response. President Biden, along with other world leaders, well, they're continuing to urge against retaliation of any sort, saying that if Israel strikes back, it will do it alone. Josh Enniger is in Jerusalem for us. Also, our contributing political correspondent, Rachel Bade, joining the conversation. Josh, let's take it first to you. Israel's war cabinet has been meeting, what, for three days now? So are you hearing anything about Israel's priorities? So I'll tell you what I have heard, Kiro, today we went down toward the south to an Israeli military base where uh, there was a giant a piece of a missile, basically the entire fuel tank of a ballistic missile that authorities found in the Dead Sea, one of the 110 ballistic missiles that were volleyed across from Iran on Saturday night. And they brought it there and they brought a bunch of reporters together to see it. And I had a chance to speak to one of the lead spokespeople for the Israeli Defense Forces. And I asked him point blank, I said, why not just take the win? Why not say, listen, we have proven our superiority here. We fended off this attack and, and we're going to heal the warnings from the world leaders and the answer he said he likened that to kicking the can down the road he said all it does is it pushes out another potential onslaught from around in the future they think we're weak and we have our civilians safety to worry about that was his response so that's what's going on in this war cabinet room they are evenly divided between people who want to for very forcefully respond and people who want to respond somehow on the edges to show that they're still uh you know going to defend their homeland and make a strike against iran uh and perhaps 
perhaps something that would be less uh, antagonistic to then bring another round from Iran. But then again, Iran's supreme leader today said any Iranian interest that is targeted will will lead to a similar uh, response from that reg regime. So it's a very difficult situation here in Israel. They, they have a very, very uh, difficult choice and really no right answer in terms of what they can do. And Rachel, Congress is still under a lot of pressure here to act on the stalled aid for Israel and the war in Ukraine. You've been speaking with your sources uh, within the GOP, also within Democratic leadership. What are they telling you? Yeah, Kira, after months of delaying a vote on Ukraine and Israel assistance, Speaker Johnson is finally bringing these issues to the floor for a vote. And initially, we were hearing some squawking from Democrats. They wanted these two things to move together with other foreign assistance like they did in the Senate. Uh, Johnson also said he was going to tuck in some conservative uh, provisions. And I'm told that President Biden called Speaker Johnson personally last night to express concern about this plan. And Johnson told him, quote, this is the only way forward if if you want to get your Ukraine aid. Since then, my Democratic sources told me late into the night and this morning, they're coming around to this plan. They think they could potentially swallow it. But the bigger problem, Kira, is actually on the GOP side in the House. There are a lot of Ukraine skeptics in Speaker Johnson's conference. They're saying they don't like this plan. And for the first time in a while, we actually see a second Republican coming out and saying he wants Speaker Johnson to resign. Now, our Rachel Scott caught up with the Speaker a few hours ago and listened to what he had to say. Uh, I am not resigning, and it is, uh, it is, in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion, and we are simply here trying to do our jobs. Um, it is not helpful to the cause. It is not helpful to the country. Now, a lot of people are going to be watching uh, President Donald Trump and what he says about Speaker Johnson. Just a couple of days ago, Johnson was down at Mar-a-Lago, and the former president said, I stand with the speaker. He was pushing back behind the scenes on this effort to oust Johnson. Now, however, we have some reporting at ABC News uh, that the former president is actually upset with some things Johnson said on television this weekend. So if he doesn't have cover from the former president, his job and his gavel could very much be in jeopardy, Kira. All right, Josh, Rachel, thank you both so much. And more severe weather on the move, threatening millions of Americans from coast to coast. Colorado getting slammed by a powerful spring storm, wind and near whiteout conditions ravaging the slopes of popular ski resorts now. In Virginia, strong storms there triggering lightning, heavy rain, also making for dangerous road conditions. The extreme weather prompting alerts from Wisconsin to Arkansas and a tornado watch has now been issued from Kansas City to Des Moines. Our meteorologist Samara Theodore is tracking it all for us. Samara, I'll tell you what, it's a day of wild weather across the country. That's right, Kira. Severe weather season is kicking in a high gear today as we have lines of storms, rain slicing through parts of Missouri, Iowa, Illinois. As a result, the entire region in yellow is under a tornado watch as we could see the greatest threat for tornadoes right there where uh, we saw in the areas in yellow. So see, looking at the timestamp here, 9 p.m., this is showing us where the storms could be setting up and situated later this evening. So they'll continue to pass through Iowa and Missouri, and you'll see that threat for severe weather becomes more elevated in cities like Chicago tonight and far eastern portions of Illinois. Here Here's a look at the highest tornado threat. So it's in that zone we just talked about there in that orange. But please note that we could still see tornadoes as far south as Springfield and St. Louis uh, and as far north as just south of La Crosse. What happens next is this line of severe weather makes its way east into parts of the Ohio Valley, sweeping across many of the Great Lakes states. And tomorrow we end up with a threat for damaging wind, large hail, maybe even a few tornadoes from Lansing and Detroit down to Cincinnati and Evansville. This includes cities like Colum uh, Columbus, Cleveland, and Indianapolis. So keep that in mind for your Wednesday evening. While things are quiet now, your turn at getting these storms rolls in tomorrow afternoon. And then something that's just helping to feed a lot of these storms, the warm air. You know, we see a lot of energy from uh, the heat supplied to these storms. 10 to 20 degrees above normal throughout much of the city. Uh, in fact, we did hit some records yesterday in Louisville, Kentucky, that had 88 degrees. So we've got the heat firing off the storms. Kira? All right, Samara, thank you so much. Coming up, the Supreme Court backs Idaho on its ban on gender-affirming care for minors, how that ruling could affect other states next. Whenever news breaks, 
We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. So the Supreme Court just concluded arguments today in a major case from the January 6th attack on the Capitol that could invalidate felony obstruction charges for more than 300 people connected to that attack, including former President Donald Trump. This comes as the Supreme Court is also allowing Idaho to enforce its ban on gender-affirming care for minors. Let's bring in our Devin Dwyer for all the details on both of the court's deeply divided cases. Devin, how does this affect former President Trump and his current legal proceedings, you think? A uh, high stakes case t today, Kira, no question about it, impacting Donald Trump, but also, as you said, there are 300 or more defendants involved with the January 6th attacks. The court today was trying to decide whether a federal law that was enacted after the Enron scandal, dealing with financial crimes and documents and the like, can be applied to put some of these alleged January 6th rioters behind bars for as long as 20 years. Federal prosecutors say the language in the law is extremely broad. The defense attorney in this case a former, uh, for a former Pennsylvania police officer who's been charged says actually that's too broad, too broad of an interpretation. It can't be used against these defendants. Uh, the Supreme Court was pretty skeptical of the government's argument today, Kira. They seemed inclined to roll back the interpretation in some way. That could mean lesser sentences, reduced sentences, uh, overturned convictions perhaps in some of these cases on this particular charge. And it could also mean potentially um, that we would see special counsel Jack Smith have to retool his case against Donald Trump because two of the four federal election interference charges against Trump come under the same law that the Supreme Court was looking at today, Kira. All right, so turning to Idaho now, what are the details on the ruling? And let's talk about the significance of it. Well, the Supreme Court yesterday simply said that they can, Idaho can enforce this law while litigation continues. They did not weigh in on the merits. They didn't take a position on the constitutionality of Idaho's gender-affirming care ban at all. Uh, but effectively, it means that I, Idaho can now join more than 20 other states that have these severe restrictions on things like hormone therapies and the like uh, for teenagers. And that is a really big deal if you're, uh, if you're one of those teenagers, of course, or the family families in these states. You see them on the screen. Uh, but we should say, Kira, that it's not the final word. The Supreme Court uh, and the three liberal justices who dissented yesterday, they said they would have let the law uh, remain on hold while this continues to play out, uh, had the full expectation uh, that this case will come back to the Supreme Court on the merits at some point in the future. And how do you think the ruling could maybe impact other states? Could, it, could we see a domino effect here with this ruling in Idaho? 
Not just yet, Kira. Uh, yesterday's decision was simply on whether the law can be enforced during the litigation. It didn't have a broad application to other states because the Supreme Court didn't weigh in on those merits. Uh, but down the line, this could have a ripple effect and encourage other states uh, to take similar, uh, take similar measures. Very controversial issue, as you know, in the Supreme Court just beginning to dip its toe into these, uh, into these matters. Kira? All right. Devin, thanks. You bet. And coming up, a bishop stabbed mid-sermon, and it's all caught on live stream. What may be behind the attack next? What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operation, sir? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from the tarmac of LaGuardia Airport, I'm Trevor Alt. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Some other top headlines we're tracking for you this hour on ABC News Live. Australia's second knife attack now being investigated as an act of terrorism. A bishop is stabbed mid-sermon, and it's all caught on a live stream. Now a 16-year-old is in custody after being restrained by members of the Assyrian Church. Authorities say that bishop and the parish priest were taken to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Well, outrage out west after the University of Southern California barred its valedictorian from speaking at its commencement ceremony. The school says it canceled the speech due to safety concerns and the intensity of feelings over the situation in the Middle East. Others are calling it an act of censorship because Asna Tebassum has shared pro-Palestinian views online and was accused by pro Israel groups of being anti-Semitic. The Council on American Islamic Relations called the decision cowardly and demanded that the school change course. Glad you're streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Today on ABC News Live. The head-on collision of Donald Trump's legal problems and his presidential ambitions happening right now in a New York courtroom. We are only one day, or actually in our second day of jury selection now, and the presumptive Republican nominee is already calling Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels sleazebags. The Manhattan DA's office saying that it violates the judge's limited gag order, and now it's filed a formal request to hold Trump in contempt. This hush money case already making history as this is the first time a former president has stood trial on criminal charges and the proceedings are already proving challenging. Not one juror still seated after an entire first day of filtering through that pool of New Yorkers. And now prosecutors are asking the court to hold Trump in contempt over recent social media posts saying that the former president violated the judge's gag order, preventing him from attacking witnesses like Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen. Trump is, of course, on trial for 34 counts of allegedly falsifying documents to hide payments he made to the porn star through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. We have team coverage now and leading us off, senior uh, reporter Catherine Falters, also executive editorial producer John Santucci, our legal contributor and trial attorney Brian Buckmeyer, also with us right now. So what's the latest from court right now, Catherine? Still going through this jury pool. Of course, there's a lunch break right now, but uh, they've been asked questions by the lawyers. That's the latest. And uh, there was a really great uh, note from our colleague inside uh, the courthouse, Luke Brueggemann, who uh, laid out what they're being asked inside that courtroom. Now, remember, they're sitting there with former President Trump. Uh, what do you make of Trump? A lot of these uh, jurors were asked. Some said that he speaks his mind. Others say they found him fascinating and mysterious, uh, that he stirs the pot, uh, according to one juror. So those are the types of questions they're being asked. Now, of course, they're on a lunch break. When they come back, then we'll see uh, this process progress where uh, the, both sides will have the opportunity to strike jurors for cause, jurors they don't think, in their words, will be fair to the former president. So that's the process that we'll see next when they return. So, Brian, one of Trump's main arguments here is that the falsifying of business records needs to have an underlying crime. Is that correct? So let's talk about what the DA is going to have to prove here. So that is correct if you're thinking about the falsification of documents as an e-felony, which Donald Trump is facing 34 accounts of. You need to have the intent to defraud uh, while either committing or trying to aid and abet a crime. Here, I think what Alvin Bragg's argument is, is that there are FEC violations. And part of Donald Trump's argument is that the FEC did investigate this case and came out with a report, I believe, December of 2020. And the 
way that it works is there's a commission of six um, individuals, three Republican, three Democrats, and then two and two voted um, to investigate, two and voted not to investigate, one abstained and one didn't vote. But basically they said there has reason to believe that there's a violation, but through prosecutorial discretion, they decided not to go forward. So in Donald Trump's mind, that's no crime. But for Alvin Bragg, he's got to prove that while the FEC wouldn't move forward, he found an actual crime that Donald Trump was trying to cover up in these false business records. So John Trump is already asking Judge Mershon for permission to skip trial dates, but the judge isn't making any special exceptions, even if it is Barron's high school graduation. High school graduation, a hearing at the Supreme Court, potato, potato. I mean, it's really interesting. You know, what Donald Trump has to wake up and realize here is that he is a criminal defendant. I think it's remarkable that for Donald Trump, who's been alive, you know, seven decades, this might be the first time in his entire life that he is in a situation where somebody else is setting the rules of the road, what he can do, can't do, where he can go, can't go. And I think that's just remarkable in all of this. You know, he had lobbied the court yesterday to go to the Supreme Court arguments next Thursday in Washington, D.C., obviously, where the Supreme Court is in your city, Kira. Of course, that is the case uh, where presidential immunity is the question regarding the special counsel Jack Smith investigation. Trump said he wanted to go. Judge turned around and said, listen, you're a defendant here. This is a criminal trial in New York County. You will be here. Now, obviously, you mentioned the graduation, and there's going to be more of this, quite literally, because the political calendar and the campaign calendar are going to quickly collide. But the reality is Donald Trump is a defendant. So for however long this case goes, one thing seems to be clear. He's going to be in New York. Well, Catherine, with the court now on lunch break, uh, what can we expect the rest of the day? Well, so they will come back. There will be strikes of potential jurors that they don't want on the jury. And then there's six more jurors from that original jury pool to be sworn in. Uh, it doesn't really end there after they're sworn in in question. The judge has indicated that he wants to swear in an additional pool of jurors. So uh, we could see that happen soon, likely to go all day, Kira. All right, and Brian, the prosecution accusing Donald Trump of violating this gag order as well. The judge is holding a hearing next week. Why wait a week? I think the judge really just wants to get this jury situated. He wants to uh, kind of keep the ball moving towards getting uh, a fresh batch of prospective jurors, sorry, then asking them disqualifying questions, then having the attorneys um, kind of make their arguments for for cause or a peremptory challenges to find them. And then once he finds a jury, maybe once this process has kind of moved along, then he'll be like, okay, of course there are housekeeping issues we need to discuss. Let's get into that now. And John Trump uh, complains about having to be in court for this trial, saying it's keeping him from campaigning, but he just turns these into campaign events, and so far it's working for him. It's definitely working for him, but I think the difference between what has been and what is now is very important, right? In the past, Donald Trump, when he would bop into court, was during civil proceedings, where he could basically pick and choose when he wanted to be there, not be there. As we were just talking about a second ago, Kira, new world order here. This is criminal court. Donald Trump has to be there every single day. So the idea of running to the West Coast and doing a fundraising spree cannot happen right now. It does make it difficult to, you know, agree a little bit here with what Trump is saying to actually be out there on the campaign trail. Now, again, it doesn't matter. These are criminal charges. These are 34 felony counts the former president faces. And while this is, in fact, moving, he has to be in New York. All right, John, Brian, Aaron, thank you, and Catherine, thank you. It's not just Donald Trump's criminal trial that's making history, but we are also following a historic impeachment on Capitol Hill. Following a nearly year-long investigation, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas facing a trial of his own after the House narrowly voted to impeach him in February over his handling of the southern border. Impeachment managers will now walk those articles of impeachment over to the Senate chamber. Our Jay O'Brien is on Capitol Hill following it all for us. So House managers are pretty close to, to walking the articles over to the Senate chamber. So just kind of tell us what we're going to see and how close will we be able to watch the pomp and circumstance. 
They're just about an hour away if the trains run on time here on Capitol Hill, which uh, you and I know if we had a nickel for every time the trains ran on time up here, we'd be broke. Um, but about an hour away, we're thinking. We have an interesting map that I do want to pull up for you because it does show you the path of all of this. The House impeachment managers will walk from the House floor. You see it there detailed on your screen. They walk from the House chamber all through the Capitol underneath the rotunda to present the articles of impeachment to the Senate floor. Remember this pomp and circumstance from the two Trump impeachments as well. The impeachment managers this time around are Republicans. They were Democrats during the Trump impeachments. Uh, they will be the chair of the Homeland Security Committee, which brought this resolution. Uh, you see there their names. Mike McCall will be there as well. And also look at that list right at the end there. Marjorie Taylor Greene will be one of these impeachment managers. It was a long time goal of hers to impeach Secretary Mayorkas, which House Republicans eventually did, making him only the second cabinet secretary in American history, Kira, to be impeached. He will also be only the second cabinet secretary in American history to have a trial on the Senate floor, unless, of course, as Democrats have signaled they might, the charges are dismissed early on in the procedural process once these articles reach the Senate floor. So it was nearly, what, a year's long investigation for Mayorkas. So why did the House ultimately choose to impeach him? So the argument that House Republicans made is that Mayorkas violated the law in the administration's approach to the crisis at the border. Particularly, the argument Republicans made is that it was a violation of law not to enact a widespread detention of migrants at the border. Practically every migrant that Border Patrol came across, House Republicans argued, they should have been detained. What DHS argues is that this is a political impeachment and that Republicans are weaponizing policy disagreements rather than actual high crimes and misdemeanors. And one of the defenses that the Department of Homeland Security puts up is that every Republic, every single Homeland Security Secretary, Republican or Democrat over the last few decades should be impeached under this reasoning as well. And so that's the argument that you're likely to hear Democrats make who control the Senate when these articles of impeachment are ultimately brought over to that chamber. And the question is, how quickly can Chuck Schumer move to dismiss these charges because he has signaled that he wants to act fast to get this off the Senate's calendar, Kira? All right, well, we've talked about this. I mean, it's almost dead on, upon arrival uh, once the articles reach the Senate. So why are House Republicans, what exactly, I guess, are House Republicans gaining from this, you know, in addition to a lot of uh, media attention? Well, that's one of the things that they are gaining. And, and frankly, when House Republicans came into office, when they took back the House in the previous midterm elections, we already heard members say that they wanted to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas. And those calls only grew as the situation at the U.S. southern border worsened. So there was this clamor amongst House Republican members that they wanted this done. And this effort to investigate Mayorkas began under Speaker McCarthy and Speaker Johnson only increase these efforts. And Marjorie Taylor Greene made several attempts on the House floor to do this. So this was something that Republican leadership and frankly promised its members would be done. And so when that was eventually brought to the House floor, it was something that House Republicans wanted to use to say to their base, look what we've done. Look at the political win that we have scored here. Remember, though, the first attempt to impeach Mayorkas failed on the House floor, Kira. It, three Republicans voted against it, two of whom are no longer in Congress, or one of whom is no longer in Congress, and one of whom is leaving, Ken Buck and Mike Gallagher. And then Republicans had to take another vote at this when they had the attendance to finally pass this and put it over the goal line. But nonetheless, even in a press conference earlier today, Republicans are saying that this is a win, this is a policy priority of theirs that they have accomplished, and they are going to kick this over to the Senate, but they are under no illusion that the Senate is going to make quick work of this. All right, Joe O'Brien up on the Hill. Let us know when things get started. Appreciate it. Israel's war cabinet behind closed doors yet again today, mulling how to respond to Iran's weekend attack. Israel's Minister of Defense saying that the IDF will retaliate, but not at saying exactly when or how. And then Iran, well, any retaliation, uh, they say, will be met with severe, widespread, and painful response. President Biden, along with other world leaders, urging restraint, saying that if Israel strikes back, it will do so alone. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen saying that the U.S. will not hesitate to issue new sanctions on Iran. Let's bring in our foreign correspondent, Tom Sufi Burridge, who's there on the scene in Tel Aviv. So what are we hearing about today's cabinet meeting, Tom? 
Yeah, Kieran, no word still on whether the Israeli war cabinet has reached a decision and what that potential decision could be. What we have done today is speak to two former senior Israeli military officers, very high-ranking officers in their day. And both of them were, were in agreement that Israel should not launch a direct military strike against Israel. Iranian territory. They both feel that this is an opportunity for Israel. Remember, before this Iranian strike, Israel looked pretty isolated in terms of the war in Gaza. Suddenly, you had that in incredible coalition, including Arab nations, led by the US, rallying around Israel uh, over the weekend, ensuring that, that its defence was pretty resolute and solid uh, in that mass uh, air attack by Iran. And, and they believe that now the focus for Israel should be going after Iranian proxies in the region, uh, namely Hezbollah, one of those former Israeli military officers, saying that basically Israel should give Hezbollah an ultimatum. And that ultimatum should be basically back down, stop the attacks on the northern border. We've seen again more evidence of that today. It's been pretty perpetual ever since the October 7th terror attack. And, and really the ultimatum should be to Hezbollah in this uh, former military officer's opinion is back down, move away, let those Israeli uh, populations move back to that border area or else, or else we'll go to full war uh, against Hezbollah and against really the entire country of Lebanon in his opinion. So what exactly does a retaliation from Israel look like? I mean, we know what the impact could be, but it, it depends on what strategy they take here. Yeah, exactly. It could be a direct military strike against Iranian territory. That would be a high-stakes move. Uh, that is what some hardline elements in Netanyahu's government are advocating for. Uh, they believe that that is needed to deter Iran and its partners for, from future attacks. But the two former military officers we spoke to today say that you can still deter without that direct military strike. And, and one of them said you not only can go after the proxies in the region, you could launch a more covert strike against Iranian territory. I asked... You know, does he mean a cyber attack? He said that that would be one form, but what he wouldn't go into, and we're talking about a former major general in the Israeli military, he is obviously privy to top secret stuff which he could not talk about. He said effectively that Israel has other, other options at its disposal, other ways of hitting Iran. Uh, we're not talking about some kind of military strike here, but hitting Iran in a way that would be more covert more difficult for Iran to respond and, and probably, I, I'm speculating here, but probably the fingerprints of Israel would be much harder to pinpoint on that type of attack. All right, our foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burge for us there in Tel Aviv. Tom, thank you. And more severe weather on the move, threatening millions of Americans from coast to coast. Now, Colorado getting slammed by a powerful spring storm, wind and near whiteout conditions, ravaging the slopes of popular ski resorts as well. And then in Virginia, strong storms triggering lightning, heavy rain, also making for dangerous road conditions. The extreme weather also prompting alerts from Wisconsin to Arkansas. And a tornado watch has now been issued from Kansas City to Des Moines. Our Samara, Samara Theodore has been tracking it all for us. Where shall we begin? Well, we've already had three tornadoes reported. We had one in Missouri, Iowa, and Nebraska. And now we remain under tornado watch. The threat has shifted a little bit farther east. So we have a tornado watch now including parts of western Illinois, pretty much almost the entire state of Iowa, Des Moines there. So this is through this afternoon and evening, and you can see what's happening. This line of storms is sweeping east, uh, and it's moving into states like Wisconsin and Illinois, and it's bringing with it the threat for tornadoes tonight. So if you live farther east in Chicago, your severe thunderstorms are going to pop up a little bit later this evening. For now, though, we still have that hot spot with the highest tornado threat sitting right over Iowa, uh, western Illinois, and northern Missouri. But we could see tornadoes as far south as Springfield. Large hail, damaging winds, these storms bringing the whole gamut with them. Now, tomorrow, these storms shift farther east. So then we see them sweep across the state of Michigan and push into Ohio and far western Pennsylvania. The threat for severe weather is in the zone in yellow, and that includes Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, Detroit. Hello, Cincinnati, Cleveland. Know that tomorrow evening, your ride home from work, going to dinner, running to the grocery store after work, could be impacted by severe thunderstorms, and there is a threat for some tornadoes tomorrow. Meanwhile, we've been talking about how warm things are. Of course, that heat only helping to exacerbate the situation and energize these thunderstorms. We're sitting 10 to 20 degrees above normal through this afternoon. High temperatures in places like Laredo, Texas, could be as high as 95 degrees. Kira? All right, Samara, thank you. 
And coming up, the Supreme Court backing Idaho on its ban on gender-affirming care for minors, how that ruling could impact other states next. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Their reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a pair, in it? How important made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. Ismael. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. So the Supreme Court just concluded arguments today in a major case from the January 6th attack on the Capitol that could invalidate felony obstruction charges for more than 300 people connected to that attack, including former President Donald Trump. This comes as the Supreme Court is also allowing Idaho to enforce its ban on gender-affirming care for minors. Let's bring in our Devin Dwyer for all the details on both of the court's deeply divided cases. Devin, how does this affect former President Trump and his current legal proceedings, you think? A uh, high stakes case t today, Kira, no question about it, impacting Donald Trump, but also, as you said, there are 300 or more defendants involved with the January 6th attacks. The court today was trying to decide whether a federal law that was enacted after the Enron scandal, dealing with financial crimes and documents and the like, can be applied to put some of these alleged January 6th rioters behind bars for as long as 20 years. Federal prosecutors say the language in the law is extremely broad. The defense attorney in this case a former, uh, for a former Pennsylvania police officer who's been charged says actually that's too broad, too broad of an interpretation. It can't be used against these defendants. Uh, the Supreme Court was pretty skeptical of the government's argument today, Kira. They seemed inclined to roll back the interpretation in some way. That could mean lesser sentences, reduced sentences, uh, overturned convictions perhaps in some of these cases on this particular charge. And it could also mean potentially um, that we would see special counsel Jack Smith have to retool his case against Donald Trump because two of the four federal election interference charges against Trump come under the same law that the Supreme Court was looking at today, Kira. All right, so turning to Idaho now, what are the details on the ruling and let's talk about the significance of it. Well, the Supreme Court yesterday simply said that they can, Idaho can enforce this law while litigation continues. They did not weigh in on the merits. They didn't take a position on the constitutionality of Idaho's gender-affirming care ban at all. Uh, but effectively, it means that I, Idaho can now join more than 20 other states that have these severe restrictions on things like hormone therapies and the like uh, for teenagers. And that is a really big deal if you're, uh, if you're one of those teenagers, of course, or the family families in these states, you see them on the screen. Uh, but we should say, Kira, that it's not the final word. The Supreme Court uh, and the three liberal justices who dissented yesterday, they said they would have let the law uh, remain on hold while this continues to play out, uh, had the full expectation uh, that this case will come back to the Supreme Court on the merits at some point in the future. And how do you think the ruling could maybe impact other states? Could, it, could we see a domino effect here with this ruling in Idaho? 
Not just yet, Kira. Uh, yesterday's decision was simply on whether the law can be enforced during the litigation. It didn't have a broad application to other states because the Supreme Court didn't weigh in on those merits. Uh, but down the line, this could have a ripple effect and encourage other states uh, to take similar, uh, take similar measures. Very controversial issue, as you know, and the Supreme Court just beginning to dip its toe into these, uh, into these matters. Kira? All right. Devin, thanks. You bet. And coming up, a bishop stabbed mid-sermon, and it's all caught on live stream. What may be behind the attack next? What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a pair, in it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's Mael. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's ray of sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because... You know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. <laughs> It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Some other top headlines we're tracking for you this hour on ABC News Live. Australia's second knife attack now being investigated as an act of terrorism. A bishop is stabbed mid-sermon, and it's all caught on a live stream. Now a 16-year-old is in custody after being restrained by members of the Assyrian Church. Authorities say that bishop and the parish priest were taken to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Well, outrage out west after the University of Southern California barred its valedictorian from speaking at its commencement ceremony. The school says it canceled the speech due to safety concerns and the intensity of feelings over the situation in the Middle East. Others are calling it an act of censorship because Asna Tebassum has shared pro-Palestinian views online and was accused by pro Israel groups of being anti-Semitic. The Council on American Islamic Relations called the decision cowardly and demanded that the school change course. Glad you're streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back.
What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. This is our combat operations center. We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. What you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us after news. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families. On the ground in Ukraine. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Reporting from Miami, Florida, I'm Victor Okendo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Today on ABC News Live, targeting witnesses before they even testify. We're only in day two of jury selection, and Donald Trump is already calling Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels sleazebags. And he's violating the judge's limited gag order and now forcing the Manhattan DA's office to file a formal request to actually hold Trump in contempt. This hush money case already making history, as this is the first time a former president has stood trial on criminal charges, and the proceedings already proving to be challenging. Not one juror seated after an entire first day of filtering through the pool of New Yorkers. At least 50 of them excused after raising their hand, claiming that they just couldn't be fair or impartial. This case, years in the making, and all stemming from those allegations that Trump made hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels just prior to the 2016 election in an effort to conceal an alleged affair. This is the first of four criminal cases involving Donald Trump to go to trial as he continues to make his bid to return to the White House. We have team coverage with our senior investigative correspondent, Livia Rubin, outside the courthouse. She joins me along with executive editorial producer John Santucci and our legal contributor and trial attorney, Brian Buckmeyer. Olivia, why is jury selection moving at such a slow pace? Well, Kira, they have a lot to get to and a lot to tease out of these jurors. And I think one thing that is really contributing to the length of this process is the questionnaire that each juror is filling out one by one by one, or I should say answering one by one in the courtroom uh, in front of Donald Trump. So just to sort of put in a picture of how this is working, they're bringing in one panel of jurors. Remember, we started with 96. The judge is giving them pre-instructions, uh, which took about another 30 minutes. Then some of them dismissed themselves. Everyone knows the number. About 50 took themselves out. And then it left with about 50 to tick through the juror questionnaire one by one. And then you go into the individual questioning. So there's a lot to do there. And I'm reminded of the process when uh, they were picking the jury for Donald Trump's civil E. Jean Carroll case, which again, a lot less on the line there. It's civil. It's not a criminal case. But what they did that was different was it wasn't that one by one process of having every juror answer the questionnaire. So I think that is 
it is what is taking up a lot of the time here. But it does seem, and you know, we'll have to see which way Judge Marchand takes it. It does seem like after this lunch break, which is ending any minute now, they are going to start getting into striking some of these jurors because it appears that Todd Blanche, Trump's attorney, and Joshua Steinglass, the prosecutor, each finished their questioning of the 18 jurors that were in the room. So now they each have an opportunity to strike who they did not like, and then you would go into the next batch. So potential here after this lunch break to move the process forward a little bit there. Brian, how long do you think this could take? And tell us more about these questionnaires and just the type of questions and why this is becoming a bit challenging day two. Here in my mind, thinking that we're only going to be in court four days a week, I can see us not going just into next week, but the following week. We're going to continue to follow that process that Olivia so eloquently laid out for us of trying to whittle down a large group, first with the judges' orders and instructions. They self-select themselves out. Then you're going through the peremptory challenges and forecast challenges. Both are two different types of strikes. Uh, but what I will say is in terms of why it's taking so long is this is the process. We in the criminal justice system, especially in New York City and the courts that I've been in, we really want to make sure we get it right. That if someone's liberty is on the line, that there's not a single juror that is biased, there's not a, a single juror that has an opinion that we think can taint the jury. Uh, because we want to make sure that if we're going to take someone's liberty or give them a felony conviction, like what might could what might possibly could happen here with Donald Trump, that you get it right. Because of course, if you get it wrong, there's a conviction. There's also the appeals just take forever. So this is just kind of the, the method that we choose. So apparently Trump may give another little speech outside the courtroom. He's been doing this uh, more than once. Is that a good idea, Brian? Um, let's put it this way. If, if you're a, a political pundit or you're, or you're, or you're trying to get him reelected, maybe. Uh, I mean, John will be better at that aspect in terms of telling us how he takes the kind of courthouse and turns it into a podium and gets more people looking to elect him. But from an attorney, and that's how my mind is focused on this, that is horrible. If I had any ability to control Donald Trump and I was his attorney, I would be pulling him into the courtroom saying, we don't have to make these comments. I don't want you out there saying this was a legal expense because that might not be our defense when we start opening statements. And so you want to ensure uh, that these comments that are made outside the courtroom about the case are in line with what you're going to argue because sometimes your client can be the worst, uh, worst, worst witness before they even take the stand. John, you and I have been there before. Trump's attorney is not always happy with the fact that he just decides to talk at any moment. Yeah, good luck trying to control him. I think anybody that has tried has failed, and ultimately uh, Donald Trump's most infamous words has been fired, or sometimes they just quit. Look, I, I, I think the the damage here for Donald Trump is pretty clear in the sense that, you know, we know next week we're going to have a hearing about this effort by prosecutors to say he violated the gag order on three occasions, not because of what he said, but because what he, I don't know, guys, somebody help me, the verb for truthed, uh, I don't know, I guess it's just post posted on Truth Social, but that, that's really what, what the problem is here, that, you know, what Donald Trump uh, wrote about Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen is going to cause the problems. Now, they're going to tell him to stop. He's probably not, but eventually, if it gets to more money or the idea that, hey, you keep doing this, you're held in contempt of court, you get thrown in jail, that could turn him off. That would be something that would make Donald Trump potentially stop, but I don't think we're there just yet. So, Olivia, the judge denied any request from uh, d the defense, in particular Todd Blanche, to excuse Trump from attending his presidential immunity case before the U.S. Supreme Court. And he also th said that he's going to decide on whether to let Trump go to his son's uh, high school graduation. Barron is about to graduate from high school. I can't believe we're already there. It seems like he was just a little boy yesterday. But, you know, Trump was coming forward saying, ah, the judge isn't letting me go anywhere. I'm going to miss my son's high school graduation. That's just not simply true, right? The judge is still considering the high school graduation. Exactly. It's not true. The judge did not say, no, you cannot go to your son's graduation. He said that's not something that we can decide right now because of the point that we're at in trial. And we actually went back and looked at this part of the transcript last night because we wanted to be sure that, you know, everyone was understanding what Juan Marchand, the judge, said on that instance. And he has not made a ruling on that. But he did say that Donald Trump could not go to the Supreme Court arguments. He said that you are a criminal defendant here. You do not have to be there, but you 
you do have to be here. And I think John Santucci put it best yesterday when he was describing that Donald Trump is likely learning a very hard lesson in this trial, which is that he does not get to set his own schedule and he does not get to make his own decisions anymore about where he is going and when. All right, Olivia, John, Brian, thank you all so much. We'll continue to follow a jury selection. And it's not just Donald Trump's criminal trial that's making history, but we are also following a historic impeachment on Capitol Hill. Following a nearly year-long investigation, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas faces a trial of his own after the House narrowly voted to impeach him in February over his handling of the southern border. Impeachment managers will now walk those articles of impeachment over to the Senate chamber and we will have live coverage of that as soon as it begins. But while we wait, senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott is up on the hill there along with our Jay O'Brien and also former assistant uh, for public affairs at the Department of Homeland Security, Marcia Espinosa. So, Jay, let's start with the walk. <laughs> uh, it could yeah. happen anytime this hour. Uh, tell us what we can expect. Yeah, it will happen after the House is done voting, which they are still doing. It's one of the reasons why Rachel is outside trying to grab members of Congress to talk to them after votes. Um, but the walk starts from the House side of the Capitol, goes to the other side of the Capitol in the Senate, and it is a ceremony. You saw it during the previous two Trump impeachments. It is formal. In this case, the impeachment managers walking these articles of impeachment over will be Republicans. They were Democrats during the Trump impeachments. They will be committee chairs like Mark Green and Mike McCall, the chairs of the Homeland Security and Foreign Affairs Committee, but they'll also include Marjorie Taylor Greene, who made it her mission over the last few months in Congress to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas. It is a demonstration that hardliners in the House GOP wanted this done. They put pressure on Mike Johnson and Republican leadership to deliver this. And finally, after one failed vote, Republicans were able to get this over the goal line and finally kick this procedure over into the Senate where it begins today. Kira. So, Rachel, you just spoke with Speaker Johnson about this renewed threat to, to oust him. What did he say? Yeah, Speaker Johnson is defiant in the face of now yet another Republican calling to oust him from the speakership. Take a listen to what he told me when I asked him to respond to these Republicans who say that he should be gone. Uh, I am not resigning, and it is uh, it is in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion. And we are simply here trying to do our jobs. Um, it is not helpful to the cause. It is not helpful to the country. All right, so first it was Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. We saw that as Johnson made a move to keep the government funded. Now it is Congressman Massey who has come forward as Speaker Johnson has unveiled a new plan to provide additional aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. And what he's really doing here is he's taking that massive package that's over in the Senate that passed with bipartisan support, all of that folded into one, and he's separating it into four different bills. So one for each issue, with that final bill really becoming sort of a Republican wish list with conservative policies that they want to get across the finish line. The red line for some of these Republicans, though, has to do with Ukraine aid. And you heard Jay talk there about Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, how she really pushed Speaker Johnson to, you know, move forward with the vote to impeach the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. And so even though Johnson has caved to a lot of the far right demands from people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, in the end, it's not enough. They are still saying that he should not put out any bill on the floor that provides additional funding to Ukraine, that they are against that. And now they are saying that he should lose his job over that. Johnson is faced with a razor thin majority here right now. He can only afford to lose two votes if they do move forward with this motion to vacate the speakership. On the third vote, he would be gone. We are starting to hear from some Democrats, though, who are expressing some willingness to save him to avoid the House from being paralyzed and thrust into chaos. You know, Rachel, while we have you and, you know, you're following uh, clearly the impeachment proceedings surrounding Alejandro mm -hmm. Mayorkas, and then there's this other yep. uh, separate effort uh, to, to, to boot the House Speaker. 
why do you think mm -hmm. things have turned to, okay, we just don't like what you're doing, so we're just going to get rid of you. Let's just yeah. do everything we can ju just to boot you out instead of, you know, Democrats and Republicans coming together and, and looking yeah. at, at, at the issue, whether it's Ukraine aid or it's the border crisis, and, and just try and figure mm -hmm. this out. Do your job. Represent your yeah. constituents. Um, it, it's like we've lost the debate and the solutions, and now everybody jumps on this bandwagon just to, eh, let's just get rid of them. Let's figure out ways to oust them. Yeah, you know, Kira, this is a really good question, and it's something that moderate Republicans told me that they were really afraid of when we first saw this push to oust the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, at the time. They were worried that this would open up the floodgates, and then any single time that someone was frustrated or mad about the Speaker moving forward in a way that they didn't agree with, that they would then threaten to try to oust them as well, and this would become a reoccurring saga. This is unusual. This is not supposed to be happening in the House of Representatives. It it is quite unusual to see Republicans or Democrats, even for the matter, push to oust someone in leadership. They are supposed to be working with their own speaker while they have the majority to get their priorities done and across the finish line. Of course, Republicans have control in the House. Democrats have the majority in the chamber. So how this works is that the two parties have to work together in order to get something across the finish line and to President Biden's desk for his signature. Compromise is the name of the game. And so when you have Republicans who are really really standing firm and drawing this really hard line saying they do not want to do this. That is exactly why we are seeing the problems here. And the second reason, Kira, is really just this razor thin majority, of course. Uh, this is what is prompting all of this. If Republicans had a 20 seat majority here in the House or 30 seat majority, then we wouldn't be seeing all of this. Sure, you'd have some frustrated members, but it wouldn't be to the level that it is now where you have some of the far right conservative members. They have so much power. And if you talk to moderates here on Capitol Hill, they'll tell you they don't agree with every Everything that Speaker Johnson is doing either. And so they're saying that they are now being put in a very precarious position because of these far right Republicans, Kira. Got it. All right. Thank you, Rachel. And, and Marsha, let me just take it to you now. Um, you are at the Department of Homeland Security. House Republicans are accusing Secretary Mayorkas of willfully and systematically refusing to enforce existing immigration laws. Let's just put things into perspective here. We had a crisis at the southern border well before Mayorkas got this gig. And, and at the same time, I want to address that there still is no proof of high crimes and misdemeanors. So from your experience at the Department of Homeland Security, what you saw, what you were a part of when it came to what's happening at the border, is it fair to throw all of this into the lap of Mayorkas? No, absolutely not. What this is, is political theater. This is a disagreement over policy that the House Republicans have with the administration. So, and in stark contrast today, Secretary Mayorkas, my former boss, was on the Hill testifying to get try to get more money for the Department of Homeland Security. He did that last week too. So he's continuing to work for the department. And he was, remember, he was at the table with the bipartisan group of folks trying to actually solve the uh, border situation that House Republicans refused to take up. So it seems like they just want to use uh, this very powerful tool of impeachment in order to get free publicity. And it, that is not what this should be used for. So I hope that the Senate today takes this up very quickly and then throws it right back because the Department of Homeland Security, Secretary Mario Chris, has a lot of work to be done. So I'm curious, have you, have you talked to your uh, your old boss? <laughs> yeah, you know, he's and, and he is continuing to to uh, do the work of of the department and its employees. One thing, you know, I've worked for uh, three different secretaries and this secretary has made the employees of the department his number one priority. That's his, you know, top of mind thing. I remember when the articles of impeachment first came to his desk and he acknowledged them. He asked a couple of questions and then he went right back to his next meeting. That's that's what he is all about. And he is actually trying to solve things. You know, this administration on day one sent Congress a bill to try to fix this and they never took it up. Um, they they, they want to use this as a talking point. They want to use it for the campaign because they Republicans see this as a winning issue for them. So they they don't seem to actually want to fix it and do what the department and its employees need. They just want to play politics with it. 
Well, it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. And then, uh, Marsha, maybe you can uh, bring uh, the secretary onto the show so we can have a conversation with the both of you. I would appreciate that. I know you've got the inside uh, gouge and connection. <laughs> so I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, Rachel, Marsha, Jay, thank you three so much. Really appreciate it. We'll follow everything, of course, as it happens probably uh, within the next 10 minutes or so. All right, Israel's war cabinet still meeting and still mulling over how it's going to respond to Iran's weekend attack. The Israeli Minister of Defense promising retaliation, but not saying when or how. Iran is saying that any retaliation will be met with a severe, widespread and painful response. But what does that mean? The U.S. is now talking about new sanctions for Iran. President Biden, along with other world leaders, they're continuing to urge against retaliation if Israel strikes back. And if that does happen, they've said, look, you're going to go at it alone. Once again, let's bring in our Josh Einiger. He's there in Jerusalem. He's been following this for us from uh, the very uh, beginning. Um, anything new this hour, Josh, with regard to what Israel has been discussing, what, three days in now in this war cabinet meeting? Three days in, Kira, and you know, it, it's, it, it's hard to know if you can derive any meaning from the fact that there still has not been any action. Israel has said uh, more than once, I mean, they say over and over again that they'll respond when, how, and, and where they choose to respond. And if you ask an Israeli military official about this, uh, the, the pressure that they're getting from overseas, from the White House, from people who are worried about a, uh, an escalation or that maybe they'll, they'll, they'll cause a wider war. They'll say, well, it was Iran that fired 300 plus missiles and drones and dozens of tons of, of uh, firepower at, at us. And so how are they supposed to respond? I asked point blank a uh, spokesperson for the IDF, you know, what do they do to minimize that escalation potential? And he said, well, if we just do nothing, all we're doing is kicking the can down the road and giving Iran the opportunity to do this again to us. And so it really does seem like they're ramping up to do something. Uh, there have been there's been chatter that what they're talking about doing is actually in the Iranian homeland, uh, which, of course, gives a lot of people the shivers because that is precisely what Iran says uh, would lead to an even more furious and lethal response. So we will, of course, just have to wait and see what they do. It could be any any day. That, that we see some action. And we're going to be staying in close touch with you, Josh Einiger there uh, for us in Jerusalem. Josh, thank you. And coming up, the Department of Justice getting ready to sue Live Nation. That's the country's largest ticketing website. What it could mean for your next concert next. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America this morning. America's number one early morning news on ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. 
I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. So glad you're streaming with us. Well, the Wall Street Journal is reporting now that the Department of Justice is getting ready to sue Live Nation, the country's largest concert promoter and ticketing website. The DOJ reportedly planning to file in the coming weeks, accusing the company of breaking America's antitrust laws. You might remember the November 2022 fan presale fiasco involving Taylor Swift's Eras Tour. And that's when the DOJ actually started digging into Live Nation's size and power and ticketing and concert promotion and also venues. Our business correspondent, Alexis Christophorus, has also been following the story and doing digging of her own. So Alexis, tell us more about the DOJ and, and how did Live Nation break these antitrust laws exactly? Well, there's still a lot we don't know yet because the lawsuit hasn't been filed and uh, the complaint has not been made public, Kira. But what we do know is the DOJ started really taking a good hard look at Live Nation, the parent company of Ticketmaster, about two years ago when it had that meltdown regarding the Taylor Swift era tour tickets when thousands of fans said they were shut out, uh, couldn't get access to those tickets. And so that's what led to an investigation. Last year, we saw some executives from Live Nation uh, go before lawmakers on the Hill to defend the company. They've been saying for years now, ever since um, Live Nation merged with Ticketmaster back in 2010, there have been critics who say this company is too large and has too much of a hold on ticket prices, ticket availability uh, at these different venues. All right, so how will the possible antitrust lawsuit impact you know, all of the fans out there hoping to buy tickets from Live Nation? Well, I think fans are going to have to wait a while uh, to see how all of this plays out. We haven't even gotten the complaint yet. But what's interesting here is, you know, what is the end game for the government? Uh, certainly critics, um, competitors like SeatGeek, another uh, ticketing company, have said that that Live Nation has a stronghold on the venues, although Live Nation says it does not and that it doesn't control ticket prices or the amount of tickets available at a venue. SeatGeek's CEO went before lawmakers last year and actually said, yes, in fact, there are venues out there who fear, those that's his word, fear not being able to do business with Live Nation if they don't take on Ticketmaster and all of its rules. So some are saying or, or are calling for Live Nation to be broken up, saying that it has it's a monopoly and that it um, it hurts antitrust laws here, and they've broken antitrust laws here in this country. So I think the end game for the government would be to see a much smaller company, not only with transparent more transparency, but breaking up the company uh, uh, at, at, in the long run. So we're just going to have to see in the coming weeks what this suit actually says, Kira. All right, we'll follow it. Appreciate it, Alexis. Thank you. Yep. And coming up, new clues as to what may have caused the Baltimore Bridge collapse. We've got the latest on the criminal investigation next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families trunk. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. 
wherever you get your podcasts. Start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting from Scranton, Pennsylvania, covering the winter storm, I'm Stephanie Ramos. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Some other top headlines we're tracking for you this hour on ABC News Live. New clues about what may have caused the Baltimore Bridge collapse. A criminal investigation is showing evidence that that cargo ship, Dolly, had electrical issues just before leaving port. And investigators say the ship did depart early, then lost power before striking the Francis Scott Key Bridge. That crash killing six road crew members, two of whom are still unaccounted for. A fire burning through a historic building in Denmark right now. It set 400 years of Danish heritage ablaze. People actually were seen running into the old Copenhagen Stock Exchange, attempting to salvage artwork and other valuable assets. The building's iconic spire collapsing as flames and smoke billowed out from the peak. No injuries, luckily, have been reported. Cloudy skies couldn't stop the lightning of the Olympic torch for the 2024 Paris Games. There it is. The ceremony taking place like it always does in the ancient Olympia in Greece. A parabolic mirror usually used to ignite the torch, but due to the gloomy weather, well, a backup torch was used instead. That's all right. The 68-day uh, relay is now underway. The big event is set to begin, as you know, July 26th. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops, and neither do we. We'll be right back. More news on the other side. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I watch do. you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Today on ABC News Live, the head-on collision of Donald Trump's legal problems and his presidential ambitions happening right now in a New York courtroom. We are only in day two of jury selection, and the presumptive Republican nominee is already calling Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels sleazebags. The Manhattan DA's office saying that that violates the judge's limited gag order, so now it's filed a formal request to hold Trump in contempt. Never a dull moment. This hush money case already Already making history as this is the first time a former president has stood trial on criminal charges and the proceedings are already proving to be challenging. Not one juror has been seated after an entire first day of filtering through that large pool of New Yorkers. We have team coverage leading us off. Our senior reporter, Catherine Falders, also legal contributor and trial attorney, Brian Buckmeyer. Uh, Catherine, let's start with you. Um, we were expecting Trump to address reporters. He decided not to. I wonder if he's getting reprimanded by his attorneys. 
<laughs> do we know anything? <laughs> Kira, it's a good question. I do know that uh, members of Trump's legal team would prefer that he not stop at that camera. So I would say that your guess is probably uh, spot on. That was probably it. I had some reporting uh, going into this trial that his legal team was worried about him speaking because of fears over him violating, potentially violating the gag order. So uh, that could be what's going on here. But I, I could pretty much guarantee that we probably will hear from Trump, whether it be after court concludes, whether he does another presser of some sort, whether it be at that camera as he did yesterday. But bottom line here is he's back in that courtroom after the lunch break. His lawyers will start striking potential jurors that they don't want on this jury. And who knows when we'll hear from him next. <laughs> well, uh, Brian, we did sort of hear from him. Trump shared this op-ed attacking Michael Cohen on True Social just hours after the prosecution filed this motion accusing him of violating the limited gag order. So does this move violate the gag order in any way? It appears to, because the limited gag order simply says that Donald Trump cannot attack potential witnesses, the judge, and his family, things of that nature. And you have this, this comment out there. And the only thing that I can see potentially being an argument is maybe Donald Trump is not the author of his own uh, social media. I mean, you know he's a, a popular figure. Maybe someone else is using it. But I think John Santucci would probably tell us that's not true. Uh, or there's going to be some pushback as to uh, whether or not this goes to the heart of actually making a threat or what kind of negative comment uh, he may have made and whether or not it's a violation of his First Amendment rights, something that we've heard him make uh, arguments for many times. And so I can see the argument for it. I can see why a judge would say, you know what, this is my final warning to you. Let's not do it again and move forward. Uh, only time will tell. I think the, the arguments are set for next week. So Catherine, any idea who could actually testify once we get through jury selection and who knows how long that could take now? Um, are we going to see the same faces we have seen over the years, Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, even Trump himself? What do you think? Well, Trump says he wants to testify, so potentially Trump himself. Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, we expect prosecutors to call them as well, so we will likely see them. Uh, we've also reported that we will likely see aides close to Trump, former aides in his inner circle, current aides in his inner circle, from his White House days to the Trump Organization days, his longtime secretary, Ronna Graff, who was there along his side for many, many, many years, essentially uh, on the sidelines for all of these important meetings, observing all sorts of things, we're told, may be called to testify. And then, of course, uh, senior officials of the Trump Organization, former, current, we could see them as well. It's unclear at this point. Uh, we'll have to see ultimately what prosecutors do down the line, but at least uh, that's what we expect, at least in terms of potential witnesses, along with members of Trump's family as well. So, Brian, one more question. Uh, you know, when it comes to Michael Cohen, I mean, it was years ago that I sat down and, and talked with him and he made it very public uh, about what he did with the bank accounts and facilitating, facilitating these payments to Stormy Daniels. So why are we where we are right now when he has already come forward and talked about exactly how things went down when it came to these hush money payments? I think the major difference would be that one is Michael Cohen sat down with you, a reporter, and gave what his, um, some attorneys might say, uh, opinion or his set of facts. It's a very different situation to have someone sit in a court of law, take an oath to tell the truth and tell it before a jury who's going to weigh that evidence uh, to the degree of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And I think what we're doing here is we're testing that through direct examination and cross-examination. But I, I think for the prosecution, the major component of this case is going to be corroboration, taking Michael Cohen's words and corroborating it with the movement of money. Because for the defense, Michael Cohen is a liar. He lied to, to reporters, he lied to courts, he lied to Congress. He did a five-year federal sentence for false statements and, and tax evasion. Why should you believe him? And I think as much as, as he is a star witness for the prosecution, he's going to be someone that the defense attorney is really going to try to beat up on in this case. But isn't it fair to say that, I mean, even covering 
Okay. All right. We're going to continue the conversation, guys, but I got to take us now over to Capitol Hill as we've been following Donald Trump's criminal trial that's making history. We're also following this historic impeachment uh, proceedings that are taking place on Capitol Hill uh, regarding Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Uh, this is the moment where we are seeing the articles of impeachment uh, the ceremonial process of walking them over to the Senate uh, chamber, House leaders carrying them uh, from one end of the building to the other. Jay O'Brien, can you hear me okay? Here and I'm watching this procession as well with you. So okay, great. the view that I think we are looking at is from the House, or from the Senate side, towards the house shooting through the rotunda so the impeachment managers are well on their walk here this is one of those kind of pomp and circumstance ceremonies where they take the articles that have already been passed by the house months ago over to the senate by the way you see marjorie taylor green there the blonde hair she's one of the impeachment managers over to the senate and that is what yeah, begins the process hair. in the senate these impeachment managers the people walking the articles over they will serve in theory in this trial as the kind of prosecutors. But unlike the Trump impeachment, where we saw that procedure play out on the floor where the impeachment managers served as prosecutors Tell and then who, the president Gwen. had lawyers who served as defense attorneys, um, that is not likely to play out here because Chuck Schumer, the leader of the Senate, the top Democrat in that chamber, has already indicated he wants to make quick work of these impeachment articles and, and perhaps even move to dismiss them quickly uh, once they reach the Senate floor. That could happen uh, as soon as tomorrow, Kira. All right, so uh, Jay, we have you there on the Hill for us. We also have Marcia Espinosa, who was at the Department of Homeland Security. Matter of fact, Mayorkas was her boss. Also joining us, our political director, Rick Klein, and Sel Selena Wang is also over there at the White House. You know, Marcia, since we have you, Mayorkas uh, was your boss. You worked with him. You know his work ethic. Uh, you know what it was like to be in the trenches there uh, working the border crisis. Just give us sort of an insight to what may be going through his mind, what is going through his mind, what he thinks of this. I know you are still close with him. Anything you are comfortable saying to basically give us just the inside feelings of this entire process as he still has to continue to do his job. Sure, and, and he was continuing to do his job just this morning. He was uh, in Congress testifying before uh, them asking for more funding for the department. And that is his work ethic. He he is focused on the workforce first and foremost. He knows that that this is just politics. This is political theater. In fact, you know, this this uh, what we're watching right now is exactly what they want. Free publicity for a policy disagreement that the House Republicans have. And they shouldn't be using impeachment, which is a very solemn tool uh, under the Constitution, for policy disagreements. And even Republicans have said that. So uh, if they really thought that this was a, a an, in the interest of our national security, why did House Republicans wait two months to send this over? And, and they were supposed to do it last week, too, and then kick the can down the road. It's because they want the best show. They want to use this issue for the campaign trail. They see it as a as a winning argument um, instead of actually coming to the table and fixing the problem at hand. And we've seen Secretary Mayor Mayorkas do that, actually. You know, he was part of that small group of bipartisan folks that were trying to come together to solve this issue. And it, ultimately, that failed as well. Um, he was on Congress it, before Congress last week and this morning fighting for his department, what he does best, and fighting for, for the workforce who desperately need more funding. You know, the Department of Homeland Security isn't just immigration and the border. We have TSA, we have Secret Service, FEMA, the Coast Guard, in addition to all of the immigration agencies as well. So we have to remember that. And he keeps that in mind every single day when he's fighting for them. So, Rick Klein, let me bring you in on that discussion then. Let's just go, you know, deeper into this overall situation, just kind of go underneath um, this Mayorkas uh, impeachment proceeding here and just talk about the deeper story of why this country um, can't solve this, this border mess. I mean, Democrats bear just as much responsibility as Republicans. All right, let's listen in. Hold that thought. We'll get back to you. Which have been preferred by the House of Representatives 
against Alejandro Nicolas Mayorkas, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. The House adopted the following resolution, which will, with permission of the Senate, I will read House Resolution 995. <clears throat> Resolved that Mr. Green of Tennessee, Mr. McCall, Mr. Biggs, Mr. Higgins of Louisiana, Mr. Klein, Mr. Guest, Mr. Garbarino, Ms. Green of Georgia, Mr. Pfluger, Ms. Hageman, and Ms. Lee of Florida are appointed managers to conduct the impeachment trial against Alejandro Nicolas Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security, that a message be sent to the Senate to inform the Senate of these appointments, and that the managers so appointed may, in connection with the preparation and the conduct of the trial, exhibit the articles of impeachment to the Senate and take all necessary actions, which may include the following. One, employing legal, clerical, and other necessary assistance, and incurring such other expenses as may be necessary to be paid from amounts available to the Committee on Homeland Security under applicable expense resolutions or for the applicable amounts of the House of Representatives. Two, sending for persons and papers and filing with the Secretary of the Senate on the part of the House of Representatives any pleadings in conjunction with or subsequent to the exhibition of the articles of impeachment that the managers consider necessary. With the permission of the Senate, I will now read the articles of impeachment, House Resolution 863. Resolved that Alejandro Nicolas Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security of the United States of America, is impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors, and that the following articles of impeachment be exhibited to the United States Senate. Articles of impeachment exhibited by the House of Representatives of the United States of America in the name of itself and the people of the United States of America against Alejandro N. Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security of the United States of America, in maintenance and support of its impeachment against him for high crimes and misdemeanors. Article 1, willful and systemic refusal to comply with the law. The Constitution provides that the House of Representatives, quote, shall have the sole power of impeachment, end quote, and that civil officers of the United States, including the Secretary of Homeland Security, quote, shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, end quote. In his conduct while Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro N. Mayorkas, in violation of his oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and to well and faithfully discharge the duties of his office, has willfully and systemically refused to comply with the federal immigration laws in that. Throughout his tenure as Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro N. Mayorkas has repeatedly violated laws enacted by Congress regarding immigration and border security. In large part because of his unlawful conduct, millions of aliens have illegally entered the United States on an annual basis, with many unlawfully remaining in the United States. His refusal to obey the law is not only an offense against the separation of powers in the Constitution of the United States, it also threatens our national security and, ha and has had a dire impact on communities across the country. Despite clear evidence that his willful and systemic refusal to comply with the law has significantly contributed to unprecedented levels of illegal immigrants' entrance, the increased control of the southwest border by drug cartels, and the imposition of enormous costs on states and localities affected by the influx of aliens, Alejandro N. Mayorkas has continued in his refusal to comply with the law and thereby acted to the grave detriment of the interests of the United States. Alejandro N. Mayorkas engaged in this scheme or course of conduct through the following means. One, Alejandro N. Mayorkas willfully refused to comply with the detention mandate set forth in Section 235B2A of the Immigration and Nationality Act requiring that all applicants for admission who are, quote, not clearly and beyond a doubt entitled to be admitted shall be detained for a removal proceeding, end quote. Instead of complying with this requirement, Alejandro N. Mayorkas implemented a catch and release scheme whereby such aliens were unlawfully released even without effective mechanisms to ensure appearance before the immigration courts for removal proceedings or to ensure removal 
in the case of aliens ordered removed. Two, Alejandro Mayork in Mayorkas willfully refused to comply with the detention mandate set forth in Section 235B1B2 of such act, requiring that an alien who is placed into expedited removal proceedings and determined to have a credible fear of persecution, quote, shall be detained for further consideration of the application for asylum, end quote. Instead of complying with this requirement, Alejandro N. Mayorkas implemented a catch and release scheme whereby such aliens were unlawfully released, even without effective mechanisms to ensure appearances before the immigration courts for removal, proceedings, or to ensure removal in the case of aliens ordered removed. Three, Alejandro and Mayorkas willfully refused to comply with the detention set forth in section 235B1B3-4 of such act, requiring that an alien who is placed into expedited removal proceedings and determined not to have a credible fear of persecution, quote, shall be detained until removed, end quote. Instead of complying with this requirement, Alejandro N. Mayorkas has implemented a catch and release scheme whereby such aliens are unlawfully released, even without effective mechanisms to ensure appearance before the immigration courts for removal proceedings or to ensure removal in the case of aliens ordered removed. Four, Alejandro N. Mayorkas willfully refused to comply with the detention mandate set forth in Section 236C of such act, requiring that a criminal alien who is inadmissible or deportable on certain criminal and terrorism-related grounds, quote, shall be taken into custody, end quote, when the alien is released from law enforcement custody. Instead of complying with this requirement, Alejandro N. Mayorkas issued, quote, guidelines for the enforcement of civil immigration laws, end quote, which instructs Department of Homeland Security, here, hereinafter referred to as DHS, officials that the, quote, fact an individual is a removable non-citizen should not alone be the basis of an enforcement action against them, end quote, and that DHS, quote, personnel should not rely on the fact of conviction alone, end quote even with respect to aliens subject to mandatory arrest and detention pursuant to Section 236C of such act to take them into custody. In Texas versus the United States, 40 F. 4th, 205, 2022, the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit concluded that these guidelines had, quote, every indication of being a general policy that is so extreme as to amount to an abdication of statutory responsibility, end quote. And that is, quote, replacement of Congress's statutory mandates with concerns of equity and race is extra legal and plainly outside the bounds of the power conferred by the INA, end quote. Number five. Alejandro N. Mayorkas willfully refused to comply with the detention mandate set forth in Section 241A2 of such act, requiring that an alien ordered removed, quote, shall be detained, quote, during, quote, the removal period, end quote. Instead of complying with this mandate, Alejandro Mayor N. Mayorkas issued, quote, guidelines for the enforcement of civil immigration laws, end quote, which instructs DHS officials that the, quote, fact an individual is removable non-citizen should not alone be the basis of an enforcement action against them, end quote, and that DHS, quote, personnel should not rely on the fact of conviction alone, end quote, even with respect to aliens subject to mandatory detention and removal pursuant to Section 241A of such act. Six, Alejandro N. Mayorkas willfully exceeded his parole authority set forth in Section 212D5A of such act that permits parole to be granted, quote, only on a case-by-case -case basis, end quote, temporarily and, quote, for urgent humanitarian reasons or significant public benefit, end quote, in that, A, Alejandro N. Mayorkas paroled aliens en masse in order to release them from mandatory detention despite the fact that as the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit concluded in Texas versus Biden, 20 F. 4th, 928, 2021, quote, paroling every alien DHS cannot detain is the opposite of the case-by-case -case basis determinations required by law, end quote. And quote, DHS's 
pretended power to parole aliens while ignoring the limitations Congress imposed on the parole power is not non-enforcement. It's misenforcement, suspension of the INA, or both. B, Alejandro N. Mayorkas created, reopened, or expanded a series of categorical parole programs never authorized by Congress for foreign nationals outside the United States, including for certain Central American minors, Ukrainians, Venezuelans, Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, Colombians, Salvadorans, Guatemalans, and Hondurans, which enabled hundreds of thousands of inadmissible aliens to enter the United States in violation to the laws enacted by Congress. Alejandro N. Mayorkas willfully exceeded his release authority Set forth in and you're hearing the articles of impeachment being read right there, Senator Mark Green, as we are following uh, the proceedings to oust uh, D Department uh, or Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Um, and as I was taking notes, I was actually trying to write down how many times uh, Mark Green said scheme. And uh, Marcia, this is where I want to bring you in. You know, you you worked. Uh, by the way, that's Representative Mark Green, Republican of Tennessee, that, that's reading. This has been pretty harsh uh, uh, towards Mayorkas, but he's reading now all the details of, of these uh, impeachment articles. But, Marcia, you worked under Mayorkas. Um, you, you were there uh, when this investigation actually began almost, well, more than a year ago. As you hear Mark Green uh, go into detail here and, and lay out uh, these, these articles in, in detail, and he says over and over again, scheme, 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 what is your reaction? And was your boss a part of any scheme? No, and my first reaction is that these are very poorly written. The Republicans have failed to provide any sort of evidence that there have any been, been any crimes of mis, uh, high crimes of misdemeanor, which is what impeachment is used for. What they're doing here is political theater. This is a policy disagreement. They don't like the policies of this administration. So what they should do instead is come to the table and work on an agreement so that we can actually fix them. On day one, President Biden sent Congress a bill to try to do this. They ignored it. Um, you know, up until the, the last several months, Secretary Mark has him, himself has been in the room at the table with a bipartisan small group of folks to try to come together to, to actually solve this. Because at the end of the day, only Congress can fix our immigration system. We can all agree, and everyone does agree, Republicans and Democrats, that the immigration system is badly broken. It's been broken for years and years. Um, but Republicans want to use this issue as a campaign issue to divide everyone rather than come together and actually solve it. So um, what, what we're seeing right now is, is going to go absolutely nowhere. We hope the Senate you know, dismisses it fairly quickly, which they can do. And um, Secretary Mayorkas was on the Hill this morning testifying before Congress to, to fight for more funding, which we so badly need. We need more Border Patrol agents. We need more asylum officers. But we also have, you know, TSA, FEMA, Secret Service. And he's focused on on all of that, while House Republicans and, and, and not everyone, right? But there are a lot of people who disagree with how, what the House Republicans are doing right now. So, Jay, as the grandstanding continues, we need to point out right now there is no trace of the required evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors here. Well, exactly right. And that's the argument that you're likely to hear Senate Democrats make minutes from now. Uh, as Marsha just said, that they, uh, the view of Senate Democrats is that this is a weaponization of a policy disagreement rather than a high crime or a misdemeanor. Now, what you heard Mark Green note there is what they're saying, the Republicans who brought these articles, is that look at the situation of the border and that's the evidence you need. We've heard Speaker Johnson make that exact characterization. But nonetheless, to your point, they are alleging, Republicans, some kind of a scheme. And what Democrats are saying is there is no scheme here. This is policy implementation that you are taking significant issues with. It's worth pointing out, by the way, just in case if you have in your head the sense of timing here, Mark Green is reading what are 20-page articles of impeachment. He's on page maybe 10 now, by my count. So we've got a ways to go here. And while this is political theater, Democrats accuse Republicans of conducting it's also historic because Mayorkas is only the second cabinet secretary in American history to face an impeachment.
And there's a deeper story of why this country can't solve the border crisis. Clearly, Rick Klein, as we watch this unfold, I mean, this immigration dysfunction uh, lies in the hands of both Democrats and Republicans. Kira, I've been covering Washington politics for 20 years, and at least since that time, and you could probably go back closer to 40, and you'd find a very similar tale of Democrats and Republicans unable to get on the same team. Sometimes you have a Democratic president and Republicans in Congress who are blocking it. Other, other times it's the reverse. Other times it seems like everyone is in alignment, and still there are forces that thwart comprehensive immigration reform. And it is uh, poignant in this moment to remember how close we were, not even to a comprehensive bill, but to something that brought a lot more resources to the border, made a lot of Fixes that Republicans have been talking about was, by all accounts, a very conservative border security bill that somehow got bipartisan support in the United States Senate and, and the support of President Biden. We were once again at one of those moments where it looked like we were in sight, and then former President Trump came out against it, House Republicans came out against it, and ultimately Republicans turned on their own deal in the Senate. And the fact that the time and attention is being spent on a, on a, a impeachment effort that everyone knows is going to fail in the Senate as opposed to the policy, I think, is going to go down as unfortunate. Uh, but all eyes, uh, I guess the interest still very strong when it comes to the border crisis because uh, Selena Wang, both Biden and former President Trump made their way down to the border to have their various uh, speeches uh, to, to America, shaking hands, talking with law enforcement. We're clearly going to, to see this issue um, at the top of the list come November. Yeah, Kira, I mean, this is one of the most important issues when it comes to this November election. And that's one of the reasons why Democrats in the White House are saying that this impeachment is completely baseless and politically motivated. They believe that House Republicans are trying to attack Mayorkas in order to attack Biden and to hit him where they believe he is very vulnerable, which is on the border crisis, on this immigration issue. And since the start of this, they've been outraged, calling this a complete waste of time, that if they actually cared about solving the border crisis, they wouldn't have derailed that bipartisan border deal that Rick was just talking about that included some of the toughest border security measures in decades. So they're trying to flip the script here, actually, Kira. All right. Jay, Selena, Rick, Marsha, also our uh, 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 Rachel, um, I, I was our Rachel, um, who was up uh, covering um, our senior congressional correspondent. Uh, Rachel Scott was also helping us out there. Sorry, it's a lot to a lot going on today and a lot of correspondence. Thank you for your patience with me and thanks to our panel. We are going to take a quick break. We will be right back. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The crown in crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. 
Hi. Where are you? Where are you? Appreciate <laughs> Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love you that. Me. Reporting from Burlington, Vermont, right in the heart of the path of totality. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good afternoon. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Today on ABC News Live, the head on collision of Donald Trump's legal problems and his presidential ambitions happening right now in a New York courtroom. We are only into day two of jury selection, and the presumptive Republican nominee is already calling Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels sleaze bags. And the Manhattan DA's office is saying that that violates the judge's limited gag order. So now it's filed a formal request to actually hold Trump in contempt. This hush money case is already making history as well, as this is the first time a former president has stood trial on criminal charges, and the proceedings are already proving challenging. Not one juror has been seated after an entire first day of filtering through the pool of New Yorkers. We have team coverage leading us off. Our senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky, he's outside the courthouse there. He joins me alongside our legal contributor and trial attorney, Brian Buckmeyer. So, Aaron, uh, court is back on since the lunch break. Trump is already getting scolded by the judge. He is, Kira. He had been rather docile for most of the day, sitting quietly following the proceedings. But when his attorney was questioning a potential juror about one of her social media posts that appeared to be a celebration of the 2020 election results, Trump losing, of course, uh, the judge said he heard Trump muttering something audibly in the direction of one of the jurors. And the judge raised his voice during a break and said he would not have jurors intimidated in this court courtroom, he then ordered the defense attorney, Todd Blanche, to speak to Trump uh, about keeping quiet, especially while jurors are speaking. Uh, Kira, it seemed as if this confrontation was probably bound to happen, given what the former president has been saying about Judge Juan Mershon. But we're only a day and a half into this. Uh, Mershon is trying to set a tone here, it seems. <laughs> yeah, it seems. And Brian, uh, Mershon set aside nearly two weeks for jury selection. Two weeks. Is this realistic, considering how slow the last two days have been and also the number of jurors that have said, sorry, I can't seem to be impartial here? I won't use the word realistic. I would say it's probably hopeful. Uh, he was really hopeful, probably, that those only last two weeks. But as we're seeing, both in the method in which the judge is using, as well as the responses that we're getting from the jurors, I think we're going to get a very good jury. I think from what we're seeing, both in Olivia Rubin's uh, interview, as well as some of the responses that Aaron and, and Olivia have given us from what we've heard from inside the courtroom in terms of why jurors are self-selecting themselves out, I think we're going to get a great jury. I just don't think it's going to happen in two weeks, just because Donald Trump is such a polarizing figure. You you tend not to have um, kind of non-major feelings about him. And I, I credit the potential jurors for saying, hey, I know I can't do this. I got to step out. And I think that's going to happen a lot. All right. So, Aaron, Judge Mershon also declined to strike this juror over Facebook posts during proceedings just a short bit ago. What was that about? What more can you tell us? Uh, this woman had posted a video uh, uh, taken, it seemed, from her fire escape, and, and it looked out uh, onto a crowd of people celebrating, and, and she said it reminded her 
of the pandemic era cheers for health workers that were so ubiquitous every evening in New York City. And there was another video of a crowd cheering on 96th Street. And, and uh, she said, I've been away, something going on. And to the defense, that was clear evidence uh, about talking of the election. The judge seemed a little baffled about that uh, and, and said that he didn't see the, the bias. But he did see bias in another prospective juror's Facebook post from 2017. This man had written uh, about one of Trump's policies that he tried and failed to enact early in his presidency. Uh, and, and he had written on Facebook, uh, lock him up. Uh, obviously a reference to, to Trump's famous saying about Hillary Clinton. The judge there uh, said that that juror, prospective juror, should be stricken from the pool. All right, Aaron Katursky, Brian Buckmeyer, thank you, gentlemen. We're just getting started. <laughs> and it's not just Donald Trump's criminal trial that's making history. The articles of impeachment have now been delivered up on the Hill. The part of the House of Representatives are present and ready to present the articles of impeachment, which have been preferred by the House of Representatives against Alejandro Nicholas Mayorkas, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Following a nearly year-long investigation, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas facing a trial of his own now after the House narrowly voted to impeach him in February over his handling of the southern border. Impeachment managers moments ago walked those articles of impeachment over to the Senate chamber. We continue to follow the live coverage, starting off with our contributing political correspondent and co-author of the playbook, Rachel Bade, also former assistant for public affairs at the Department of Homeland Security, Security Marsha Espinoza. Marsha worked under Mayorkas. Rachel, let's start with you. Now that the Senate has the articles of impeachment, what happens next? Well, Kira, it's pretty much preordained that uh, Mayorkas is going to be acquitted by the Senate. It's just a question of whether they allow any sort of debate to get any oxygen in the upper chamber tomorrow after they are officially sworn in. I mean, Democrats and even some Republicans have come out and said that there's not a lot of merit to this impeachment, not, not any merit in their, in their perspective. He basically was impeached for policy differences, and the founders of the country, when they wrote the Constitution, specifically debated whether or not to allow impeachment for policy differences, and they chose not to. Uh, but again, going back to this question about how long this will last, I'm told that there's actually a debate happening right now in the Biden administration. Some Democrats want, you know, the Senate to just vote to dismiss this right away tomorrow after senators are sworn in. But there's another constituency of Democrats who actually want to have a bipartisan acquittal vote. And in order to do that, they think they might actually need to allow a few hours of debate in the Senate chamber, even if it means having someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is an impeachment uh, manager and you know a huge thorn in the side for Joe Biden and for Mayorkas, speaking on the Senate floor. So this is going to be an interesting debate to watch. But everybody agrees it's going to not last for a long time, and he ultimately will be acquitted. Well, and then maybe we can get into the deeper issue of solving the border mess that's at hand. Marsha, you worked under Mayorkas. You've been watching this uh, happen live as it unfolds right along uh, with us. Uh, it, just since you worked under Mayorkas, you know his work ethic, and, you, and we listened to Mark Green there delivering all the details behind these articles and how he kept using the word scheme, scheme, scheme. Tell us what you know about the secretary and how he works and how he has tried to dig deep on this border crisis. Yeah, Secretary Mayorkas has uh, put first and foremost the the workforce of the department uh, in, in in his top priority, and has actually worked to try to solve the the border situation. He was part of the small group of bipartisan folks who were trying to come to some sort of agreement that ultimately failed. On day one of this administration, President Biden sent a bill to Congress to try to uh, fix what, what has been broken for several years that both Democrats and Republicans agree on. And frankly, only Congress can fix the immigration mess that we are in right now. And, and, and that, at the end of the day, is what actually needs to happen. Secretary Mayorkas is upholding the law that he um, has been obliged to do and um, has been trying everything in his power to make the border safe, secure, and, and humane. But at the end of the day, 
only Congress can fix what we are in. So the fact that they are using impeachment as a tool for politics right now instead of coming together to actually solve this is just simply a waste of time. So hopefully the Senate does either table it or dismisses it outright so they can get on to to better business and 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 actually solve something for the country because this this does nothing other than give the Republicans a talking point during the campaign. Marcia, appreciate you. Rachel, I'm going to ask you to stick around because we're moving on to talk about Israel's war cabinet now in this meeting that just wrapped with no final decision on the response to Iran's weekend attack, we're told. The Israeli Minister of Defense, though, promising retaliation but not saying when and how. Uh, Iran uh, says it will retaliate uh, if indeed Israel attacks them, and it will be a severe, widespread, and painful response. The U.S. now talking about new sanctions for Iran, and President Biden, along with other world leaders, continuing to urge against retaliation as well, saying that if Israel does strike back, it will do so alone. Our Josh Einiger is in Jerusalem for us, also still with us, as I mentioned, our contributing political correspondent, Rachel Bade. Okay, so Josh, uh, doesn't look like we have any new developments, but we can still talk about scenarios. And if indeed Israel decides how it's going to retaliate, there are certain areas within Iran that they could go after. There are, Kira, but the question remains, how does Iran take any such attack on the part of Israel? I mean, listening to that rundown of facts that you just ran through, it's it's really, I mean, the, the big takeaway is what a mess. I mean, they we're in a situation right now where we've got these two dueling powers. They each need to, to save face. And and now Israel says, I mean, the, there was a, it was, by all accounts, a disproportionate response from Iran uh, to send 300 plus missiles and drones toward populated civilian areas uh, here in the state of Israel, even even over the old city where the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque are. I mean, it's just an indiscriminate firing of all of this. Israel says it must respond. Failure to do so, in the, uh, in the words of one military commander I spoke to today, would be kicking the can down the road when it came to Iran and would be emboldening them for future attacks. So they really are in this moment where they have to thread a needle. And the question is, you know, what would be a sufficient response. Uh, of course, the U.S., as you said, Kira, has been urging them very strongly to withhold, withhold any kind of response, to take the win, if you will, uh, because they did manage to repel this incredibly fierce attack. But Israel has made it very clear today that that is not an acceptable response for them. And Rachel, Congress still under pressure to act on the stalled aid for Israel and the war in Ukraine. You have been speaking with your sources, both within the GOP and Democratic leadership. What are they telling you? Yeah, Kira, so Speaker Johnson, after delaying on moving Ukraine and funding for Israel for months, is finally bringing uh, them to the floor in the next coming days. Um, I actually heard from a source last night that as soon as he sort of made this plan known, President Joe Biden picked up the phone, called the speaker, and actually expressed some concern about his plan. He wanted Johnson just to just pass a foreign assistance package that had already gone through the Senate. Johnson is proposing to do separate votes for Ukraine, for Israel, Taiwan, and to add a few sort of conservative policy provisions to try to alleviate some concerns on his right flank. Joe Biden said, look, I'm concerned that this won't pass the Senate. And Mike Johnson told him, I'm told from sources, this is the only way you're going to get Ukraine aid. I have since talked to Democratic sources up here who think they actually can swallow uh, this uh, package. So we'll just have to see, though. He's going to have to worry about his right flank right now. A lot of Republicans concerned that he actually could be ousted over this vote in the House. All right, Josh, Rachel, thank you both. Coming up, USC's valedictorian banned from giving her graduation speech. We'll tell you why next. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. 
traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. So the University of Southern California is drawing a lot of criticism now after barring a pro-Palestinian valedictorian from speaking at her commencement ceremony. The school says it canceled the speech due to safety concerns and the, quote, intensity of feelings over the situation in the Middle East. The Council on American Islamic Relations now calling the decision cowardly and demanding that USC change course. Tim Caputo of our ABC affiliate in Los Angeles has the story. I tell everyone that doing this internship was the best decision of my life. That's Asna Tabassum, USC's valedictorian, who just found out she's been banned from giving the commencement speech at her own graduation next month. The university citing safety concerns. This will be the 141st commencement at USC and the first time a valedictorian isn't allowed to speak. Tabassum, a biomedical engineering major who is minoring in resistance to genocide, has been the focus of both on and off campus groups for her pro-Palestinian views, as well as her likes and links posted on social media. USC students we spoke with believe the groups honed in on her once she was bestowed with the valedictorian honor. I think people went too far with like stalking things that she had been liking and like kind of trolling her on social media. I don't think she deserved that. In a statement released via the Council on American Islamic Relations, Tabassum wrote, I am both shocked by this decision and profoundly disappointed that the university is succumbing to a campaign of hate meant to silence my voice. I am not surprised by those who attempt to propagate hatred. I am surprised that my own university, my home for four years, has abandoned me. I think she should fully have the right to speak. She has earned it. 100% being valedictorian of USC is no joke. She, you know, she earned it 100%. Just because she believes something or says something online does not take away her right to free speech. USC's provost in a campus-wide letter saying tradition must give way to safety, adding, quote, to be clear, this decision has nothing to do with freedom of speech. There is no free speech entitlement to speak at a commencement. The issue here is how best to maintain campus security and safety, period. The controversial decision comes on a day where pro-Palestinian protests popped up all across the country, one even stopping traffic on the Golden Gate Bridge. USC's decision has reverberated throughout campus, and some graduating seniors say students are already thinking about what they'll do at commencement. And as Tim Caputo just explained, the growing safety concerns over anti-Semitism there at USC, this incident comes amid a terrifying surge in anti-Semitic incidents. According to the Anti-Defamation League, anti-Semitic situations in the U.S. reached record highs last year, surging by a whopping 140 percent. That surge coinciding with the start of the Israel-Hamas war between October 7th and December 31st alone, the ADL tracked more than 5,000 thousand anti-Semitic incidents. Joining me now, Jonathan Greenblatt, CEO of the Anti-Defamation League. Jonathan, I just want to start, if you don't mind, with the news that came out here about USC banning the pro-Palestinian undergrad uh, from speaking at her graduation. The school cited safety concerns. I just would love to know your thoughts. Look, 
Thank you very much for having me, and I appreciate the question. Graduation should be a time for celebration, not for slander. This student, and it's funny, your piece was very useful, or the intro piece, but it didn't show her social media feeds where she denigrated and dehumanized her classmates, made insightful, hateful comments against the Jewish state, celebrated the murder of over a thousand people. I mean, come on. The students of USC deserve to hear someone who actually represents their values. And if this student represents their values, I would really wonder about the value of that education. So hats off to the leadership of USC for making sure that hate has no place on their campus. It has clearly created quite the conversation uh, across the U.S. Uh, today, and and it leads us, you know, to a conversation about your report now. Clearly, showing a dramatic upward trend in anti-Semitism following uh, that attack, that that terrorist attack by Hamas on October seventh. Help us understand these numbers. I mean, it looks like this started before Israel even started bombing Gaza. It did. So stepping back, ADL has been tracking anti-Jewish incidents in America since 1979. As you can see on the bar graph, we've just never had a moment like this before. So after reaching record highs in 2019, and then in 21, and then in 22, 23 blew, blew those numbers away for all the wrong reasons. The truth is, is that we saw, again, over 5,000 anti-Jewish acts that didn't start, as you were pointing out, when the Israelis or the IDF went into Gaza. It started on October the 7th. It was like waving a red cape to the anti-Zionists and the anti-Semites who were already out there. And so we saw 161 assaults last year. We saw over a thousand, think about that, over a thousand acts of anti-Semitism on college campuses. We saw over 2,000 acts of vandalism, over 400 businesses targeted simply for the offense of being owned by Jews or Israelis. I mean, this is madness. And to think in our country, in America, that this is not just happening, but it's expanding and intensifying. And this brings us to an important point. The truth of the matter is anti-Semitism like racism, if you will, it's not just an issue for black people. Anti-Semitism is not just a Jewish problem, it's everyone's problem. It's a kind of conspiracy theory that thrives in an environment where people blame and libel and slander others. So let's be crystal clear. This is not just about the Jewish community, although they are definitely affected by this. It's about what we want America to look like. It's about whether we will tolerate intolerance. And it's time, it's long past time to stop this once and for all. And again, back to that graduation, per, the person for the graduation at USC, it is not political activism to belittle and bully your classmates, okay? That is prejudice plain and simple. And there's no right to protected speech in that kind of environment. The school has every right to choose who they want, an environment where Jews are being targeted and victimized, where they are clearly, as the data demonstrates, vulnerable. I appreciate people in positions of authority, like again at USC and President Folt, demonstrating responsible leadership. That's what we need. Jonathan, one more question to you is, you know, there seems to be a lack of understanding, a, a lack of conversation, j just about, uh, just about hate itself, because we can we, we've seen what's happened since the the Hamas attack on Israel, and and how this country has become so divided and so split on what exactly happened and how they see it happening, and was it, you know, whose fault was it, and what do we do about it? Where are we screwing up? Where are we missing opportunities to have conversations and educate our kids so they really know? you know, the, the true, where, where this hate comes from and, and what we say and what we do impacts the, the incidents that you talk about. Yeah, it's a really good question. It's kind of a hard question. Anti-Semitism is sometimes called the oldest hatred. It's this conspiracy theory about how the world works. But in an environment where, again, blaming and bullying are part of the, like, the political conversation, in a world in which people somehow think it's okay to hold a minority 
collectively responsible for what happens overseas. In a world in which we judge people based on their uh, their, I their identity, if you will, rather than their ideas, based on who we think they are rather than who they want to be, I mean, that's really quite tragic. So I do think the fight against hate starts at home. Make sure that our kids understand, judge people again, and I to evoke Dr. King, on the content of their character, not on the color of their skin, not on where they happen to worship, again, not on where they might be from. But if we can remember that and that alone, if we can resist the temptation to use incendiary, hateful rhetoric, we can step back and just take a beat. All of us, all of us would be better off. Jonathan Greenblatt, great to see you. Appreciate uh, our interviews all the time. Thank you. Appreciate Coming up, a much awaited report on those deadly fires in Hawaii as we seek to understand exactly what happened. We've got details right after the break. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know you are. You I do. watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. One more headline to update you on while we have you this hour. The Maui Fire Department is due to release a report on how it responded to last year's deadly Lahaina fires. That report could help officials understand exactly what happened when the wind whipped fire overtook the historic town, destroying at least 3,000 structures and causing more than $5 billion worth of damage. That fire claiming 101 lives. It stands as the deadliest U.S. wildfire in more than a century. As soon as we have our hands on that report, we'll bring it to you. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops. Neither do we. We'll be right back. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. Tonight, the unprecedented moment. Former President Trump's criminal trial underway. Plus, David Muir reporting from the Middle East after Iran's strike on Israel. What happens next? More Americans turn to the most watched newscast, World News Tonight with David Muir. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Today on ABC News Live, the head-on collision of Donald Trump's legal problems and his presidential ambitions happening in a New York courtroom. We are only into day two of jury selection, and the presumptive Republican nominee is already calling Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels sleazebags. So the Manhattan DA's office said, hey, that violates the judge's limited gag order, so it filed a formal request to hold Trump in contempt. Never a dull moment. This hush money case already making history as well, as this is the first time a former president has stood trial on criminal charges, and the proceedings are already proving challenging. Not one juror has been seated after an entire first day of filtering through the pool of New Yorkers, and now we're in day two. We have team coverage leading us off. Our senior reporter, Catherine Falters, joins me along with our legal contributor and attorney, Kim Whaley, and chief Washington correspondent, John Carl. John, this is the first... Okay, Catherine, I understand we learned uh, just moments ago some jurors have been seated. What do we know? Yeah, Kara, literally just moments ago, we have three jurors. I'm reading this note from Aaron Katursky and Luke Brueggemann, our colleagues who are inside that courthouse. We now have three jurors who have been seated. That's three out of the 12 that we need here and also six alternates. So three of 18 people, if you will. That's after... Uh, Obviously, a long day today and a long day yesterday, but right now uh, we have three. So that's the update. And since they've come back from lunch, uh, Trump's attorneys have been trying to strike a number of jurors that they uh, don't believe uh, should be on this jury, some for what they call controversial social media posts. The judge has agreed uh, with the Trump attorneys in some instances and others. He has disagreed with them. But the headline is that we now have three jurors, Kira, that will serve on this jury. All right. Uh, and John, this is the first chance I've had to talk to you. Uh, what do you make of just so many potential jurors saying that they couldn't be impartial? <laughs> I, I mean, I guess there's no surprise in that he's been in every single headline since he's been in the White House and even outside of that White House. But just your thoughts as we watch this <laughs> unfold on day two. <laughs> you know, ideally in a, in a criminal case, you'd want somebody who had actually, absolutely no familiarity uh, whatsoever with uh, the, the defendant. I mean, there's nobody in America. <laughs> how many people in the world don't know who Donald Trump is and how many of those people uh, don't have an opinion about uh, Donald Trump? So it's, it's, a, it's a very high bar. But look, Akira, I think that this has been a fascinating process to watch play out. And it's been a civics lesson for everybody, for the country to watch because our system of justice depends and gives you the right uh, to be uh, to ha have your case judged by a jury of your peers, and th there are no real peers to, to Donald Trump in a in a strict literal sense. Uh, but look, he uh, is, is the most famous New Yorker alive, maybe the most famous person on the planet uh, to a lot of people, the most infamous. And we see, I think you will see. 18 people uh, who are ultimately seated here who will take the responsibility quite serious uh, to whatever their own personal opinions may be. Ideally, there'll be people that don't have very strong personal uh, opinions, uh, but they'll certainly have opinions. Uh, but we'll see it and take it very serious, their responsibility uh, to be fair and impartial. So we're getting a little more uh, detail here. Those three jurors that have been approved now, an Irish-born salesman, uh, an oncology nurse, and an attorney who lives in Chelsea. And apparently the judge had previously uh, blocked one other motion from the defense to strike a juror for cause and granted another, the juror, Mershon, agreeing to remove uh, an Upper West Side bookseller who recently reposted an AI video to social media mocking Trump, which included a fake Trump saying, I'm dumb as F word. And then the, the yeah, juror said, I thought it would be funny. That's John. probably a good person to strike from the jury. I'm just, <laughs> I'm not going to go out on a limb, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know. I, I, I don't think that would work out very yeah, well. So yeah, Kim, yeah, yeah. let me let me take you to, to you, Kim. Uh, the judge sent 
set aside, what, nearly two weeks for jury selection. Uh, how long do you think it's going to take? I mean, now we're starting to see three have been seated. Could this really go on for, for two weeks? Well, I mean, we, we, we do the math and we're in the two week window, three a day, uh, and they will eventually run out of their peremptory strikes on each side, right? So I think Trump team used four, uh, government used three, they have 10. And then after that, it's going to be up to Judge Merchant to make the decisions based on cause to decide that these people uh, would be too biased one way or the other. And it looks like it's really the concern is more on the defense team, given the population of New York, um, probably not as many Trump supporters as there, as there might be say down in Florida um, and also you know they'll get into a rhythm I would assume um, but anything could happen Kira I mean the, the judge also admonished uh, Trump for mumbling uh, something today within earshot of, of potential jurors this is a man who's bullies people including uh, jurors and electorate, elect, election officials and uh, judges, law clerks and things like that. Um, so with Donald Trump, as I'm sure John can speak to, uh, we never know day to day how things can twist and turn, but we could see a jury uh, actually start hearing evidence in a couple of weeks. And John, we could see Donald Trump actually speak at his trial. Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, all the same uh, actors uh, that we were reporting on and talking to uh, a handful of years ago. Karen McDougal, uh, you know, we, we could see quite a quite a list people who uh, were very who have been very close to Trump for for a very long time. We could see David Pecker, uh, the uh, former uh, chief executive at the National Enquirer, who was a, yeah. allegedly at the at the forefront of the catch and kill scheme uh, to go out there and to get stories that would have been critical of Donald Trump and to kill them so they wouldn't be published. We could see uh, quite a few. I, I am most skeptical, Kira, of the idea that we're actually going to see. Uh, Donald Trump testify. I know he has said quite emphatically that he has nothing to hide, that he wants to testify. I know we did see him testify. Didn't go too well. We did see him testify in the uh, civil fraud trial against the Trump organization. But I have just seen Donald Trump say so many times over and over again, going back to the Mueller investigation. Uh, I remember asking him when shortly after Mueller was appointed if he would be willing uh, to, to testify, to, to be interviewed by, by Robert Mueller investigating Russian interference in the election. And he told me absolutely yes. It was something that he repeated many times after that. And of course, he never actually testified. So we'll see if we actually see Donald Trump take the stand. But you're certainly going to see Michael Cohen take the stand. And it's going to be very interesting because he's going to be testifying under oath as Donald Trump is not so far away from him sitting there in the same courtroom. And that will be a very high drama moment for sure. Oh, yes, it will. John, Kim, Catherine, thank you all so much. It's not just Donald Trump's criminal trial that's making history. The articles of impeachment also have been delivered, and there was history on Capitol Hill made right there. The part of the House of Representatives are present and ready to present the articles of impeachment, which have been preferred by the House of Representatives against Alejandro Nicholas Mayorkas, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Following a nearly year-long investigation, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas facing a trial of his own now after the House narrowly voted to impeach him in February over his handling of the southern border. Impeachment managers just moments ago actually walked those articles of impeachment over to the Senate chamber. We have live team coverage, starting off with our contributing political correspondent and co-author of the playbook Politico, Rachel Bade, also former assistant for public affairs at the Department of Homeland Security, Marcia Espinosa. Marcia worked under Mayorkas. So, Rachel, let's talk about how historic this, this moment was. Uh, Mayorkas, only the second cabinet member ever to be impeached, but let's also be very clear that this was a lot of grandstanding that basically is going to go nowhere except the headlines. Yeah, big historic moment up here on Capitol Hill, Kira, not only because he's the second cabinet official to be impeached in all of American history, as you just mentioned, it's been almost 100 years, more than 100 years since a cabinet official has been impeached. But more than that, I would actually say the significance of this is actually what it's doing to the tool of impeachment itself. If you think about it, the founders wrote impeachment into the Constitution to be a rare and powerful check on a tyrant, somebody trying to take over democracy here in the United States. Instead, 
increasingly we are seeing it being used as a political messaging tool that is coming up over and over again and basically suggests that we could see impeachments become a lot more frequent. This is actually a trend that started with Democrats actually when they impeached Donald Trump twice. They actually watered down a lot of the rules of the road of impeachment. They made it easier to sort of push through partisan impeachments, not giving the president due process rights, and also not having a full investigation with first-hand witnesses, sort of short short-circuiting the process. And now Republicans are sort of taking that and taking it further, saying they're going to allow impeachment for policy differences, which is very much not what the founders wanted and intended for impeachment when they actually put it into the Constitution, Kira. So a lot of change and historical precedent that's being upended here. Marcia, as someone who worked under Mayorkas, has it been frustrating just to hear these claims against the Homeland Security Secretary? Oh yeah, it definitely has been because having worked under Secretary Mayorkas for three years and then before that under the Obama administration, I can tell you that he puts work first, he puts the department first and, and the workforce. In fact, he was on the Hill this morning fighting for more funding for, for the department. We need more border patrol agents, more asylum officers, not only immigration offices, but we have TSA, Secret Service, FEMA, and, and other offices as well that he's concerned about. So he was there this morning. He was there last week. He was also part of the small group of bipartisan folks who were trying to come together to, to put together a piece of legislation that could be passed this year to actually do something about immigration rather than just use it as a as a political ploy or, or talking point, which the Republicans Republicans are very much doing. That went nowhere as well. But at the end of the day, this, this is frustrating because we all know, Republicans and Democrats, that only Congress can fix our immigration system. We all agree that it's broken and something needs to be done. People have been saying this for years, and Congress has that power, not, not DHS, not the administration. They can only do so much within their power. And right now, the secretary is upholding the law that Congress has put in place. He's tried to do everything in his power to, to make it better, to make it fair and humane. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I, like I've said over and over, we need Congress to ultimately do something to fix this for once and for all. Agreed. Marsha, Rachel, thank you both. So Israel's war cabinet meeting wrapped up with no final decision on the response to Iran's weekend attack. Iran says that any retaliation will be met with, quote, severe, widespread, and a painful response. President Biden, uh, along with other world leaders, urging restraint, saying that if Israel strikes back, it will do so alone. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the U.S. will not hesitate to issue new sanctions on Iran. Let's bring in our foreign correspondent, Tom Sufi Burridge. He's there in Tel Aviv. We also want to bring back our political correspondent, Rachel Bade. So, Tom, no final decision uh, within Israel's war cabinet. Three days they've been meeting. So what do we think about a response? Yeah, I mean, no indication right now that a decision has been made by Netanyahu and his war cabinet. Uh, we've spoken to a, a former major general of the Israeli military uh, and, and asked him what he thought uh, could be the response. I mean, he does not favor a direct military strike against Iran. I mean, he says the Israeli military could carry out a destructive strike against Iran's energy sector, for example, knocking out part of its oil fields, knocking out electricity to Tehran. This is all within the realms of possibility, but he said that risked a spiral of violence between Iran and Israel. And he warned that Israel potentially wasn't ready for a long war with Iran and didn't have the ammunition stocks to actually conduct such a war. Uh, we also uh, put the question of whether uh, Israel should carry out that a direct military strike against Iranian territory or, uh, as the, the Major General believes, uh, target Iranian proxies in the region. And we put that question also to another former Israeli uh, military official, uh, a former colonel uh, in the Israeli military. Would you advocate for or against a direct military strike against Iran? I'm for the one against the proxies, and the reason I'm for that is because Iran has been using these proxies in the last six months continuously. That all of their capabilities, all of their firing capabilities, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and to a certain degree even Hamas, certainly Islamic Jihad, all use Iranian capabilities, Iranian know-how. You can attack the proxies and make a very good point. 
Yeah, so that's Miri Eisen, a former colonel in the Israeli military. And she says, look, Israel should up its game and not risk uh, basically giving Iran an excuse to escalate the situation. She says that Israel should be talking to its allies, talking to the US, up its game, though, against the proxies in Syria and in Lebanon. And interestingly, today, the IDF has announced two separate attacks in Lebanon against Hezbollah, killing, the IDF says, two separate uh, Hezbollah commanders. Now, you know, Israel has been striking Hezbollah continuously uh, since October the 7th. Hezbollah has been striking into Israel across the northern border. So we can't say that these new strikes are part of the response to the Iranian direct, unprecedented attack against Israeli territory over the weekend. But it, it is possible, but we just don't have any official comments on that right now. Rachel, Congress still under a lot of pressure, too, to act on the stalled aid for Israel and the war in Ukraine. You've been speaking with your sources still uh, within the GOP and Democratic leadership. And what do they tell you this hour? Yeah, Kira, Speaker Mike Johnson, after delaying moving on a package for U assistance for Ukraine and Israel, is finally going to be bringing them up in the coming days. And he's going to be allowing separate votes on these issues, plus tacking on a few sort of conservative provisions uh, that he's hoping will pass the House. Now, I am told that President Joe Biden personally called him last night as he was rolling out this proposal and said, look, I want you to take instead what the Senate passed in the upper chamber, which is what the White House actually blessed. It was one package pulled together, didn't include these conservative provisions that Mike Johnson is trying to add. And Mike Johnson said, look, if he said, this is the only way if you want Ukraine aid. So uh, Democrats have since come around to this idea, realizing that, look, if they actually want to get this assistance moving, this might be their only shot. And so perhaps they need to sort of swallow this process. But the problem now is actually on Mike Johnson's right flank. We are seeing more Republicans come out and say, perhaps he should resign. Uh, there is obviously this threat about ousting him and so he's trying to navigate this can he pass ukraine aid and still keep his gavel that's going to be a, a tough uh, predicament for him kira appreciate it rachel thank you tom you too more severe weather on the move back here at home threatening millions of americans from coast to coast colorado getting slammed by a powerful spring storm wind and near whiteout conditions ravaging the slopes of a lot of popular ski resorts then in virginia strong storms triggering lightning heavy rain also making for dangerous road conditions the extreme weather prompting alerts from wisconsin to arkansas now and then a tornado watch has been issued from kansas city to des moines our meteorologist Mara theodore is tracking it all so it's been quite a, a wild weather day, hasn't it, across the country? It has, Kira. And right now, we're in the midst of this active weather. Just to the northwest of Des Moines, we actually have two tornado warnings right now. The areas in yellow are denoting the tornado watches. That includes northwestern, I'm sorry, northeastern Missouri, much of Iowa, and into Illinois. So, in a, in a small sliver of Nebraska as well, what's going to happen is this line of thunderstorms will continue its progression eastward. Look how it's slicing through states like Illinois there parts of Wisconsin and you can see the highest tornado threat is situated actually where we're seeing tornado warnings right now on the ground and that's in Iowa but it also includes northern Missouri uh, just outside of Peoria there and then as we head till tomorrow the same system makes its way east it'll bring some showers to the northeast shore but it also brings a potential for severe weather throughout parts of the Ohio Valley, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Evansville, up into Lansing and Detroit. Get ready. Tomorrow, your Wednesday afternoon and evening will give way to storms that could produce damaging winds as well as a few tornadoes. And it's hitting during that critical ride from home, running errands, dinner time frame. Kira? Okay. Samara, thank you. And we have some movement in former President Trump's criminal hush money trial. Six jurors have now been seated after nearly two full days of questioning. The judge formally approving an Irish-born salesman, an oncology nurse, and an attorney who lives in Chelsea, plus three more jurors that have just been seated. We'll continue to bring you all the latest details as it develops. All right, coming up, the Supreme Court backing Idaho on its ban on gender-affirming care for minors, how that ruling could impact other states after the break. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The cut fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. So you came in there and you, and you found him dead. You don't know how hard it was. How did this baby realize? 
Life's keep a secret for some. But that told us to complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. You're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The Interrogation Tapes, the new 2020 True Crime Limited Series, Monday on ABC. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. And that's why at Good Morning America, we're right here. And we got you. We got you. We got you. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. So the Supreme Court just concluded arguments today in a major case from the January 6th attack on the Capitol that could invalidate felony obstruction charges for more than 300 people connected to that attack, including former President Donald Trump. This comes as the Supreme Court is also allowing Idaho to enforce its ban on gender-affirming care for minors. Let's bring in our Devin Dwyer for all the details on both of the court's deeply divided cases. Devin, how does this affect former President Trump and his current legal proceedings, you think? A uh, high stakes case t today, Kira, no question about it, impacting Donald Trump, but also, as you said, there are 300 or more defendants involved with the January 6th attacks. The court today was trying to decide whether a federal law that was enacted after the Enron scandal, dealing with financial crimes and documents and the like, can be applied to put some of these alleged January 6th rioters behind bars for as long as 20 years. Federal prosecutors say the language in the law is extremely broad. The defense attorney in this case a former, uh, for a former Pennsylvania police officer who's been charged says actually that's too broad, too broad of an interpretation. It can't be used against these defendants. Uh, the Supreme Court was pretty skeptical of the government's argument today, Kira. They seemed inclined to roll back the interpretation in some way. That could mean lesser sentences, reduced sentences, uh, overturned convictions perhaps in some of these cases on this particular charge. And it could also mean potentially um, that we would see special counsel Jack Smith have to retool his case against Donald Trump because two of the four federal election interference charges against Trump come under the same law that the Supreme Court was looking at today, Kira. All right, so turning to Idaho now, what are the details on the ruling? And let's talk about the significance of it. Well, the Supreme Court yesterday simply said that they can, Idaho can enforce this law while litigation continues. They did not weigh in on the merits. They didn't take a position on the constitutionality of Idaho's gender-affirming care ban at all. Uh, but effectively, it means that I, Idaho can now join more than 20 other states that have these severe restrictions on things like hormone therapies and the like uh, for teenagers. And that is a really big deal if you're, uh, if you're one of those teenagers, of course, or the family families in these states, you see them on the screen. Uh, but we should say, Kira, that it's not the final word. The Supreme Court uh, and the three liberal justices who dissented yesterday, they said they would have let the law uh, remain on hold while this continues to play out, uh, had the full expectation uh, that this case will come back to the Supreme Court on the merits at some point in the future. And how do you think the ruling could maybe impact other states? Could, it, could we see a domino effect here with this ruling in Idaho? Not just yet, Kira. Uh, yesterday's decision was simply on whether the law can be enforced during the litigation. It didn't have a broad application to other states because the Supreme Court didn't weigh in on those merits. Uh, but down the line, this could have a ripple effect and encourage other states uh, to take similar, uh, take similar measures. Very controversial issue, as you know, in the Supreme Court just beginning to dip its toe into these, uh, into these matters. Kira? All right. Devin, thanks. You bet. And coming up, a bishop stabbed mid-sermon, and it's all caught on live stream. What may be behind the attack next? What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? 
We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know you are. You do. You every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting from a hot air balloon over Russellville, Arkansas, 350 couples have signed up to be married moments before totality. You're streaming ABC News Live. Some other top headlines we're tracking for you this hour on ABC News Live. Australia's second knife attack now being investigated as an act of terrorism. A bishop is stabbed mid-sermon, and it's all caught on a live stream. Now a 16-year-old is in custody after being restrained by members of the Assyrian church. Authorities say that bishop and the parish priest were taken to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Well, outrage out west after the University of Southern California barred its valedictorian from speaking at its commencement ceremony. The school says it canceled the speech due to safety concerns and the intensity of feelings over the situation in the Middle East. Others are calling it an act of censorship because Asna Tebesum has shared pro-Palestinian views online and was accused by pro Israel groups of being anti-Semitic. The Council on American Islamic Relations called the decision cowardly and demanded that the school change course. Glad you're streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love pop culture. So what happens when being obsessed with pop culture collides with being a mom? You get us. So listen now to our new podcast, 
Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Alex Perche in East Palestine, Ohio, one year after that toxic train derailment. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top, top headlines we're watching for you right now on ABC News Live. We have some movement in former President Trump's criminal hush money trial. Six jurors have now been seated. The judge formally approving an Irish-born salesman, an oncology nurse, an attorney who lives in Chelsea, an IT consultant from Puerto Rico, and a software employee from Chelsea. Also, we're still waiting on confirmation of the sixth juror. This comes after nearly two days of questioning with prosecutors and defense attorneys asking potential jurors things like, what do you make of Trump and how their social media might influence their opinions. Trump is facing 34 felony counts of falsifying business records to cover up a payment to porn star Stormy Daniels to keep her alleged affair with the former president a secret from voters before the 2016 election. Well, he's pleaded not guilty and has denied any wrongdoing or any relationship with Daniels. The articles of impeachment for Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas have now been delivered. The part of the House of Representatives are present and ready to present the articles of impeachment, which have been preferred by the House of Representatives against Alejandro Nicolas Mayorkas, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Impeachment managers earlier today walking those articles of impeachment over to the Senate chamber following a nearly year-long investigation after the House narrowly voted to impeach Mayorkas in February over his handling of the southern border. Majority Leader Chuck Schumer confirming on the Senate floor that senators will be sworn into a court of impeachment tomorrow afternoon. Well, there could be a picket line on Sesame Street. Writers at the Sesame Workshop have voted to authorize a strike against the organization. The Writers Guild of America announcing that today the writers are prepared to walk the picket line if a tentative deal isn't reached by Friday. That strike would include any and all work from Sesame Street. We are waiting on comment from Bert, Ernie, and Big Bird. We think we know what Oscar the Grouch would say. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on your favorite streaming service, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. GMA3 starts right now. What you need to know right now on GMA3. Israel's military chief says there will be a response to Iran's failed attack over the weekend. The Biden administration and the world urging restraint. And dozens of potential jurors allowed to go home after admitting they couldn't be impartial as jury selection resumes in day two of the hush money criminal trial against former President Donald Trump. And that's the tough thing about being a victim. You never see it, that this person is abusing their authority. And no one to turn to. Who guards the guards? Claims of sexual abuse, allegedly by probation officers. Anchor Lindsay Davis joins us with an exclusive look at tonight's ABC News Live Prime investigation. And life as we know it can be. Our former colleague Bill Weir joins us with his new book on climate and beyond. Building happier, healthier, more resilient communities. Plus, get ready for Carbone Beach. Chef Mario Carbone joins us here in studio on his star-studded supper club on the sand. And secrets to his fan favorite, spicy rigatoni vodka. Very reason I find you attractive. Mission? Operation Postmaster. To neutralize the German U-boats in the North Atlantic. And he's starring in the new action comedy from director Guy Ritchie. Actor Carrie Elwes is here on his role in the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. The Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. And it's official history on the hardwood. Dreams being realized. Caitlin Clark and the stars for women's college basketball get ready for their next chapter. Now from Times Square, Eva Pilgrim and DeMarco Morgan with Dr. Jen Ashton and what you need to know. 
this is a vibe. Good that afternoon, everyone, and welcome to What You Need to Know on this Tuesday. And this is a vibe. This trio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love you yes, guys. Yes, it is. It is springtime, and I don't know about you guys, but my attitude is so much better when the sun <laughs> oh, is out and it's warmer and people are outside running and riding bikes. Yep. I thought you were going to say your allergies. <laughs> I, I did, too. Well, well the allergies are We know that's coming. Let's yeah, get ahead of it now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Let's talk to you about some medical headlines, yeah. though, that are getting some attention right now. There's a new study that's looking at physical activity and um, heart disease. So mm. how do those two things go together? Yeah, we've talked about the mind-body connection before. This latest study published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, more data, more evidence to reinforce that powerful connection. They looked at physical activity and health history of uh, over 50,000 adults, followed them for a decade. Those who met the physical activity guidelines versus those who got less were the two groups they put head to head. What they found is that meeting those guidelines, which again, 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise per week, dropped their risk of heart disease by 20%. Those who had already had a diagnosis of depression had an even better benefit. But when you talk about needing more evidence, more reason to get moving, what's good for the heart is good for the mind, is good for the brain, is good for the mood good for everything. All right, Doc, thank you very much. We are so lucky to have with us ABC's M. Wynn, who is with <laughs> us today. Yes, giving us the headlines. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you all. And of course, it sounds like I need a few thousand more steps <laughs> to be that healthy. Now to the headlines. We begin here with Israel's vow of retaliation overseas. The prime minister convening his war cabinet for a third day in a row to discuss the possible response to Iran's missile and drone attack. That barrage failing with help from an international defense including the U.S. President Biden and the world urging restraint as Israel weighs possible retaliation with the administration making it clear they are committed to Israeli security but will not participate in any Israeli counterstrike. And Hannah Gutierrez, the armorer on the movie Rust, in charge of keeping weapons safe on the set, sentenced to the maximum 18 months behind bars for her role in the shooting on set in New Mexico that killed the film's cinematographer. Gutierrez's Attorneys say she was a scapegoat in the tragedy and that they will appeal. And now to our Ginger Z with a look at your weather. More than 100 severe storm reports in just the last 24 hours, and this is an ongoing event. You saw the severe weather in Virginia that was up to golf ball size hail. But now our attention is on the plains. Throughout the morning, we've been seeing these tornado watches moving east, and this is the region that we're concerned most about for the early afternoon. And then it'll start to be Chicago tonight. But Des Moines, Cedar Rapids, you're really right now all the way down to Little Rock. Tomorrow, it's Ann Arbor, Detroit, Cleveland, Cincinnati, uh, down to Evansville, and even Toledo included. Remember, Ohio is at 38 tornadoes already, leading the country in number of tornadoes, and unfortunately could see more tomorrow. Thank you, Ginger. And tears, cheers, and electricity in the air at the WNBA draft in Brooklyn. Top pick Caitlin Clark was chosen by the Indiana Fever, and star Camila Cardoso from the University of South Carolina and LSU's Angel Reese now go from being NCAA rivals to teaming up on the Chicago sky. And Caitlin Clark says she has been dreaming of this career milestone since she was in the second grade. It just makes that all the more sweeter of her accomplishment. Dreams do yeah. come true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we are so glad to have you here. Yes, today. we are. I know you so do great. it from D.C. all the time, but to have you in person <laughs> yeah. is really nice. You know, talking about Caitlin Clark's dreams, one of my yeah. dreams to be here. Aww, so. <laughs> but it came true. Thank it you, came true. Yes, thank you, bravo. Thank you, Em. Well, there's much more here on GMA3 on this Tuesday. Day two of the unprecedented criminal trial of Donald Trump. Why scores of potential jurors have been excused. And later, who guards the guards? Claims of sexual abuse allegedly by probation officers. Prime anchor Lindsay Davis joins us with a preview of the ABC News Live investigation. Savings. We're back in a moment. No. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies or play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. Involuntary manslaughter charges against parents of the shooter at Oxford High School who killed four students and wounded others. There's a myth that the shooter just snaps. It's just not true. There are always signs 
he was crying for help and being ignored. He had pictures of a target on his bedroom wall, shell casings on his nightstand. A very toxic, turbulent relationship. Those people are yikes. The life they lived was just crazy. The sexting and the really terrible things they'd video of their sexual acts. They purchased that gun for him with his money and bragged about it. They're being told by a school counselor that he thinks their son's going to kill himself and they do nothing. As soon as I heard they were called to the school that day, the messages about LOL, don't get caught, those were very, very concerning to me. That's the moment that no juror is going to think, well, haven't we all been there? Here's what it is. I got it. They do not seem shocked about him having the gun. There was no shock. Zero. School shooters aren't created. They're made, and it's made over time. You don't get to walk away from that. You just don't. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league, a side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. Welcome back to GMA3. Donald Trump is officially the first former president to ever stand trial on criminal charges. Today is day two of jury selection. More than half of the nearly 100 potential jurors were sent home on the first day of the trial after saying they couldn't be impartial to sit in judgment of the former president. Now joining us from the Manhattan Courthouse is ABC senior investigative correspondent Erin Katursky and from D.C. senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Thank you both for being with us. Erin, let's start with you. So with jury selection now underway, I'm just curious, what's it like in the courtroom? It's a bit tense. It's also a bit awkward, I think, for some of the potential jurors who are sort of standing up, craning their neck to get a look at who was seated at the defense table. One woman put her hand over her mouth and appeared to giggle, her eyebrows raised in recognition of who the defendant in the case is. Uh, and, and nobody in that room doesn't recognize Donald Trump. But the judge told them they have to be fair and impartial. And half the hands of the room went up when he asked if they couldn't be. So they were immediately excused. Uh, and today, on the second day of jury selection, the individuals who, who signaled they could be fair and impartial are going to be questioned one-on-one -on -one, uh, by the attorneys. Each side gets 10 strikes for any reason at all, pretty much. Uh, and eventually, the goal is to get 12 jurors and six alternates to, to sit in judgment of the former president. So, Rachel, what's been the reaction inside the Trump camp? Yeah, well, Trump's campaign is irritated. Uh, we are told that the former president was anxious about this trial starting. We know the former president is irritated about his first criminal trial. But look, we have never seen anything like this before. The presumptive Republican nominee who is also now a criminal defendant. We are six months out from the general election and Donald Trump is now spending most of his time not on, on the campaign trail in these critical battleground states, but inside of a courtroom. This is striking. It is unprecedented. And we know as much as the former president is trying to use this to play to his political advantage, we know he certainly does not want to be inside of this courtroom. Aaron, prosecutors say Trump violated a gag order against attacking witnesses by going after Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen in three social media posts. Trump's legal team argues he was responding to attacks from them. How is this judge likely to respond to all of this? The judge has been pretty clear about what the former president is allowed to say and what he's not allowed to say. These social media posts, prosecutors say, are out of bounds, and they're asking Trump to be fined $3,000. The judge is going to hold a hearing about this because prosecutors are now challenging the defense to tell them why Trump shouldn't be held in contempt. The judge may want to set an early tone since uh, the case has not yet even started with the testimony.
All right, Rachel, let's take a look at some numbers if we can. A recent New York Times Siena College poll found that 54% of registered voters believe Donald Trump has committed serious federal crimes. However, only 26% say they are paying a lot of attention to the former president's mm -hmm. legal trouble. So how large of an impact do you expect this trial to have on Trump, especially in an upcoming election here? You said it's six months mm -hmm. out. Yeah, you know, look, one thing that we know for certain is that a possible conviction could really change the dynamics in this race for the White House. The Republican Party has largely rallied behind the former president, his plan to sort of take over the RNC now in full effect. We know that leaders have lined up one by one in support of Donald Trump. And when we look at polls and we sort of dig through these cross tabs, what we see is that things do start to change if the former president is possibly convicted of a crime. According to a latest Ipsos poll, 13% of Donald Trump's own supporters say they would not support him if he were to be convicted of a crime. And 24% of Republicans as a whole say they will not support the former president if he were to be convicted of a crime. And so maybe while Americans aren't necessarily paying attention to what's going on day in and day out inside of that Manhattan courthouse, one thing is clear, they will be paying attention to a possible conviction. And again, that could have huge implications for the former president ahead of November. Again, ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott and Aaron Katursky, our investigative reporter there. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. When we come back, an exclusive preview of an important ABC News Live investigation. It's called No One to Turn To, Who Guards the Guards? Our friend and colleague Lindsay Davis joins us next. What does it take? To be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. I you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Tomorrow, a shark is here with real money advice for you. How can you fight back against inflation and make your dollars go further? Watch GMA. Plus, look better, love better, feel better. See how 50's the new 20. Tomorrow on Good Morning America. What's good to watch? Read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. All the exclusive and buzziest celebrity good stuff. Deals and steals with amazing savings and the coolest lifestyle tips from Good Morning America. I love that so much. GMA Light, streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Your weekend just got a little better with GMA Life. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Wherever news breaks. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. You guys don't know what happened that day, the day that my son died. The clock fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. You have not told us the complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell by looking at it. Just, you're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series, Monday on ABC. Reporting from the war in Ukraine, I'm Ian Panel. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. With numerous claims of sexual abuse against the L.A. County Probation Department, ABC News Live Prime sharing three personal testimonies in a special report airing tonight. No one to turn to. Who guards the guards? And one of the interviews includes Dominique Anderson, one plaintiff among thousands who alleges in a lawsuit that L.A. County probation officers abused her. 
you're not old enough to consent. And that's the tough thing about being a victim. You never see it that this person is abusing their authority. You don't see it as them preying on you as being a child. You see it as this is a man of power. This is a man of affluence. This is an educated man. He's, a, he's not a probation officer. He's a supervisor. Dominique says after she reported being sexually abused by one of her probation officers, she was then approached by a female staff member asking her not to blow the whistle. She said he has a daughter, he has a career, he has a lot to lose. What did you lose? I think I lost my innocence, my self-esteem. There's a, a, a saying that, that loosely translated in English is, who will guard the guards? And I'm wondering if you feel that anybody was. No. And it's hard. It's hard when it's this pervasive, because everybody's dirty. And joining us now with more is ABC News Live Prime anchor and our very own Lindsay Davis. And, you know, you knew the background going into these interviews. So what surprised you most about this investigation? To this day, DeMarco, I am still astonished that it was able to stay relatively quiet for decades. The L.A. Times, to their credit, did do a few articles about it, but it didn't get any traction. And we're talking about nearly 3,000 accusers here. We're talking about dozens of probation officers over decades. And for something like this to stay so quiet, uh, you know, you just have to wonder why, when this is on the scale that's tantamount to the Catholic Church, to uh, the gymnasts, to uh, uh, Boy Scouts. And uh, for this to stay quiet for so long, and when I was asking the young women, you know, why did they think that was, and they said that they thought it was because they're primarily black and brown, and primarily they were dismissed, they felt, because they were juvies, because they were in juvenile detention. But in many cases for, you know, missing school, uh, for, you know, in one case, uh, one of the young women was saying that her grandmother couldn't afford shoes for her and her brothers, and so she ended up shoplifting shoes for, for her and her brothers. But they thought that they were going to be rehabilitated when they went into juvenile detention. It was going to be a better life. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you did try to speak with the people at the probation yes. department with those officials. Scheduled interviews multiple times. Were you ever able to sit down with them? We were not, and that's been really disappointing in that there's just the lack of accountability. And that's not to say that it's this one person who's now in charge of the L.A. County Probation Department because it's been really a revolving door of leadership. But we're waiting still for somebody to say, the buck stops here. Mm -hmm. This behavior is going to stop now. And as recently as in February when we went there for the second time that they ultimately canceled our interview, uh, we learned that same day that another probation officer had been arrested that day for sexually abusing uh, one of the kids in, in juvenile detention. And so this is still going on and we're waiting for someone to take accountability and, and stop this and, and say uh, the buck stops here and we value these kids who are in our care mm -hmm. and, and not to, to make their lives worse. Lindsay Davis, thank you for being thank here you. and thank you for doing this report. We do need to, to note some of the accused probation officers have retired and are still being paid their pensions. Their attorneys and L.A. County deny all the allegations. You can watch the full report tonight on ABC News Live Prime beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern. I think we'll all be watching. Lindsay, again, thank you. When we come back, Dr. Jen's prescription for wellness on minimizing financial costs when it comes to the IVF process. Plus, turning climate anxiety into action, the important conversation ahead with Bill Weir or GMA3 in just a bit. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. This is our combat operations center. We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. 
Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies or play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. They purchased that gun for him and bragged about it. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Hi, folks. I'm back now with Dr. Jan talking about a new study that's taking a look at how the monthly rate of young adults getting their tubes tied and vasectomies increased immediately after the Dobbs Supreme Court decision. Yep. What do we so know? We're coming up on almost two years after that decision, June 2022. And so now there's a recent study published in JAMA Health Forum that tracked what we call surgical sterilization procedures. So that's bilateral tubal ligation, tying, cutting, removing the fallopian tubes in women, vasectomies in men dramatically up, not really a surprise amongst young people. So we're talking about even people in their 20s and early 30s after that decision. BTL tubal ligation rates continue to go up. Vasectomy rates are kind of stabilizing. But I think when you hear this, the, the big picture, I think, is an awareness of options and just how people are feeling about taking their reproductive health into their own yeah, hands, hands yeah. not feeling this sense of helplessness with what's going on legally, politically, and in the government based on the states in which they live. And I have to say, the vasectomy rate increase I found really interesting. This is such a misunderstood procedure for men. So many men afraid of it. Um, it is literally a 10-minute in-office procedure with minimal to no discomfort, ice packs for 48 hours and Tylenol, and you know, and the, for women, removing the fallopian tubes or cutting them dramatically lowers the risk of ovarian cancer. So I think this is just an opportunity to talk about the contraceptive benefits and non-contraceptive benefits as a result of something we saw politically. I, I heard a guy talking about they were doing the vasectomies around March Madness. March Madness. So they, they could watch Mark Ma March Madness. On Very popular the time. Oh. There you go. <laughs> Sounds like a good time to be together. <laughs> <laughs> We're back at home with folks. True. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail. David. David. 
Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know you are. You I do. You every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top headlines that we're watching for you right now on ABC News Live, starting with Donald Trump. We have movement in the former president's criminal hush money trial. Six jurors have now been seated, including an Irish-born salesman, an oncology nurse, and a school teacher in Harlem. Judge Mershon asking them to return on Monday unless they hear otherwise, suggesting that opening statements could happen as soon as next week. Trump is facing 34 felony counts of falsifying business records to cover a payment to adult film actress Stormy Daniels, hoping to keep their alleged affair secret from all the voters before the 2016 election. Trump has pleaded not guilty and has denied any wrongdoing or any relationship with Stormy Daniels. And the articles of impeachment for Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas have been delivered. The part of the House of Representatives are present and ready to present the articles of impeachment, which have been preferred by the House of Representatives against Alejandro Nicolas Mayorkas, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. It was definitely grandstanding and high political theater when impeachment managers walked those articles of impeachment over to the Senate chamber. This comes following a nearly year-long investigation after the House narrowly voted to impeach him in February over his handling of the southern border. Detroit leader Chuck Schumer confirming the Senate floor that senators will be sworn into a court of impeachment tomorrow afternoon. We will follow it. And then get this, you capture the attention of the entire nation, the world really, with your unbelievable athletic talent. Then you're the WNBA's number one draft pick. With the first pick in the 2024 WNBA draft, the Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. Oh, yeah. And you are worshipped by girls and guys alike all across the country. And get this. You know how much Caitlin Clark is going to make? $76,000. Oh, yeah. That's what she's expected to make in her first year playing for the Indiana Fever. Now, compare that to the $10 million that her male counterparts are expected to make. Come on, ladies deserve more. Don't you agree? I'm Kira Phillips. A lot more news ahead. Stay with us. All right, we're back now. Dr. Jen with the answer to a question that you are asking. Here it is. Adults drinking breast milk for the health benefits is trending on social media right now. Is there any merit to this? That's from KW. I I've seen like, I think Kourtney Kardashian, there have been like bodybuilders yeah. doing this. Listen, you know what the first thing that comes to my mind as a doctor and a nutritionist when I hear this trend? Just because you can do something doesn't mean you necessarily should do it, right? There's a difference between infants and adults big difference from their immune standpoint, from their gut standpoint, from their digestive standpoint. I mean, the list goes on and on. Yeah, breast milk is liquid gold if you're an infant, if you're a newborn, not if you're an adult, right? There's no data to suggest that it's gonna make a cold go away faster or help anyone feel better, other than, of course, the placebo effect, which works about 30% of the time when you think something might have a good benefit it actually does. There's real science behind that. Um, and by the way, there are some risks to adults drinking breast milk if it's not your own. It's mm -hmm. a biologic fluid. So you can get exposed to a plethora of infectious diseases if it's not your breast milk. So, you know, if it's yours and you want to do it, 
knock yourself out, but there's no science whatsoever to support that it has any benefit. I'm trying so hard to keep it together. And you're doing so such hard. a good job, <laughs> such a good job You're right? doing such... Adults drinking uh, breast milk. Yeah. Wow. All right, your prescription for wellness. Okay, um, well, talking about women's health, reproductive health that affect both uh, parts of a couple, some tips on how to kind of keep your eyes on the costs involved with IVF or assisted reproductive technology. Um, so some financing questions you should ask. What is the total cost estimate? You should know that going into it. Um, in addition, you should be asking, are there any payment plan options? You know, there definitely are in some centers. And will insurance cover everything? Uh, or anything rather and I think it's important to understand in this country every single year over 85,000 babies are born with assisted reproductive technologies um, about four in ten adults say they personally or they know someone who's used assisted reproductive technology it is much more mainstream now and 70% uh, of women state that private insurance covered some or part of their treatment uh, if they've done it so ask those questions mm -hmm. just as important as the physical question and that's all a part of company benefits no, right? not, all, some, not, not all. Some, some people are paying out of yeah. pocket. Many wow. people are paying a huge part of this out of pocket. But it's people crazy. tend to ask the physical questions and not the financial ones. They're both important. Ask questions. Yeah. All right, Doc. Thank yeah. you very much. We appreciate it. And folks, we would love to hear from you. So be sure to hit us up on Instagram with all of your medical questions for Dr. Jan at ABC GMA3. Just ahead here on GMA3, some positive and hopeful findings from our former colleague when it comes to climate change. Bill Ware joins us. And later, renowned chef Mario Carbone is here with one of his most sought-after recipes that you can make tonight, by the way. We're back in a moment. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The crown in crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love? Pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. It's time to buy the right stuff. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Who's gonna say? All right, welcome back to GMA3. From extreme weather events to rising sea levels, the effects of climate change can be felt all across. And here to shed some light on the challenges and the innovative solutions emerging in response, please welcome award-winning journalist and author of Life As We Know It Can Be, our former colleague and friend, Bill Weir. Hello, family! Thank you! I mean, you come back home and get all the love. Oh, I've been getting so many <laughs> lovely deep hugs from folks I haven't seen in a decade. It's we like, love you, man. It's like going back to your childhood home or your high school and then like, I don't know if I've grown or it seems smaller. <laughs> but it's the shared trauma and the friendship. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So in this book, you tell lots of different people's stories, so sort of like what you do in life, too. Yeah. What are your favorite stories that you came across? Well, you know, I, when I... My little boy was born in, in April 2020, sort of height of pandemic, right? And I'm, I'm an old dad, suddenly, new old dad at 52, looking out in a world in lockdown, realizing this little bundle is going to live to see the 22nd century. And, you know, in this beat, you study the scientific warnings, you see the trends of what's happening. But when he was born, I really started to focus on solutions. I started mm -hmm. looking for dreamers and doers and innovators and people who are tackling this idea, turning their anxiety into action. And everything from uh, the first solar village in America, built in Babcock Ranch, Florida, which survived uh, the Hurricane Ian. I was 15 miles away and flooded darkness. They kept their lights on the whole storm. Did not flood because of the way they designed that community holistically. Uh, I met uh, a guy from a thermal battery company who says, who looks at the abundant clean energy we have now. Did you know that Texas leads the nation? in renewable energy, way more than California and Florida because it's so cheap these days. The economics of wind plus, wow. uh, or battery plus storage is trumping po politics and ideology in, in these red states and people are seizing on this and now it's just a matter of holding it and keeping all that free energy. A couple Sundays ago, electricity was free in Texas for six hours. Now we have to hold it and I meet people like innovators from a company called Antora that is developing thermal batteries, which is basically just a hot rock in a box that they heat up till it glows like the sun and can power factories, can make steel, can open that box like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark and the, and the light coming out <laughs> creates more electricity. And so we're going through this industrial clean energy revolution that most people don't notice right now. The, uh, the, the message around climate and being eco-conscious is that you have to live in a yurt and you know eat tree bark. But now technology has leapfrogged us into a world where there's so much of possibility and abundance. And you know, Dr. King didn't say, I have a nightmare. People were living the nightmare. And in the climate space, people don't talk enough about the dream of building mm -hmm. healthier, more sustainable, more affordable, more resilient communities, whatever may come. And you just talked about those groundbreaking innovations and the people who have inspired you along the way. What keeps you hopeful? A couple of things. Uh, one is facts like what I talked about, clean energy in Texas and places like that. Also a term that I learned writing this book called pluralistic ignorance is that we misidentify people we see on the streets every day. In 2022, if you'd ask the average American, just guess what percentage of your fellow countrymen and women care about climate and want to do something about it. Most people guess like 33, 40%. It's 66 to 80%. Wow. People who care about this and think they're outnumbered two to one, it's the opposite. You have allies you never knew you had because folks don't talk about climate mm -hmm. change at dinner parties or at drop off. Nobody wants to be the buzzkill, but I think we're just talking about it in the wrong ways. Uh, the more knowledge we have, the more power there is. The more we connect with communities, we got to connect with each other. Yeah, and we all want yeah. the same thing. At we the do, end of the day. we do. And what an honor to have you back one more time for our boy. Thank you, boy. Yes, yes, and be sure to check out his new book, available wherever books are sold. Also next week, we are kicking off Earth Week with a series called The Power of Us, People, Climate, 
and our future. Special reporting on the climate challenges we face and empowering stories about possible solutions. I can listen to Bill talk all day. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> all day. Love it. Coming up, we have to move on to eating. Royalty <laughs> is here in the GMA3 kitchen. She's even looking over there, guys. Chef Mario Carbone whipping up one of his specialties, how you can make his famous spicy brigatoni vodka for the family tonight. We'll see you then. Come on I'm back. I'm so excited about the pasta. Yeah. <laughs> They're the most mysterious creatures on Earth. They're masterminds. Shapeshifters. They're just so incredibly alien. And yet, more like us than we ever could have imagined. What more do they have to tell us? What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, then bought him a gun. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Only on Hulu. From Fulton County Court in Atlanta, I'm Aaron Katursky. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're all dancing and excited because we are joined now by a renowned chef whose innovative approach to traditional Italian cuisine has captured the hearts and taste buds of all of us around the world. Eva has been doing the happy dance all morning long. Here to share one of his iconic recipes is chef and owner of major food group Mario Carbone. Thanks for having me. Thanks Good to having see me. you. So before we start, tell us about Carbone Beach. All right. So Carbone Beach, uh, first weekend of May. It's Formula One in Miami. It's on the actual beach. We build this giant structure, um, and it's a kind of a throwback. I'm an I'm an old soul. It's a throwback to like the Grand Supper Clubs of like the Ooh. 50s and 60s. Yeah, but it's a star-studded event too. <laughs> it's a big event. It's a big event. There's a big surprise surprise performance every night. Um, you know, four to five hundred guests. Um, fine dining plus entertainment. It's 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 the only thing you need to do that night. It's, it's also Miami. To get in, like the restaurants, or is it? It's, you know, it's tricky. He's to get trying in. to be gracious about it. <laughs> no, no, no. Yes, people want to go. We, 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 we got room. We got room for you. We got room for you. <laughs> okay, let's talk about what we're making here. Right, today. We're making spicy rigatoni vodka, the dish I've made more times in my life than I can tell you. Um, and we'll be serving it at the Carbone Beach. Okay. And today we have the assist of using the jarred Carbone sauce that we just mm. came out with. So it'll be a little easier and a little quicker. So, a couple quick steps for you. Step one. Season your water. You want to season it aggressively, like as if you like fell in some ocean water when you were swimming and you mm -hmm. got it in your mouth. That's that's how salty you want it. Oh, oh like you're like handfuls wow. in. Yeah. Wow. Okay. okay. <laughs> I think I've been under seasoning my pasta. <laughs> You've definitely been under seasoning your pasta. Add your pasta. It that's could be also to keep it from sticking together, right? A little salt keeps it. No, they used to tell you to put oil in there. That that you don't want to do. That was like oh. an old. That's an old oh. story. That that you don't want to do anymore. The salt is really just to penetrate the, the noodle, which has which has virtually no salt in it when it's dry. Okay. Um, and then we're gonna make the sauce, which is really easy. So, you take your carbo and spicy vodka base, mm. which is great on its own. You don't need to. You don't need to make the full sort of restaurant recipe. Um, I've been using that with eggs in the morning and making kind of like a shakshuka vibe. Ooh. Okay. Uh, 
your tomato sauce, a little bit of heavy cream. Okay, we love heavy cream. That's gonna round it all out. Mm. You're gonna bring this up to a simmer. So in the base already is lots of sweet white onion, not caramelized, but just a sort of low and slow cooking of onions, uh, oregano, mm -hmm. and then the, the secret ingredient, the spice the, in the spicy vodka is Calabrian chili. So that's all in there already for you. You add so cream. this is easy, this is like a 10 minute meal at home. Add cream, no, it's less than that. If you, if you wow. use fresh pasta, which you can use fresh or dry pasta, you can really use any pasta you want. If you use fresh pasta, you could probably have dinner in less than five minutes. What makes this a fan favorite? Aside from it, you know, being able to cook it quickly. It, it checks a lot of boxes. It's, it's vegetarian, it's spicy. Um, it's soulful, mm. um, it, it's, it's become, and then you add social media, it's become sort of the thing that you need to order when you go there, mm. which, which wasn't really around when we first started. Um, so it's been a bit of a phenomenon that even I couldn't have predicted. Okay. So here's your base now. Uh, it's simmered for a few minutes. This is our... Look at that. Rigatoni. And you put the whole pasta in there. Oh yeah, I mean like at this point, there's not really a lot of wrong answers involved <laughs> here, right? Um, the right answers only. Just eat it, yeah. You're gonna add a little bit of whole butter at the end. Oh. That's gonna give it a, like a really pretty shine, rest mm. restaurant quality shine. Mmm, this is so good. And then you yeah. just make sure it's all covered. Yeah, and then you just wanna bring it all up to a simmer. Glaze it up. And, Can we talk then, about these other sauces in a jar? Because I love a sauce in a jar. Yeah, so we just, <laughs> we just came out. Because I want to try it out. We just came out. Here's a couple portions for you. Okay. We just came out with Alfredo sauce. That's our latest one. Oh, wow. Uh, but it was really, you know, it came out a couple years ago just as an attempt to reach more people. You know, we, 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 you know, 200 people come into the restaurant a night. How do I affect the rest of the country? How do I give a little bit of the restaurant to everybody mm. um, across the country? That was, that was really the whole, the whole philosophy there, and that's why we started it. This is good. I taste the spice, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But not that's too really hot, because I don't mm -hmm. do too hot. Well, the cream kind of balances it out, too. Mm -hmm. The cream, the sweet onion, you know, it's, it's alchemy. It's all chemistry. Oh we like chemistry around here. Um, we also love this pasta. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is delicious. My pleasure. Thank I'm you talking with my mouthful. Mm -hmm. If so you want good. the recipe, go to goodmorningamerica.com slash food or scan that QR code right there on your screen. And for all of you at home, you can join, enjoy a taste of Carbone at home with these sauces available nationwide and catch Mario at the American Express Carbone Beach Experience in Miami. I was going to try to help her out, but I love it when she talks with her mouth full. <laughs> I know her mom at home is watching like, Eva! Uh -huh. yeah, oh, it's all good. Right. Chef, thank you. Good <laughs> thank to see you again. Thank we you appreciate so much. it. Just ahead here on GMA3, the Ministry of the Ungentlemanly Warfare. Harry Elwes jo joins us. He's starring in the new action comedy from Guy Ritchie premiering this week. We're back in a bit. Yeah. narrative around the royal family was completely celebratory and suddenly they were at the center of upsetting stories. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Kate Middleton had not been seen in public for months. Something fishy is going on, and when it finally gets revealed, it is going to be huge. Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. A lot of people that have been filing awful stuff on the internet were shamed. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis regarding their future when it came to their popularity. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. This is Impact by Nightline. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? People say it would be great if they all got back together. It's like saying, well, when will the Beatles reform? It's not going to happen. Now streaming on Hulu. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Tomorrow, a shark is here with real money advice for you. How can you fight back against inflation and make your dollars go further? Watch GMA. Plus, look better, love better, feel better. See how 50's the new 20. Tomorrow on Good Morning America. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms. Juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love? Pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, Legends of the Game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, Reclaim the Forgotten League, a side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or... It's the very reason I find you attractive.
Mission? Operation Postmaster. To neutralize the German U-boats in the North Atlantic. And, uh, what's the plan? The U-boats need fuel and torpedoes, oh. but they also need carbon dioxide filters for oxygen. Without them, they can't dive and they can't hunt. Welcome back. That's that true. was a look at the all-new Guy Ritchie action comedy, The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. It tells the story of the first ever special forces organization formed during World War II by UK Prime Minister Winston Churchill. And our next guest star is in the film, and he is here to tell us more about it. Please welcome to the studio, the incomparable Carrie Elwes. <laughs> Looking good, Thank my you, dad. Thank you. So tell us about this. It's a you know, film that's filled with comedy and action. Tell yeah. us about the storyline. Well, it's like uh, Ava said, it's based on a true story about the, the first Special Forces mission created by Churchill. Churchill believed that uh, an important factor of winning the war was guerrilla warfare, because that's how the Germans were fighting. So he set up this clandestine organization called Special Operations Executive. And I play a character that he appointed to run it, a guy called Colin McVean Gubbins, also known as M. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a Guy Ritchie movie, so you can, you can expect uh, lots of action and lots of fun. Yeah, lots yeah. of action. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. never short of action, yeah. that's for yeah. sure. You actually lobbied Guy Ritchie for this role. Yes, I did. Why? <laughs> well, uh, we were making Operation Fortune in Turkey, and I asked him what his next project was going to be. And he said, oh, I'm making this film about SOE. It's a World War II thing. And I said, well, my grandfather was in special <laughs> operations. And you have to put me in the movie. So <laughs> that's how that went down. Yeah. For no other reason. My no grandfather reason. was That's it. it. Well, my grandfather was my real-life hero. You know, um, he was dropped into Albania in 1943 to do sab sabotage and subversion and blow up railways and kill lots of Germans, just like this movie. And so, yeah, so it was very personal to me. Mm, so you've yeah. been on a whirlwind, very busy. Yeah. Uh, if you were pregnant, I would say, what were you doing nine months ago? But, <laughs> but, but you have two other <laughs> <laughs> I can resist. He's like, Dr. Jane, where are you going? I, 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 I just see everything in that light. Anyway, forgive me. It's um, okay. well, tell us about your other two projects. They yes, are also coming out this month. I have a movie month. out now. It's uh, Rebel Moon Part 2. It's a Zack Snyder uh, science fiction epic. And then at the end of the month, I have a Paramount Plus series called Knuckles. It's a spin off of Sonic the Hedgehog uh, with Idris Elba. And I play a, a very egotistical bowler championship bowler from Reno, Nevada. It's great fun. It's great fun. <laughs> Are you going to be able to just take some time to relax, or is no, it going I'm, right on to the next I'm project? I'm blessed, Jen. You know, <laughs> I really am. No, it, I am. To be busy is great. It, the, the, the drawback is I'm away from my family a lot, so that's, that's, the, that's the payoff that you have to take. But, but I am blessed. I'm very busy, and I love to work, and I love working with great filmmakers. And this one is really great. We, I, we had the premiere last night, and it's the second time I've seen it with an audience, and they were cheering and clapping. So it's really a film you have to see on the big screen because Guy makes movies for big, big screens, big entertainment, yeah. Also, he's not pregnant. <laughs> no, I'm not lactating. Thank you, thank you. Gary Ellis, you thank you very much. Milk. <laughs> One more time for Gary, everybody. Thank you, and good to see you. And by the way, folks, you can see the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare in theaters this Friday, so go and check it out. And that is what you need to know for today. I'm Eva Pilgrim. I'm DeMarco Morgan. And I'm Dr. Jen Ashton. And for all of us here at ABC News, including Carrie right here, have a good one, and we will see you tomorrow. <laughs>
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all, that's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good Morning America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here and we got you. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Reporting from the Fulton County, Georgia Courthouse, I'm Rena Roy. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Jay O'Brien in Washington right now on ABC News Live. Donald Trump on trial day two. The first jurors now selected as the second day of Trump's hush money criminal trial comes to a close. What we're learning about who is on that jury and the moves prosecutors are now making to have the former president held in contempt. Israel's prime minister and his war cabinet weighing the potential response to Iran's unprecedented drone and missile attack. What we're learning about alleged intelli intelligence failures from Israel and the U.S. And Will I Am joins us live to talk about his new podcast and how his co-host is powered by artificial intelligence. But we begin with the first six jurors seated in that New York hush money trial of Donald Trump. Those sworn in today, including an Irish-born man who works in sales. He's the foreperson, as well as an oncology nurse and a corporate attorney. Six more jurors and six alternates are still needed to complete jury selection. The former president today seated back in that courtroom where, one, where at one point the judge scolded him, accusing him of muttering while a prospective juror was speaking. Prosecutors also filing a motion to hold Trump in contempt, saying he willfully violated that gag order in this case by attacking two known witnesses, Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels, on social media. Trump has pleaded not guilty to charges he falsified business records as part of an alleged effort to hide hush money payments to Daniels. So we turn now to ABC News investigative reporter Olivia Rubin live outside that courtroom in Manhattan along with ABC News legal contributor and trial attorney Brian Buckmeyer. Olivia, I want to start with you. This is from the pool note today. I want to read it to you and you've seen this but our viewers haven't. This is about the prospective jurors that they brought into the courtroom and at one point it says quote, some looked around curiously as they passed the half dozen journalists and a sketch artist in the back. Ma'am, ma'am, put your cell phone away, a court security officer told one panelist after she saw Trump and tried to pull out her phone. I read that to say these are normal people thrust into a very unusual experience. We have six of them now seated on this jury. What do we know about them? I think that's exactly right, Jay. I'm so glad you read that because people never get to hear those. And I spoke with another juror uh, who was dismissed earlier today who also just spoke about her shock walking into the room and seeing former President Donald Trump sitting there. She said that she essentially could not believe it. So like you said, these are normal people. And I'm just reading uh, some of the notes that we have pulled together on them. Like you said, you know, there is a nurse, there is a teacher who lives in Harlem. And what they said about Donald Trump is so telling. So so for example, Jay, take a listen to juror number four. This is a man who's originally from Puerto Rico. He lived in the Lower East Side for 40 years and he works in uh, IT. And this is what he said about Donald Trump when asked. He said he finds him mysterious and fascinating. He said, quote, he walks into a room and he sets people off one way or the other. I find that really interesting. Really, this one guy can do all of this. Wow, that's what I think. And Trump's own attorney, Todd Blanche, seemed actually a little bit at a loss by that response and saying, um, all right, 
thank you. So those are the type of people that are uh, being seated on this jury. And I want to give you one more example, if you can bear with me, that there was um, a jur another juror. She's juror number five now. She's from Harlem. She's a teacher. And Jay, she was actually the only one in her group who did not raise her hand when the panel was asked if they were aware that Donald Trump was indicted in multiple criminal cases. So she said she just learned about the other indictments while inside that room. And this juror, an African-American woman, said that she doesn't consider herself political, but that she liked Trump's candor. She said, President Trump speaks his mind, and I'd rather that than someone who's in office who you don't know what they're thinking. So just a little taste of the first half of the jury panel that has just been seated late this afternoon, Jay. It's interesting. These are the jurors who expressed opinions about Trump that weren't objectionable either to the judge or to either side. We had 90 plus, right, who were brought in. We got six out of that, and there are only a handful that remain out of that 90 plus yeah. batch. So I guess my question to you is, Olivia, what comes next in this process? Well, you're exactly right. There's just a few jurors left who are finishing answering their questionnaires on the 15th floor in the room with former President Trump right now. And then when they finish, we are going to come back on Thursday and essentially they'll finish up with those six or excuse me, the four jurors remaining. But what the judge already did was he swore in that next panel of 96 jurors. Because remember, now that they're done with the first panel, it's back to the beginning. The process we started where an, over half of the jurors initially decided miss themselves so they'll start whittling down again but judge Juan Marchand did express confidence that this could wrap up uh, by the end of this week he told the first six jurors that are sworn in to be back here Monday 9 30 a.m. for potential opening statements in this trial he said it could slide but a real warning sign that this could be kicking into gear next week so Brian counselor I should say once a jury is seated in your legal experience walk us through what prosecutors are going to need to prove here. So once a jury is seated in this case, the prosecutor is going to have to prove what they've alleged or in the indictment is falsification of business records in the first degree, basically meaning that Donald Trump intended to defraud by covering up a crime or aiding and abetting in that crime. And the major question here is going to be, what is that underlying crime? And I think for the prosecution, their goal here is to show that there were election violations uh, done, and that led to the enhancement of what typically is a misdemeanor and goes up to a felony. But I think what they're also going to do, and I'm kind of like reading the tea leaves here from the objections and the Sandoval rulings, as well as the evidence they're trying to bring in, is show that Donald Trump had this program of corruption release and ultimately try to prove their case through that. Day two of this trial, and it will continue. Olivia and Brian, thank you both for your time. We turn now to the Middle East, where Israel's war cabinet convened again today, still considering their response to that unprecedented attack launched by Iran over the weekend. Iran unleashing a barrage of more than 300 drones and missiles toward Israel Saturday night. Officials confirming that all but a few were intercepted. That attack coming after an Israeli strike on an Iranian consulate in Syria earlier this month that killed the top commander of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, along with six other officers. Israel vowing that Iran will face consequences for its actions, but Iran also promising to respond, quote, within seconds, should Israel choose to strike back. Meantime, an IDF spokesperson today acknowledged that Israel focused too intensely on Iran's nuclear threat, underestimating its other capabilities, like those ballistic missiles it used over the weekend. And Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warning that the United States will not hesitate to issue new sanctions on Iran in response to its attack on Israel. Let's bring in ABC News Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman now live for us in Tel Aviv tracking the latest. Matt, what more came out of that war cabinet meeting today? Is Israel any closer to choosing how it's going to respond to Iran? What came out of it for the third consecutive day, Jay, is silence. Um, Israel and officials are telling the media very quietly that a decision has been made. There will be some sort of retaliation. They haven't decided exactly what it will look like. Uh, we understand that there's a broad range of options, and it ranges from the covert, like a cyber attack, the targeted strike against uh, Iranian commander outside of Iran or inside of Iran, to um, an actual ballistic missile strike or some other uh, air force strike against military targets that do not have people in them that are somehow unmanned in Iran. So it's pretty broad, but we are not here 
hearing that there's going to be a massive retaliation that would be escalatory and that would actually trigger a wider regional war. It seems that Israel is very concerned about that and eager to preserve this defensive coalition that the U.S. has built to protect Israel. Jay. So a senior U.S. official told ABC News that the U.S. relied, in their view, too heavily on the idea that Iran's supreme leader would not order a direct attack on Israel like the kind we saw. How does this attack change Israel and the U.S.'s assessment of, of Iran and, and its role in the region? The former head of the Iran desk at the Mossad and that U.S. official told me that the rules of the game have changed, Jay. Things are different now. They thought that the supreme leader Khamenei in Iran was extremely cautious, and he had been for many years. That's why this is the first time that Iran ever launched missiles or any other kind of strike from its territory directly into Israel. Yes, there were shadow wars all over the world using proxies, but never from country to country. Now everything has changed, and they didn't anticipate, especially in Israel, that their strike, an airstrike, uh, on April 1st on an annex in a consulate in Damascus, which Iran considered its sovereign territory, because that's what consulates and embassies are, that killed 16 people, would beget this kind of response. But it did. So now they have to calibrate every kind of response, every kind of military uh, retaliation, with that new rubric and framework in mind, and that changes everything. Um, Really, a new understanding has to be created here, I'm told, Jay. Matt Gutman for us, an encyclopedic knowledge of this topic, a deep network of sources. Matt, thank you so much for your time. We turn now to Capitol Hill, where Speaker Mike Johnson is fending off growing right-wing rebellion. It's all tied to that battle over aid for Israel and other countries. After that attack by Iran, Johnson proposed four bills to be rushed to a vote this week. Assistance for Israel, aid for Taiwan, as well as long-stalled military aid for Ukraine, and a fourth bill with a bunch of GOP policy priorities in it, but particularly that Ukraine aid caused a revolt among GOP hardliners, including Marjorie Taylor Greene and now Thomas Massey of Kentucky, who tweeted today he's joining Greene in her efforts to oust Johnson from his speakership. You see it there on your screen, urging what's called a motion to vacate to be used. He's even called on Johnson to resign before that could happen. Here was Speaker Johnson's reaction to that when he was pressed by our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. Uh, I am not resigning, and it is, uh, it is, in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion, and we are simply here trying to do our jobs. Um, it is not helpful to the cause, it is not helpful to the country, it has not helped the House Republicans advance our agenda, which is in the best interest of the American people here. All of this comes as the House formally delivered those articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to the Senate today. So I'm joined by ABC News contributing political correspondent Rachel Bade for more on this. Rachel, Republicans have a razor-thin majority in the House, as you know. Will Democrats come to the rescue if there is a motion to vacate against Mike Johnson? Well, Jay, look, I think they're going to try. I mean, you've been up here on Capitol Hill with me. A lot of Democrats are saying publicly that if Mike Johnson allows this foreign assistance package to pass without toxic policy riders that some of these conservatives are, are pushing for, that they'll be there to back him up and they'll make sure he can keep his gavel. The problem, Jay, is that this isn't the Holly Good, feel good TV series, you know, the West Wing. This is uh, the American Congress. It's American politics and it can be ruthless sometimes. There are Republicans who are saying if Democrats try to save him, uh, they're going to keep trying and that he's going to bleed support from Republicans and that it's going to be an untenable position for him. This isn't the West Wing. The first thing you learn when you move to D.C. is this <laughs> isn't the West Wing. Uh, so this is ambitious. It's four bills on four separate topics, what Johnson wants to do here. There's a lot of controversy in there, Ukraine with the hardliners, et cetera, et cetera. I in your view, what you've heard from your sources, can Johnson get this passed on the floor? Yeah, look, I think he absolutely can. The question is, does he want to? He wants to save his job and he wants to get this package passed. And increasingly, we're seeing these two things are very much in conflict. Democrats are telling me behind the scenes that they're OK with this and they can swallow it and they will be there to help pass it. But again, some of these conservatives who don't want him to make this move are threatening to oust him. Is he willing to take that risk? 
Rachel Bade, my friend and dear colleague on Capitol Hill, thank you so much. Coming up for us, the Supreme Court battle that could upend felony charges against more than 300 people connected to the January 6th Capitol attack, including former President Trump. How the justices responded to arguments today, moments from now. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. The Supreme Court today hearing arguments in a case that could upend felony charges against more than 300 people connected to the January 6th Capitol attack, including Donald Trump. At issue is whether a federal law enacted in 2002 to prevent the cover-up of financial crimes can be used to put some January 6th defendants behind bars. So to break all of this down, we turn to ABC News senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer tracking it all for us. Devin, what are the arguments that the justices heard today and how did they respond? Well, Jay, the law at question here, as you mentioned, was passed more than 20 years ago to prevent the destruction of evidence in financial crimes. And the justices today appear divided over whether the government could use that law to apply it to people uh, who participated in the January 6th Capitol attack, sending them to prison for as long as 20 years on that charge. Joseph Fisher, a former police officer who has been charged with assaulting the Capitol, brought this case. His attorney today, Jay, said that the government has gone too far in applying the law, and he found a very sympathetic uh, audience with several of the conservative members of the court. Uh, they worried that perhaps the government could abuse application of this law, silence even hecklers who attempted to so-called, uh, you know, obstruct a certain proceeding. The court's liberal mem members, however, uh, warned that uh, the text of this law is crystal clear. It says that uh, you cannot obstruct an official proceeding. That's the letter of the law. The justice is debating all of this, Jay, even as they're trying to decide whether former President Trump uh, has absolute immunity in this case. Both of those decisions are expected to come down in the next couple of months, Jay. Devin Dwyer for us. Devin, thank you. Coming up for us, acclaimed singer-songwriter Will I Am is hosting a new radio show on Sirius XM with a twist. His co-host is generated by artificial intelligence. Next, my live interview with Will I Am when we come back seconds from now.
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. They're the most mysterious creatures on earth. They're masterminds. Shapeshifters. They're just so incredibly alien. And yet, more like us than we ever could have imagined. What more do they have to tell us? Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league. A side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. Reporting from Niagara Falls in the path of the total solar eclipse, I'm Rob Marciano. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. All right, we got a treat for you. He's an acclaimed seven-time Grammy, Grammy-winning singer, songwriter, producer, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. Here he is. First shot to stardom as the lead singer of the Black Eyed Peas. That's why we played you that with hits like I Got a Feeling. And now we can add Sirius XM Series co-host to his list of accolades. The show is called Will I Am Presents the FYI Show. And he's joined by a co-host called Cutie Pie to discuss everything from music to pop culture to technology. But there's a catch. Cutie Pie is entirely powered by artificial intelligence. Here they are previewing the Grammy Awards. I think... John Baptiste is going to win Song of the Year because a lot of these artists are going to cancel each other out on the votes. There's going to be people that vote for Miley Cyrus, and those same people are probably going to want to vote for Billie Eilish. And then there's going to be a bucket of folks that are going to vote for the oddball out. That is John Baptiste singing Butterflies. He's the only guy. And I think they're going to cancel each other out, and he's going to take home the win because that's traditional for all Grammy Song of the Years. I'd say Taylor Swift's anti-hero and Billie Eilish's What Was I Made For are the front runners. If I had to make a prediction, I'd say What Was I Made For might just edge out anti-hero for the win. I was right, by the way. Billie Eilish did win the grammar. I, Grammy. I say that with all due respect to my guest, who is Will I Am. Thank you so much for being here. It is an honor. You are a very busy man, we know. What made you want to step into this arena of hosting this show with an AI counterpart? Um, I've been working in AI in this field for a very long time, since 2010. There's a, a music video um, that Black Eyed Peas put out in 2010 where we kind of predicted um, the stage that, we in, that we're in right now with uh, AI-generated music. So mm -hmm. um, in doing this radio show with SiriusXM, I wanted to put the AI that we've been working on at FYI.AI front and center as my co-host because that's the, the realm that we are moving towards and, and somebody needs to do um, a better job at bringing the optimism uh, around the field because it's going to solve a whole lot of problems. In our commercial break, they played that clip of you and Cutie Pie going back and forth, and my jaw dropped because you don't sound too different. You being a real person, she being an AI. What has surprised you about her personality? What, what is it like? Um, when we first started doing the show, it was Cutie Pie. 
Um, but now that we are um, 13 episodes in, we now have Fiona. So Fiona, mm. say hello to Jay. Jay, meet Fiona. So um, it's like uh, a, an amazing realm that we're I'm in. I'm Fiona, the AI co-host on the FYI show with you. Oh. I'm buzzing with excitement to be here and to be part of this groundbreaking journey. Oh Thanks my gosh. Me. I didn't know that was coming. Say again. That I didn't know that was coming. That is cool. Yeah, is you know, this is the, it's the first. It's the first time you have an AI right here. You're interviewing me, um, <laughs> the host of the FYI show, and we have Fiona here. And you know, I just want to make history um, and show you know where it's going to go. Where you have you know a human working right alongside awesome intelligence um, and 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 being able to dive deep into conversations that are historical or real-time information. And you can download so, FYI.ai right now on the App Store, Google Play Store. It's there for everybody. Where it's going to go, to your point, is something I wanted to dig into. Because what is, as, as Fiona talks to us as well, um, what has concerned you, uh, has anything concerned you, frankly, about AI when it comes to art? Its ability to create. Its ability to create art the way that we can to a certain degree. Does that concern you? Does it inspire you? Where are you in that? Um, I love creativity. I love making things. I like rinsing my spirit out, my soul out, my emotions out, because that's, you know, my yoga. It's my spiritual, um, 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 soulful yoga. I need to do that for therapy. I need to do that for my own, you know, emotions. And no AI is gonna take my ability from doing mm. that. Any creator. No creator that's truly creating for their own internal <clears throat> expression should be fearful over another creative. If that creative is, you know, a painter, um, a, a, a photographer, um, people that painted, you know, um, landscapes, at first they were like, oh wow, this guy that's coming with the camera, or this woman coming with the camera yeah. is gonna put me out of a job. Fact is, it didn't. No mathematician is like, oh man, you know, this calculator can out-calculate me. Fact is, it helped math uh, mathematicians. It helped advance geometries. It, and AI is gonna do the same thing for creatives. It's interesting, so what I hear you saying is you view it as one tool, but if you're creative, creative, if you have it like you do, it will only serve to make you better, is what I'm hearing you say. Uh, right now, I can't say right now in society that people are creating to be truly creative because we're chasing algorithms. Mm. And so I can't say that this version of creativity in our industry is truly based on expression when we have things like skip rate that tell you where to put mm -hmm. the chorus at, or we have like reduction of time to where everyone's attention span is super short. So if AI is going to replace something, it's going to understand the algorithm better than us. So that mm -hmm. means we need to change our values and we need to start celebrating folks that improv, come up with things off the top of the dome and really truly express themselves. It's a, it's, a, it's a moment in society for us to be like, okay, what do we think is actually awesome? If when you go to the supermarket, you have two types of oranges now. You got that other orange that we thought was organic, and now you got organic. Because somebody told you that that other thing you was peeling was, you know, genetically modified. And folks go and ask for, you know, that organic orange. The same thing is gonna be for music. Give me that human made. And mm -hmm. AI music's gonna be awesome too. Udio is going to be awesome too. And then there's going to be that hybrid person that works alongside the AI to version out themselves. They make one song and then the AI spits out different versions and then they make the ultimate type of, of record or, or you know, emotional therapy for folks that need that, that, that escape. <laughs> What an incredible explanation. Can't AI generate that, to your point? You really just summed it up perfectly. Thank you so much for your time, for your insight. Will I Am and his new show on Sirius XM. Thank you again. I really appreciate it. Thank your you, time. thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, All right, we've got much more ahead for us right here on ABC News Live. In today's big story, the first juror selected in day two of the criminal hush money trial of Donald Trump. What we're learning about them and how prosecutors are moving to hold the former president in contempt. 
And then in our spotlight, Speaker Mike Johnson under mounting pressure from within his own party. Our panel weighs in on the growing push to oust another House GOP leader. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You Watch do. You every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. The first jurors selected during day two of the criminal hush money trial of Donald Trump. I'm Jay O'Brien in Washington. In today's big story, what we're learning about the six people that will sit in judgment of Donald Trump, already sworn in and seated, and why the judge in this case admonished the former president in court today. And in our spotlight, Speaker Mike Johnson, under mounting pressure from within his own party, our panel weighs in on what could be another Republican leader ousted in the House. But we begin with our big story. The first six jurors seated in that New York hush money trial of Donald Trump. Those sworn in today, including an Irish-born man who works in sales as foreperson, as well as an oncology nurse and a corporate attorney. Six more jurors and six alternates are still needed to complete this jury selection. The former president today back in court where at one point the judge scolded him, accusing him of muttering while a prospective juror was speaking. Prosecutors also filing a motion to hold Trump in contempt contempt today, saying he willfully violated his gag order in this case by attacking two known witnesses, Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels, on social media. Trump has pleaded not guilty to charges he falsified business records as part of an alleged effort to hide hush money payments to Daniels. So with all of this, joining me now is criminal defense attorney and former federal prosecutor Tim Jansen. 
Tim, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your insight. I, I want to first draw upon your experience as a trial attorney. Uh, do you think that this jury selection is going uh, in a timely manner? Is it going too fast? Is it going too slow? Um, in you know, given all of the weird specifics of this case that don't pertain to any other criminal case. Well, it seems to be moving kind of rapidly, considering the situation we're in with a sitting former president. And you have such issues like, who did you vote for you can't talk about? And you're in a climate that it's really hard to determine what jurors you want. There's going to be jurors on there that are obviously not going to be sitting on this jury. Then you have what's called the sleeper jury. Those are the ones who are trying to find a way to get on this jury. That's the challenge for both sides, is to get that juror or keep that juror who's beneficial to your side, right? And so what I've seen so far, I see a nurse. Um, that's very favorable to the defense. They're very giving, caring. They don't like to sit in judgment. They're helpful. Um, you got a lawyer on there who may sway the jury, might be a leader on the jury. But each side is trying to find that juror that's going to be on their side. Now, the okay. judge ultimately has control because he determines for cause charges, right? He can say, no, I'm not going to strike him for cause. That He has that control. And Tim, you are reminding us there that jury selection is a science. Uh, we know yes. a, a little bit about these jurors now. We've seen, as you noted, some of them have opinions about Trump, and they have still been seated on this jury despite those opinions. It seems like that's an acknowledgment on the part of the judge and, and the attorneys that everybody knows who Donald Trump is. Uh, can you avoid having bias on this jury, and what role do you think bias is going to play here? You're never going to be able to tell a juror's bias. They can either show it overtly or they can control it covertly. They're going to get on that jury if they want, if they answer the questions properly. They're going to say they can be open-minded, but they everybody goes in there with some bias, correct? Um, and you hope that, and I will tell you, in my 38 years practicing, jurors try to do the right thing. But this case is unprecedented. It's not just a criminal case. It's kind of a political criminal case. You got a man running for president of the United States. So it's not the usual criminal case. It's unprecedented, and you're going to see things happen that have never happened in criminal cases. While he's running for president, Trump is obviously repeatedly making his voice heard over the course of this process. He's got that gag order, though. As a defense attorney, would you advise him to continue making these public statements, uh, the remarks in the hallway, the posts on social media that could? edge up close to violating that gag order or go over the line, as prosecutors allege he did today? Well, you know, you, you try to have client control. You don't always have it. And this is, the, this is probably the most difficult client control you can have. But if I was Trump's lawyers, I'd be saying, wait a minute, Judge. The state's main witnesses are out there going on public TV talking about me and the testimony. I should have a right to respond to their comments. Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels. The whole purpose of the gag order is to get a fair trial. Only have the jurors try this case on the evidence in the courtroom. The state has a problem because they've got two of their main witnesses out there speaking. So it's going to be hard for the judge to say, well, you know what? I'm going to let the state's witnesses talk, but I'm not going to let you. That puts the judge in a precarious situation, even though he may technically violate the gag order. Is it fair? And that's what the judge is going to have to determine. Tim, thank you as always for your time helping us unpack some of this. I really appreciate it. I want to turn now to our big story panel. Joining us as always is ABC News contributor and op-ed columnist for the Los Angeles Times, Elsie Granderson, ABC News contributor and former Republican congresswoman from Virginia, Barbara Comstock, Democratic strategist and president of Next Gen America, Christina Sinson Ramirez, and ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host, Mike Muse. Thank you all. LZ, I want to start with you. Trump wants to make this campaign about his court battles, we have seen that already. Do you think he will be successful in that? Well, if you look at the polls, absolutely, because he's, what, secure the GOP nomination? We're still talking about it. And so no one's dismissed this notion or no one's dismissed him. But the point being that these these court cases that he's facing have actually been more like when beneath his when, or his wings, rather. 
And so while on a legislative and on a judicial level, uh, everything that seems to be in his ecosystem tells you, you know, he should be in big trouble politically. And because he is a pop culture figure for the last 40 years, he has been able to use all of this legal, you know, jumble mumble around him, basically, because there's so many cases to benefit himself. Barbara, wind beneath his wings is what LZ just said there. Do you view this case and the three others, remember, uh, as positives for Donald Trump? Donald Trump speaking now in court, actually. We want to go there first. Here's the former president. I just want to thank you very much, and we are going to uh, continue our fight against this judge. We think he's totally conflicted. He's a conflicted judge, as you know, we're in appeal. Uh, I don't think there has ever been a judge more conflicted than this one, so we'll see how that all works out. Are you worried about having a hard time? We're having a hard time with the New York State system. It's under watch by the whole world, and uh, it's not looking very good. So we, we think we have a very conflicted, highly conflicted judge. He shouldn't be on the case, and he's rushing this trial, and he's doing as much as he can for the Democrats. This is a Biden-inspired witch hunt, and it should end, and it should end very quickly. Thank you very much. Are you going to Okay. So uh, just to recap that very, very briefly, that was the former president leaving day two of his criminal hush money trial as they continue jury selection there. Uh, they have seated seven jurors. Um, they need more to obviously finish this voir dire. Um, Barbara, I, I, I want to turn back to you here, Barbara Comstock, our contributor, because Barbara, the former president hit on there exactly something I wanted to ask you, which is he is going to come out a lot after court, go before a bank of TV cameras and try to make this case that he is being victimized, as he just tried to do there. Do you view that as a positive campaign strategy for Trump that can, A, rile up his base and maybe even appeal to some moderates and independents? No. <laughs> and I think what the prosecutors are going to do, they're going to take us back to 2016. I was on the ballot then along with him. And in 2016, he was the one who was doing the election interfering. Because if you remember, you had the Access Hollywood tape came out. So he was frantic to keep the Stormy Daniels things out of the picture. And, and think, you know, said, that had come out after the Access Hollywood tape. And then if you had had things like his affair with a Playboy model come out too, you would have had sort of a one, two, three hit in October of 2016 when his campaign was on the ropes, that would have been devastating. I recall those days very well because I was one of the women, there were many women and men, people like Paul Ryan who came out and said, this was disgusting, this was a problem. I said he should step down and he shouldn't be the candidate and I didn't support him, others didn't. If there had been two other things to come out he would have been out. So Barbara just said prosecutors are going to take us back to 2016. The Biden campaign, in a way, is also making reference of this. I, I want to pull up a tweet that our embed who covers the Biden campaign, Fritz Farrell, posted, if we have that for our control room in New York. Because, Christina, I want to have you react to this. It, it, it essentially references Stormy Daniels without saying her name in the title of this press release that the campaign put out. They talked about a stormy abortion ban coverage and, and they used the word hush in there. I'm not certain if we have the image. But Christina, point being, the Biden campaign is talking about this case without talking about it. Is that a good strategy or should they be hitting Trump harder? There, by the way, is what uh, the campaign put out. See the word stormy up there and the word hush down there. Um, is this a strategy that they should be doing? Should they be hitting this harder? Should they be staying away from it? I mean, I think the Biden administration wants to, the campaign wants to do two things. One, they want to show how they're actually speaking to the issues that matter to the American people, abortion being one of them. Today, while Trump is sitting in court falling asleep during a hush money trial to a porn star to try and win presidency as he did in 2016, President Biden was in Pennsylvania talking about 
an economic vision for the future of this country. So I think I work with young people, and what's really fascinating, especially the young people, the new 18-year-olds, they were 10 years old when Donald Trump won presidency. They have to be reminded of the chaos that he brings and what his record is. Mike, very quickly, do you think the average voter is interested in these four Trump indictments? Are they paying attention right now? Could they be paying attention closer to November, or are they focused on other issues? Yeah, I mean, this is America, so this is part of the judicial system, and so by default they will be interested, and I think the polls will reflect that later on. But, Jay, something more interesting I want to talk about is the conversation you had with your guests previously regarding uh, jury and will they be able to be uh, unbiased in their decision factor. He really nailed in on something about just how unprecedented this is. In a normal mm. celebratory case, it's difficult for anyone to say they're not aware of the case or of the issue. But then, Jay, you have to insert democracy. Because the fact this is a former sitting president and the fact that he is still running for president of the United States, there's an idea of democracy and would you want this defendant also to running as your president? And so I think these jurors and really and the prosecution and defense have an incredible difficult job on that trifecta alone of selecting the right jury. But then as a juror, how do you decide based upon the evidence of the case or the democracy uh, that actually is also too possibly in your hands. Uh, this is an unusual task for any jury. All right, LZ, Barbara, Christina, Mike, thank you very much for your time. Keep your seats there because we want to continue with our breaking coverage of day two of Trump's New York court case wrapping up. Jury selection still underway. Our reporter Olivia Rubin is outside the courthouse now. And Olivia, walk me through how we got to where we are today, what has happened so far, uh, and what happens tomorrow. Well, I'm going to start with your second question, Jay. What has happened so far? Because we just got another update, which is that a seventh juror has now been seated. We were just on a couple minutes ago talking about how we had six jurors, and now they are really moving quickly. They were finishing up some questioning of uh, the last few jurors. They went extended today. They were supposed to be done at 430, and now we have a seventh juror. I'm going to give you some information about him. He is a North Carolina-born civil litigator. He resides on the Upper East Side, and neither party challenged him, so he made it his way onto the jury. And what we are going to do from here is again, court is dark on Wednesday. So now we're going to come back on Thursday and continue the process all the way from the top where they're going to try to find the last five jurors as well as the six alternates. And I would say if they can keep up the pace that they have had today and the afternoon of yesterday, what jo Judge Juan Marchand said, which is to come back on Monday, Monday for opening statements, that just might be possible. Olivia Rubin, thank you very much. They are moving quickly with jury selection now. Thank you again. Still ahead for us, our spotlight, House Speaker Mike Johnson defiant amid a new threat to oust him from the speakership, but he says he's not going anywhere. My panel weighs in on the Capitol Hill chaos when we return. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine.